good morning. I'm going to run off and make my cup of coffee, and I'll be right back. We'll start that off as we have zero viewers right at the beginning of the stream, and just kind of get rolling like that. We are getting rolling for today. Man, I'm kind of looking forward to today, even if I don't do anything um, interesting code-wise, because it gets to be a normal day for a change. Uh, the beginning of this week really took it out of me. As you might or might not know, the Tuesday was um, getting random new chimney sweeps showing up, and I live streamed until the guy showed up to come like literally right into this room and clean the chimney. And uh, he rapped on the door like I was getting swatted or something, which is of course not how that goes because if you get swatted, they break down your door and shoot you. And I don't want that happening to me, but those are the risks you run when you're doing YouTubers. So we shall see. In any case, I am done with grinding the coffee, so I'm going to be back in a moment after having made my cup of coffee. Second one for the day, but the first one was a lot earlier.
as always, when it is uh, espresso making time, it doesn't take terribly long to make my cup of coffee. That's kind of why they invented that, in fact. It's interesting. The, the invention of espresso was to be able to turn over uh, more customers at a coffee shop. Oh, and let me scooch my uh, chat over to where it shows up on screen a little bit better. So do I know an, of an audio interface that doesn't need drivers to work and will work with all operating systems from Windows XP to 11? I am not a good person to ask. I'm Mac-based. So plus, plus, one of the reasons for having drivers is to be able to have latency work better. That said, I know enough about the Windows ecosystem to know that um, RME interfaces seem to have a track record for working pretty well on Windows. By the same uh, token, um, Motu works pretty well on Mac, as near as I can tell. I mean, that's what I'm using, not at this very moment, but I'm, I have a Motu 16a ready to come into action when we start making music again, which is not going to be today. But I'm in that preparation mode where there's a bunch of stuff I have in mind that I want to have up and running for when I do uh, go back into the studio and start making music. And I've got a couple of things in mind, at least possibly one further thing in mind for uh, moving forwards. The one further thing I'm thinking of, that's going to be yeah, let me reset the chat. I like to make it so that I can see all of the messages rather than only what YouTube wants me to see. I don't get enough to for it to even matter, so it's fine. And let me scooch my windows around enough that I can find what I'm thinking of. That being in the dash verbs collection. Now, I don't think I've made this calculation yet. Also, a quick check to see whether I've been um, printing out pictures of cat ladies that I don't want the URLs to show because it's too good for the common people. Um, not as such. And so what I'm wondering is whether I can in any way, let's see, by setting the speakers to the speakers built into this monitor, and that's a very bad form of that, but I would like to do a guitar hall. And I do not know whether I'm going to want to go immediately to Bracosti Guitar Hall. And let's dive into this a little bit. When I say Bracosti Guitar Hall, I mean something in specific. We have got a thingy here. And my speakers are currently set up for the laptop, so that's just my monitor. <laughs> Rather terrifyingly bad. But this would be a uh, Bracosti take on uh, Guitarum. That's actually not the one I think I'm thinking of, because I'm looking for a particular one that I thought went well with guitars, and maybe it doesn't say guitar in it. In which case, it makes it's very little difference as to which one. The, this list is all the ones that people like. And here's here's the thing, is um, I can play something like this. This is large hall sign guitar, and so. I'm looking to do a plugin where 
I can produce a really loud abrasive guitar noise in a hall and it'll sit with the guitar real well, but it will accentuate the loudness very, very, very much. That's the target for what I'm looking to do here. And I want that because I want to go and bring that into my mix situation so I can start doing stuff and set up the console X mix and start actually working with it in such a way that if I have a backdrop sound, which is like bass amp and guitar amps and drums and things, that uh, it should really resonate and have a profound sense of loudness to it. Um, Michael? Michael Radzinowski? I am sort of vaguely underway in putting together stuff that could work on VST. It will have to be GPL3. GPL3 is the only way that I can use um, VSTs uh, without deleting my VST2 license. Back in the day, I refused to use VSTs because at one point they had deleted your VST2 license in order to force you not to use them anymore. And I support retro things, and so that was a complete non-starter. And just recently, Steinberg has reversed its position and is now, again, stripping people of their VST2 licenses just for signing off on the most recent version if you are getting a commercial license. It does not cost you anything to get a commercial license, but to release stuff as closed source and profit in the commercial sphere by it, you must sign off on their license to use their most recent versions of VST3. And so people doing that or collaborating with it, possibly even, well, I don't know if it's the, I'm not sure whether the Juice folks are gonna be subject to that because I'm pretty sure that has open source qualities to it. At any rate, um, yep. Well, no, the licensing stuff is not necessarily in the way if I use GPL3, and there's nothing really stopping me from doing it. The other issue is this. You say, would be awesome to use this with your plugins. You understand I have like over 300 plugins. That's a big, big job. Now, when I went and ported everything to VST2, that was when it was a smaller number, and ever since then I've been kind of adding those. When I updated all of the audio units to be 64-bit, which I was one of the first people to do that, there were people who were hanging on a lot later than me, that was another enormous burden of going through and updating everything. If you say, please make all of your plugins VST3, the most efficient way of doing that, and honestly, if there's some kind of shortcut, this is not unthinkable. I'm interested in doing my meter using Juice, um, and that involves being able to put out a VST3. But um, if there is a sort of shortcut to be able to adapt those things, I would really like it because that would mean I would have access to VST3's strange and seemingly kind of broken um, messaging between the GUI interface, which wouldn't be a factor, and audio interface. I have yet to get that working on the metering thing I'm working on. And I could play with that more today, honestly. There's nothing really stopping me from fussing with that today. So if you'd like me to sort of just dive into that aggressively, we can, we can put that in the front burner if people would really like. Uh, be vocal and tell me if that's what you would like to see me do today. Because there's only so many todays and then I'm out of time. And maybe that's brought to my mind simply because I had my blood drawn on uh, Wednesday, which was very burdensome. I had to fast that morning and so I was bringing a croissant with me to the hospital so that I could then get close to eating breakfast in a normal way and not get thrown too far off. Like I have autism, so messing with my schedule messes with me really big time. And it's two days in a row that that happened. So honestly, I'd just about be entitled to a Minecraft day today. And it could be that next week will be just 
chilling in Minecraft and talking and hanging out. But I would like to get a plugin workday going today. And again, the the licensing issue with VST3 is to a large extent why I wasn't even willing to touch it. It was not impossible that I would come up with a way of coping. In fact, using uh, cross-licensing by VS, uh, GPL3 is, to my, the best of my knowledge, a way of coping, a way of being able to put stuff out into that uh, platform. I'm already an open source dev, so that's not a problem. But I wasn't doing it because I was like, guys, don't even go here. This is a big problem. This produces negative results. Well, I don't have to be saying that any longer because the negative results have happened. The uh, Their licensing changed again. And now nobody needs me to tell them that Steinberg might do terrible things to retro and people's abilities to access old mixes and stuff because they have done so. And at this point, I have nothing further to say on the matter. I have a way of going forward. And it doesn't need me to be standing there being like, if you would only listen, because like anybody who will not only listen is just going to pretty much get bad treatment. I'm not sure that they deserve it, but people are going to get bad treatment from this company. And it's not impossible that I can actually pour to the VST3s without huge amounts of technical difficulty. It is possible that using the GPL3, it will be thinkable that there's just an adaptation to be made and a lot of intense busy work to be done. And it gives me something to do. That's always nice when it's like, hi, join my Patreon because I have to work eight hours a day for now until death to get all of this ported over to the new format, you know. I have never heard of SSL3. Oh, no. Okay, I understand what you're saying. I thought you meant wrapper host for VST from VST2, which is not correct. Um, and I'm all in favor of using uh, controllers. I'm not in favor of necessarily having to use SS SSL's controllers. I'm using one for Music Thing Modular, as everybody knows. But, uh, you know, and if I'm remembering correctly, Korg also makes controllers very cheaply. And that's all cool. And that's one of the things I'm looking to do using uh, Console X. I've designed a version of Console X and done the testing. In fact, I did this last uh, Tuesday where I, I worked out that if you have a controller and you're in Reaper, because that's what I'm using, I'm sure this there may well be other ways of doing this, but... If you have a controller and you have three different kinds of plugins, let's call them console X channel, console X sub out, and console X bus, and they all have exactly the same controls, and you have a uh, controller to plug in, you can tell Reaper, oh, by the way, these three get inputs from this controller. Treble on console X channel, console X bus, and console X sub out all respond to controller number 33, for instance. And then you set it up so that all of those things respond to the controller only on the channel that's selected. And then if you want to make adjustments, every stage of your mix process is the same. It's The channel has uh, three bands of EQ, the mid-range has a sweepable peak, and if you cut it, the peak is left behind. Uh, have not actually taken there I was wanting to go and adjust it so that if you set the mid-range sweep control to zero it it canceled and I don't think I have done that so it might be worth trying but um, all of these would apply to every stage exactly the same it's effectively the same plugin in each place and that also includes 
a uh, discontinuity distributed into three sections. There's four plugins because you got to decode going into the submix. And there's four filters, and the filters are uh, biquad filters for just um, getting rid of uh, aliasing or suppressing aliasing in distributed form. And one of the things that I did on Tuesday was go through and uh, disable that because I tested it and found that if I was trying to do a really sharp filter right above, um, or I mean right below the actual sampling rate, the, the Nyquist limit, then it was producing unpleasant effects only at 44.1K. And as soon as you went to higher sample rates, it behaved itself again. So I needed to disable that particular filtering at 1x rates, which is 44.1 and 48. And it also cuts down very slight, a very small percentage of cut down on the CPU for people who are only able to run at those rates, which I'm not sure how common that is, but I do support retro stuff. And so I am listening as far as that kind of stuff. I have no patience for the people who say, it doesn't matter and you can't tell the difference, but I have all the patience in the world for people who are like, I am on a potato and I can't run your mix. Also, it's cold again. There's snow on the ground out here again. And the uh, fireplace was swept. The wood stove was swept. So I'm going to throw another log in there. This is going to be another day of coding and remembering to throw logs on the wood stove. And I really enjoy the consistency of that. I like getting back to that. And like the fact that I have actually got firewood for the end of the year. I doubt I'm going to go through all of it. I've got a goodly amount here. I don't think the guy actually cleaned the catalyst, interestingly. He was up there with the vacuum, and he was vacuuming everything out. But I'm not sure that the catalyst itself was cleaned out that much. So I went in afterwards, took the stove back apart again. And uh, it's a sort of honeycomb thing. It lets air through. And I sort of wrapped it with something that I built for uh, doing that. I, I build stuff a lot. Here, I should show you this. Drumsticks. I built this to be able to practice drums on. It is a drum stool, basically from Amazon. This is a shelf bracket with a, a shelf on it. And this is one side of uh, Velcro, the, the fluffy Velcro, padding the edge so that it doesn't chew up my sticks too bad. And it just scooches down into one of the feet of the drum stool with the shelf thing tucked into it and itself tucked into this. These are uh, wrist weights for exercise and they're holding down the other side of it. And this is string, uh, twine, pulling it into the side of the, the seat. And so I just hacked together an elaborate drum practice pad thing. And the neat thing about the drum practice pad thing is not only is it you can beat on it really hard without actually making definitely loud noises, although it does make relatively loud noises. But also tapping on this shelf thing, it's again a, sh a uh, shelf rail tucked into the framework of the drum stool. And then there's a the shelf support, which is bent over a little bit. So it's not like this on the underside, the top side is damped. But the interesting thing about it is that you can practice accents. And it actually kind of works. Like it can 
tell what part of it you're hitting and you can get a sound. And it's very similar to the sounds that you would get if you were hitting an actual cymbal in, at these places on the stick. And you just tap your foot on the floor without anything else. If you can tap your foot on the floor loud enough, that's going to count as good practice for hitting the drum real hard. And you can accent. If you hit it extra hard, you make an audible click and the rest of it is more muted. So. And just like that. So I've been able to practice drums a little more because I built that. Just like we're going to be building some uh, plugins on the coding stream. But kind of something I'm thinking about is, and again, there are a couple of different directions this can go today. Because one of the things that I could do is derp around more with VSD3 and try to solve some of the problems. And I have no big objection to doing that. I'm just saying, I've essentially got most of console X worked out with the exception of it would be probably good if I drop the, uh, the mid-range thing. If the mid-range thing's frequency is down to zero, it should uh, cancel itself. So that's probably something worth doing. And then the other thing worth doing could be this guitar hall idea. And of course, this is just large hall, but there's lots of different stuff that one can do. That would be mechanics hall off of the Bracosti. We've got all this Bracosti stuff going on. You're not hearing it properly, but I'm basically okay with that. It's like, oh well. We've got stuff like Lush Church. This is, again, so it becomes a question of what kinds of sounds do I want to make? And to what extent are they made to closely resemble what Bracosti is doing? because I have the, the examples of those. I know this works for people. This is a very well-desired uh, unit. People really like this unit. But that doesn't mean I couldn't redesign reverb as well. Like here's Mechanics Hall. And that's actually pretty good sounding. Pretty much all of that stuff is pretty good sounding. But what I have here is a large collection of different things. And the ones that have my interest are larger halls. For instance, we've got, uh, say, 462H here. And the color coding has to do with loudness and things. The one that I'm interested in for guitars is the ones that sort of light up with excessive volume when it's the guitar part that we're listening to. And I can show you the difference between those sort of kind of vaguely because we've got examples here like this one. That says 696 seat room. And that's U, which stands for unique. Back in the day, for instance, I have an example of what uh, K plate D was like under these circumstances. Up, up here. It's all right, but it's not a very high score by modern standards, my modern standards. And I've got a bunch of these where they are Hall style algorithms, meaning they were designed so that the reverb density is late 
in the uh, the calculation. And on the whole, what these color codings mean is red or orange means it is loud. It has loud sonority. And that's kind of like this. If you measure it, the peaks generated are way hotter than other stuff. I want it so that if we're doing this, then the air absolutely crackles with loudness as the, the sound just builds up in the room. Now, there's also uh, yellow and green color coding on this little card here. And those signify either the global peak is going to be exceptionally loud or the global peak is going to be exceptionally quiet. I'd like to have extreme loudness and also lower global peak so that it will sound more distant, but I'm willing to accept just maximum loudness for this particular hall design. I think that will just sound better. And then we've got a a blue color coding, which is for fullness. That's the alien kitten section of the test file. And if the amount of bass going on there led to a global LUFS of minus 11x or louder, then that'll count as a bass fullness. And then there is a sweep control, which is purple. And that means if you do a, a, a sine wave sweep right down through the reverb, nothing sticks out to the point that it sounds like a honking resonance. And ideally, you have extremely high maximum loudness on the guitar part, but it's not sticking out on the, on the sweep part. That would imply that it was able to do a intensely loud sonorous sound. Like here's an example, K plate B was this example. It is reading as extremely high maximum RMS, but also extremely low for the sweep. And on guitar, it sounds like this. You know, whatever the tail does, as far as uh, metallic sounds, overtones, artifacts, these global measurements are also part of what I'm checking out. So I thought maybe, maybe it's a nice thing to start off with that I'll just run through and see if I have any sort of double loudness. And when I say double loudness, what I mean is once where rather than being the guitar section being minus 11 or louder or minus 10 or louder, it'll go all the way to minus nine or louder. And that would be just absolutely the highest scores for um, intensity of the reverb loudness. And it's probably worth checking some of these things out. I uh, will go and start looking at maybe not the ones that are this small. Like, check this out, the 41CU. This is a tiny, tiny room. So it's actually fairly easy for that to sound loud, but um, I'm going to want a bigger hall than that. So I'll maybe start by looking at just only ones that are marked hall. And it might be a specialized one. It might be only loudness and none of the other stuff actually works out or qualifies. But here is a 122 seat hall. You know, one idea that could be fun is if I feel really daring, and I don't know if I can do this though, um, incorporate the clear coat concept of switching between the things. There's a problem with that concept though, which is in order to shape the tone of this, I need to have some filtering on the feedback paths, which is not the case for clear coat. 
And for each of these algorithms, the, the, the very smallest uh, cycle is going to be 11. It's just automatically going to be 11, and then it goes from there. But then the next smallest is going to pop up in a different place each time. So I can't, and I'm using those for throwing some all passes in there, and I'm about to start experimenting with using two stages of all pass in there instead of just one. That helped um, K Cathedral as it went to K Cathedral 2. It helped it quite a bit. So I'm going to want to dig further into that, and it becomes a question of where do you put those additional all passes seeing as I figured out how to do that one, um, it clearly it's going to be the correct answer. But I can't just swap them around. They have to be dedicated to the algorithm that they're on. So let's start going through and checking out ones that end in H, signifying that they are hall rather than like a plate sound or whatever. And we'll go through, open them up, and check which ones are actually the loudest possible sounds that we can have in a 500 millisecond window. And that is maximum of nine. Already we have a winner. This one's maximum RMS power is louder than anything that is shown. So we'll come up with something to call this and then we will start with that and we can also double these up so that it says uh, red and orange. I wonder if I have a yet another color that I could use. Uh, it doesn't look like it. All the colors are sort of spoken for. That's why I did this whole color coding thing. So I am pleased the very first one that I tried is actually one of the the winner. I think there's ones that are even louder than that, and that's what I'm looking for. But I will match, uh, I will mark everything that is 9 dB or up as orange red. This is not. This one is just red because it is 10.88. It's close to being just orange color coded. But we're looking for more. We're looking for more than that. So here's another. Get my double clicking game on. This almost certainly is not, but we'll find out. It's bearing in mind, yep. Bearing in mind that these are. Um, designed, I'm designing it to fit into a concept that is all about peak energy. Oh, look at that. And notice how different they are, like one channel is way hotter than the other. But they also do feedback into each other. And I've been getting some feedback on the uh, K Cathedral saying people want more cross communication between channels. They're not as happy with the idea of the reverb density sitting in one side for a while and making things wider. They want everything to combine together much more quickly than that. If I do that with this kind of design, the loudness will get fed right into the other channel and then it'll balance out. So all in all, we have another winner here as far as uh, how that works. And so we're going to Move that red, add that orange, and add a red on top of that, which is pushing the purple out of the way. Also, let's highlight let's find a way of further noting it. LH means loud hall. So when we do this, we get to what we're gonna call loud hall. And then we can sort of search for that or just find them and choose between those after having sorted out which ones they are. I feel like there was a one that goes all the way up to eight, but I don't remember. 
There, the maximum is 10.58. Smaller numbers become louder because maximum, it's negative 10. Going to negative 9 or negative 8 means it got louder. This is probably not with the amount of, it's blue and also purple, so it's probably not going to give me a very high number, but we'll see. Nope. And again, the whole idea here is I want to do a reverb that I can immediately start playing with, where I can do my mixes in console X, which you'll remember is the one where discontinuity is included. I also have a way of including discontinuity. Oh, I bet this is, look, see this? This is going to be loud. Let's see just how loud. 159CH, oh boy, so minus 8.92. This is a very loud guitar. So whether that actually sounds good is another question. And on drums, it sounds kind of like this. So none of this means that it sounds good. I just want to choose among the incredibly loud sounding reverbs and pick what sounds actually good based on ones that are going, like, if I fill this in, or, wait, what am I, what am I doing? I have an ability to uh, depict some of this stuff. It's not, it's not going to be very right. It's going to look terrible, but remember how we have our meter? I've got the meter set to silence things, but that's our guitar sound at full crank. And you see that the peaks are going way up. They're spiking in the, on the left. And then the slew energy is up here, and the uh, and then we're going through it again. And you see that the the peak headroom being thrown up by this guitar in a reverby space goes really really hot. It's making a dense cloud of peak data up here, including with brightness as well. Ones that have uh, Yellow in the color will be making the brightness go higher relative to these other ones, but this is a, this feels like it's a good blend. And then on the bottom here, we have our um, zero crossing meter. And on the whole, this is like 200 hertz and up. It's not really going to be um, doing a particularly wide showing there. And I can show you by contrast, if I pick one that is say, this 158 round and it doesn't have any loudness factor to it at all, the profile that is shown is quite different. On this one, we're playing the same guitar through a reverb. The guitar is at the same loudness, but you'll notice it is no longer clipping the hottest areas. It's peaks are just not going that high. And this is kind of just fluctuating a little bit less. There's not as much going on. And the high frequencies aren't distributed very far either. I'm thinking that the best reverbs are going to produce widely scattered peaks in a sort of cloud rather than lines. And if you hear, it sounds like this. It all basically sounds like, yeah, this is a reverb. Now here's one where it's a fairly similar design, but this is one of the ones that's bright. It is a um, yellow color coding. And I've never actually gone through and referred these things, but uh, with the yellow color coding, 
it is considered to be unusually bright and so the peak energy should be spiking up higher and you can see that in fact it is. We've got these little spikes on the top. It's also filling in like the distribution here is good. I might go through and look at the behavior of the ones that I settle on just to see how they look, like whether they're producing a nice little cloud, because that's the, the end goal, is um, making peak and slew rate distribution that doesn't have artifacts sticking out, that doesn't have the sort of regularity. You see, as the sound cuts off, it drops down to nothing and goes into a tighter line as it does so. But while everything is rocking and rolling, And I wonder whether I can pull up, let's go into sounds and see if I can open up our reference sound. I believe this is the one. So it's going to be around here somewhere. And if we throw this onto our meter, it's going to act completely different. that's a close mic guitar. So there's very little difference here. And there's very little difference in the uh, peak energy because we're distorting it into the speaker. The only movement we get here is in the alteration of sound as it comes through the speaker. So it's not going to broaden this dense line very much at all. Although you'll notice it is able to broaden the peaks line quite a bit. And our zero crossing meter is much more regular because pretty much everything here is just straight up a note. Typically it's producing a specific note and not a wide cloud of different things. For final mixes, on the whole, you're going to want clouds of different things to make something that sounds full and interesting. And then when we add the reverb, we broaden this line of just raw, intense guitar, which is the only thing going into the reverb, quite a lot. And we're also broadening the peak energy. But it's already, since it is already um, a mic'd real cab, with a condenser microphone inside it picking up real acoustic sound, it is scattering the high frequencies more than, say, a DI. If I took the same thing and put it into, say, a fire amp or something, let's do literally that. And this fire amp is quite accessible. We can, we can do this, but it's not going to be all that great. So here's your full crank. We can tone it down a little bit. And if we apply it, it produces this. And there is a, a little tiny impulse response on the end of it, but then when we go and look at it in the meter, I'm thinking we're going to have kind of ruined it. And what we've got is even less dynamics. We don't have that big of a change, but it's slightly compressed this area. Without the uh, cab simulation on the end of it, it would be even worse. And we've kind of compressed the brightness a little bit. So those are the things we don't want. And then we get on to stuff like this, which is the last one that I did. And our maximum RMS power is minus 892. That's the process I'm in, in the process of doing. But then when we go and do our recently acquired meter, we see that we have opened up the the clouds quite emphatically and we've also raised the amount of energy that can come out of the system quite dramatically 
and this is going to typically come off as in some circumstances like if you want to make a big wall of huge guitars you don't want it to be small direct and up front that serves different purposes that serves if you're like a metal guy and your guitar has to act as another snare if your guitar has to act as like staccato jackhammering punching you um you don't get to put this much reverb on it but if it's meant to act as like a giant spacious wall of hugeness then you need to start doing this stuff where we're expanding these clouds of points this is peak energy and then of course if you loudinate it the peak energy literally all goes away again and whatever dynamics are being produced by this all go away again and you go back to effectively the same thing that you had with the close mic this is how you get if not retro sounds then console x type sounds and make them work is optimizing everything so that the the volume level you know we got 6 db 12 db 18 db this sits around optimal levels for sending stuff to streaming services by the way so this is not a penalty you do not have to make your stuff come out quieter than other people's stuff on streaming services to do this what you'll be doing in fact is making it more energetic than other people's stuff because you'll hit the same target for target rms loudness but rather than having everything clamped to like 6 db down you'll have a giant fluffy cloud of peak energy and slew energy happening the whole time and everything will come off as louder and more exciting that's the target so having said that let's uh did i update this okay so 130 lh i have some of these labeled as loud i think maybe i've tested this one i'm just trying to keep up with where i'm at with it because what I'm doing at the moment is counting through all of this, finding out what has maximum RMS power that is as loud as possible. And this doesn't qualify. This is uh, 10x or louder. It's 1037, so it's quite loud, really. But uh, it is not counting as uber, super, mega loud. And again... I'll continue showing what that looks like on the meter. And we have a similar result of we're doing kind of a nice little cloud of energy. The idea is that the reverb shouldn't be making stuff that is so um, predictable that it makes obvious features inside this cloud. And that's working fairly well. I just missed my click on the stop. In fact, it's also warming up the low frequencies a little bit, so there's more action happening in here. If this works, one of the things I'm looking for is energy in the upper mid. My lines here are 20 hertz, 200 hertz, 2K, and 20K right up at the top because this is the base oriented meter. And so what I'm looking to do is have the uh, this cloud here at the bottom stretch up when we're doing like sustaining, and indeed that is what's happening, is when we're playing this stuff, it's making a cloud of, of uh, zero crossing energy. And then when you're letting it sustain and ring out just before we go da 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 and then stop there's our ring out sound right up here and it is in fact reaching up to almost 1k the reverb energy is sonorous to say the least it is not predominantly low frequency stuff so this does not count as extra super loud we're going to skip ahead to this one, which, if I'm not mistaken, this might have actually counted as this area here. And I don't remember whether I've done this whole process over, but see, 8.92. This is in the ultra mega super loud category. And what we'll see is that our meter 
especially towards the end, we're going to have a lot of stuff that's just blasting right off the top of the loudness part of the meter. It's really capable of opening up and de uh, delivering sonority, although it's kind of all happening on the left channel, interestingly. And then I'll hit stop when it's done. And again, here is our meter. And this is another good example of uh, stuff where the sonority is very mid-rangey. This is arguably too mid-rangey. We've got our, our sonority and it's making a good little cloud, although I still see it's, it's not scattering the peaks as much as I would like. We've got some thrown way up high here. And of course, the very end is just completely frying everything. But I'm still seeing these sort of shapes that don't speak. One of the things that I observed in the Bracosti, studying the Bracosti stuff, certain Bracosti patches are better than others as far as delivering a convincing envelope of sound around the instrument or delivering a convincing envelope of sound that seems to be sort of floating in space detached from the instrument. And this would be one of the ones where it sounds very much attached to the instrument. It's following the energies of the instrument very closely, especially in terms of high frequency stuff. Whereas if this was more of a scattered cloud, that's probably all to the good as far as what it's what it really should be and one of the things we're seeing here is especially with the sustain part there this is really focusing on the notes in the chord and particular mid-range frequencies are poking out it's making itself more of a line rather than more of a cloud like around here so i'm going to suggest that this particular sound although if i remember correctly I will be marking it as super loud. It's maximum 8.92. This is going to be kind of honky. This is going to be kind of boxy. And that's correct. That did indeed sound like a tin box of warehouse space, and it's not. It's loud, but it's not especially desirable. And some of that's showing up in the metering. In particular, I associate these things in the metering with the sounds I was hearing. The fact that I'm seeing very closely aligned little swerves of the peak and slew energy related to the loudness and more of a line in the zero cross energy suggests to me that this is what we get with something that may go very loud but sounds very boxy sounds kind of very fake it should be more or less synthesizing a broader distribution on the zero crosses so all we're getting is honk and sonority out of this one. That said, we're still going to mark it as loud H. In fact, we already have, we just haven't typed in the L. Going through all of this stuff and checking it out. We can also have a look at this one, even if it is not an H. U stands for unique, and that's a one way of calculating and see which not it's nothing special there. It's minus 10.21, so that's not that loud. Interestingly, we can drag uh, text around in here. That's a nice little th feature to add. So this, this one marked unique, which is a kind of algorithm for determining how that works, is actually doing a better job of producing a dense populated cloud in every respect. It's just not especially loud. 
and it's predominating on the red channel here. It's bouncing around quite a bit, actually. And we've got a very well distributed cloud here, rather than the stuff that we were looking at earlier. In particular, SLU seems to be generating a very good cloud, and it doesn't seem to be lining up quite as much, although it's sort of inevitable that it's going, the zero crossing can only do so much if it's a guitar sound into reverb. I mean, I can't generate bass with this guitar amp. The guitar amp is a 12 inch guitar speaker and um, it, it's very bright indeed. It's, it's this bright. So nothing is really going to go down into this extreme low frequencies that I do here. But if the uh, reverb impulse is able to synthesize some of that, one thing about it is it is at least making a broad scattering of zero crosses for the most part, with very few exceptions, such as right here. And that should mean that it will sound less sort of warehousey and crappy, but it won't have the sonority. Although note that these peaks hover right up at the top. This does actually look pretty good, even though it's not hitting the intensity of maximum peakage that some of the other ones do. This is a very good showing. It sounds like this. So that's quite good in its own little way. It does not get a special marking from me, but it is actually quite good. Here we have a chamber design. See, U is one of the room style designs. C is a chamber, which is a variation on that. It's like each of these are trying to prevent having the algorithm focus on particular things. It's trying to smooth it out. So in theory, the U and C should make more of a distribution of peaks, if my theories are correct here. Because that's the thing, the theories could be wildly, oh, hello. Where do you come from? Maximum RMS power minus 6.72 dB. This one is outrageously loud, outrageously hot. I don't know what else it has going on for it, but our peaks here are unreasonably loud. And let's look at what that looks like on our meter. We've got a certain amount of scatter, but then it's going to just spike at some point. It's going to go crazy loud, probably at the end. And we'll see it on the meter, and it'll be only one particular part of it. So this is what 6 dB loudness looks like. 6 dB is this line, and this is where it hit that peak. It's uh, largely in the left channel, and that's what that produces. Interestingly, as it's doing it, we don't have a lot of slew energy going on. This is darker compared to some of the other ones. And the cloud here gets like totally chaotic what's going on, it does not look that tied to the dynamics of the actual instrument going on, although the, the way that it spikes, it probably does look a little bit more like that. And then our sustaining part here is just sort of a blurb of points, similarly to that. And then interestingly, this locks into sort of a resonant peak as it does this, which is probably not surprising. It can only get that loud if it's just generating a lot of noise, but then this starts to blur out even more as it goes. In fact, we've thrown some zero cross things that are as low as 200 hertz. 200 hertz on the zero cross meter means that the sustain of the um, reverberation 
stretched out to where it was able to make it sort of like wiggly deal and have enough base energy in there that it went that long without crossing zero again. Like it swayed right over to one side or the other. And you can see that the final little noise there does actually have low frequency stuff in it. That's partly because it's a very quiet noise into our reverb. We've also got a section in here where we're producing substantially below 200 hertz energy in the zero cross meter, which is not the rule for this. So we have a super loud one with some interesting qualities and we can have a listen. This is again a chamber sound. It says type of room sound, but it's not quite as far towards putting energy towards the end of the sustain. So this should be a full kind of empty room sound. And that seems accurate. That one's very nice. And again, it's hyper loud. That one was unreasonably loud. So we are going to add L to this as well. And we're going to go through and make it have orange and red to further outline the fact that we have this available. I mean, I haven't distributed all this information, but there could come a time when I put the information for this out as well. I've got the big old uh, document with all of the delay times, because these are all different delay times on the same basic algorithm. It's essentially a five by five uh, householder matrix. And it changes this much based on what numbers you plug into it. So there, we've got a very loud uh, guitar room there. And then here's some more, but this might not necessarily be the same story. It's another chamber, but it does not have a maximum RMS that is significantly louder than God, right? So if we look at that, on the meter, we'll see, we'll see that that one simply does not peak out as much. And in fact, you can kind of see that the peak energy is tracing the shape of the guitar's loudness more than the other one. You see it's making a kind of zigzag line. I'm not sure how easily you can see that because we're just streaming it, but all these things are making kind of zigzag lines shape following the shape of what the guitar is doing. And that indicates that it's not as live of a room. It's, it's keeping it a lot more sort of enclosed, controlled. And we have a distribution here, but although we have got a fairly good distribution there. And interestingly, there are weird little gaps in the, uh, as the sound of the sustain cuts off, there's a couple of little moments where it goes real quiet for an instant. It shouldn't necessarily have those artifacts in there. Let's hear what that sounds like. So the, the decay will have these little sputters in there where the amplitude cuts out. That's being depicted in a way that it wouldn't if there wasn't an outline on the, the gray shape. That is showing that there are sudden departures as it drops off to silence. And they're being shown there, and they're also barely being shown here. Again, less live. And then in the decay. And what I'm hearing there is that the decay sounded kind of metallic. 
it didn't sound as open as some of them. And there was a sort of thing going on that felt like an artifact. And that was being shown on the image. So we'll keep chugging through these things because there is a goal that I have in mind for them. You're just hanging out with me while I do some of the more colorful part of this. This only goes to 10, so this is also just, uh, it's not a hyper loud. I'm also taking the opportunity to study a bunch of these things so that I can see what this implies. It looks a lot to me as if the ability to go hyper loud is also what produces the scattering effect on RMS and SLU because it means the room is more alive. But the downside of it is that it can produce a sort of empty warehouse effect where it sounds live but unpleasant. And there's going to be a happy medium in there. In particular, I think if I come up with one where it's just throwing this blur of peak points and slew points the entire time with as little as possible of this tightly following the, the guitar's behavior, then that will also translate to being good sounding. Also, you'll notice with this one, our sustain does not have information in the, uh, and we, we notice that this is also 176 F. F stands for front. And front is part of the calculation that makes it sound more like a plate. So the plate decays without throwing a bunch of, okay, so I see these artifacts here. This might be something where I can look at this and go, this is less desirable. I see that it has a artifact in this sustain part, and that's going to translate to being less desirable. I'm also curious as to what this is doing. So we'll go and have a listen. Yeah. The sustain trailing off into higher frequencies, that's going to be bad. That was an unpleasant sounding tail. It's kind of psh, and that's nobody's going to want that. However, I did count it. Weirdly, that's the one that counts as both loud and also dark. Uh, green means naturalness. Green means not as much slew. Here we've got another one, which is the same, except for it says chamber instead of a front. And we're just going to go through and monitor all of this stuff. This does not have exceptional loudness characteristics. Again, with the guitar uh, hall, I'm looking for intense, intense loudness characteristics, but ones that are well-behaved. And we're going to go through and figure out what we're doing using all of these techniques at once, basically. So nothing exceptional loudness-wise, but this one's behavior is going to look like this. While I'm doing that, I'm going to, to fuss with the fire a little bit. It's still warm enough, but the, the ashes fell over against the window, and I'm going to push them out of the way. cold outside, but it's warm in here. Oh, the, the noises that was making sound like a Half-Life game? Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah, so this one is not all the best uh, behavior, and it didn't show as uh, exceptional in the loudness section. 
I think what we're looking for is the body of things to be hovering around 12 dB. That'll be a, that will also go along with more energy in this area rather than have you can see this V here at the beginning of it and that means the sounds are very tightly linked to the sounds of the raw guitar sitting there in the reverb. I'm going to want to have it fill out the sound very rapidly until it is nothing but a cloud and we're not actually seeing that disparity. It needs to be very fluffy and filled out here to work in my context that I'm going for. And we can also see that this is another one of those not especially bright ones and that's showing on the peak energy. I would favor less than unreasonably bright if I get a choice. I might not. I'll, ac I'll accept ones that peak out at brighter. What I'd really like is a busy, dense cloud here rather than being able to follow the RMS loudness strictly with the peak loudness. I'd like it to get a lot denser because that's how we generate sort of your platinum record, cool hit record sound is once everything gets going, you hear a lot of stuff happening all the time. It's not tightly linked to individual events. It's just a wash of coolness that never quite stops happening. This one's not going to be able to do that, so we're going to skip that, but we're going to keep looking because there's actually quite a lot to look through. Here's another one that is a chamber and that is fairly dark. Again, I am looking for very loud sonority. This does not have very loud sonority. It's only about as loud as everything else. And I'm going to keep looking at these unless they start becoming so similar that it gets boring. And same deal. It's very easy to interpret what the underlying guitar is doing. It's mostly not throwing a dense scattering of sound. In, in some areas, it does a pretty good job of it, though. And in particular, I like that this is this little cloud of high-frequency sound that's not tracking these shifts. And these shifts are RMS, and this is peak. All of this stuff is about trying to dial in Oh, and also I believe this shape is undesirable. The fact that it's decaying into silence while going brighter and brighter. Because the zero cross, this means predominant energy. The predominant energy is just getting brighter as it goes on. It's sustained, it, it dies away to silence, and as it does, it goes brighter. I would rather have it die away to darker, but that's not necessarily going to happen with all of these. So this should be creating not an exceptionally lively sound, but the darkness that it has on tap means that the brights, although I don't like the way this dies away, are at least fairly well distributed. So it should be a, uh, well, let's hear it. Literally, let's just hear it. Yeah, that is a certain amount of spatiality, but nothing really, really special. And the green means that it is not especially bright. By contrast, here's one right next to it, which is also flagged green and blue, but it does not have red. If we are to compare this one, our results are going to be strikingly different. And if I am guessing correctly, this is going to read as tracking the loudness with peak energy much more closely, much less dispersal, much more easily traced to exactly where that line is. And it looks a little bit like that's doing what I thought it was going to do. Not totally. I've seen worse, but... Also, I like the how it's 
this going from side to side between yellow and red seems like a good way of handling stereo. And it's another one of those ones that goes up to just about 2K in the reverb tail. So that's not going to be a pleasant sounding reverb tail. It should be able to move a little bit more air on the reverb tail. That said, I'm not sure if any of these are going to do that great at that. Fed by only a guitar. But we'll see. And we'll also note that we have a sort of nicely dispersed low frequency area where it'll it'll go down to lower frequencies fairly effectively. But yeah, see the interesting thing here is that it's actually a pretty good distribution. I believe that what this is going to sound like <coughs> is um, a open airy room but very well controlled. Like Nothing's going to honk especially much. Nothing is going to sound especially lively or especially loud. But the evenness of distribution here suggests that it's going to sound, you know, more like a room than like a big fake. And I think that's correct that that sounds fairly well like a room. The The funniest thing about all of this, and this is, it just goes to show you, I'm able to do all of this monitoring it exclusively through the speakers built into my monitor. That's all you're hearing. And that's because when you're working with things around peak energy, peak energy is sort of frequency agnostic. This will come across just as much in anybody's cell phone or anything else. People just don't allow peak energy to happen anymore. And so they're having to work within an area where everything is needs to be done by frequency balance or whatever. But if you're able to do peak energy with stuff, like here, we've got a maximum RMS of 864, which is a very big change over the other channel. This is very one channel heavy. The other channel is barely happening at all. But that says it may be. So this does in fact count at, and F is front. F is more of your plate style sound. This is a very intensely platey sound. It's going to sound a lot like um, straight up straight up plate reverb it's not going to sound like a big hall it's going to sound like a metal thing that's not necessarily good and i'm also seeing that in particular the high frequency energy is closely tracking the um the loudness although the decay is actually fairly good notice how in previous ones this end part here was uh, ramping up and this is not. That suggests that as this decays and falls off, it doesn't start going brighter. And all of this is just the algorithm. It's before I do anything like filtering. This does not go up brighter as it goes. Instead, it just kind of dissipates. So this is another super loud but this is not the style of reverb I'm going to want to put into the, the plate. Plus, if I have ones that have super loud penetrating qualities, I don't think I really want that to only happen on one side. Ideally, both channels are able to do this to some extent. In this one, only one channel is able to do it, and it does it a lot. So the whole reverb is tilted to the side, and that's not very desirable. That said, we do have a uh, striking behavior here. So what this, this should sound like is a very, very lively plate. And let's see if that's true. And we'll mark it as super loud. We'll mark it as a L.
So I do like this sort of rasp in there. I do like the rasp on the end of the uh, guitar. That said, we're not going to be using this, but we do have to label it because that's part of what we're doing here is labeling this and putting in the L for future reference. Hopefully I'll remember what I did. And we've got these various things, but soon we're going to get into the 200 seater range and we start getting into halls, although we're going to have a wide variety of these things. And that feels good. I think I'm going to try to blow through some of these as quickly as I can because it's really taken uh, forever and I could do with another cup of coffee before we start the actual work. But this is also actual work. This is, I mean, without this, where would I be as far as selecting these algorithms? You got to, you got to decide by them somehow. And I don't necessarily have the intention span to listen to 50 different ones and then register which ones had something special going on. So attention span, I redo this. And yes, it was not super loud in any way. So we'll skip right over it. Here we have a P. This is literally a plate reverb that has registered as quite loud. How loud? Quite loud. This is a 9.11. It's pretty close to minus 8 dB. This one is exceptionally, exceptionally loud, although not in channel 1, only in channel 2. So we're going to want to have a look at what this one does as well. Again, it's a plate effect, so all of the reverb elements are happening up front. The reverb density early on is much heavier than the reverb density later on. And one of the things that's happening there is we have a uh, uh, side-specific sonority. It blasts out really loud over here, only on the right side. It's doing that without doing much of anything else, and we do have a nicely distributed cloud of energy here. As the seats start getting larger, that's going to get better. Smaller it is, the more it's going to tightly lock to whatever the RMS is doing. I also like how loud it is during this decay part. And we are, in fact, ramping upwards to higher frequencies, but not as much as some. Although the this zero-crossiness, it sounds like it's just going to register as sonorous and not especially widely distributed. And I'm not really quite sure what this super loud bit is here. The density fluctuates wildly here, which is not necessarily bad. I'm kind of looking for stuff like that, but within a range. RMS is much louder, even though this is not a spot where the peak energy shot way up. Like we're going very loud in RMS here and here, but without the peak energy even clipping. And the end goal is to make a solid cloud of uh, peaks just spread throughout all through here. Does not track the guitar part at all. And just once you put a guitar into this space, the space just lights up. And it's just like the entire time. So that gave us one of our loud settings. This one sounds like this doesn't sound like a hall at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Not bad. Not bad. This is one of our super loud ones. Also, interestingly, here's another one of those ones where one of its colors is purple. What that means is the tone sweep is not exceptionally loud. 
The tone sweep is this section. If any of it hangs on too much, what that means is the reverb is honking at a particular frequency. Just sweeping through it shouldn't make it honk at a particular frequency. And what that looks like on their meter is this. And you can pretty much see exactly what that is on the zero cross meter. That's what the zero cross meter is for. It's swept from over 20K, as you can see, the very top thing, right down through, right down to the lows. And then as we are decaying off, we have a nice little cloud of low frequency information here, which is what you get from a reverb if you sweep low frequency information through it. You'll get sort of a rumble. This is the picture of a rumble. And mostly it's over 20 hertz, which is this bottom line here. But all in all, this is a pretty good picture of what that's supposed to look like. And again, the peak in RMS energy, if this, as it does its sweep, spiked out really loudly in any particular place, this meter would show a spike at that point, and it would sound like the reverb was honking on a particular note. This part is meant to be as evenly distributed as possible. And then we've also got our slew meter as it descends. And that's also what you would expect from a frequency sweep. Just going to swoop. So we've now labeled that, but we also have to put on our L, which is loudness. We get to skip over everything that is not already flagged as red, because anything else we know isn't going to register in our new analysis. This is not showing up as exceptional, but it's also very well balanced. So if we have something that is not exceptional, but it's very well balanced, what we're going to see on the meter is that the, the top one is not going to show big spikes of yellow, I mean, of red or green. We've got a centered sound, and it's averaging out to be very centered indeed. It's not really predominating over either side. We've got a little bit of red peeking out over here. The red side is accentuated a little bit. But on the whole, this is a pretty even distribution. It's just that it has that warehousey kind of quality, which I'm interpreting in this data as the slew energy, and remember, slew energy is the part that you can't hear that people automatically just limit or clip off. We're looking at it now. We might not be able to hear it, but we're looking at it and we're interpreting what that could mean to the experience of the sound, because it does have an effect on the experience of the sound. And it looks to me as if what this means is that this is going to be sort of warehousey sounding. Or indeed, since it's F, it is a, a energy distribution to the front, it's going to be a metallic sounding plate. And I would say that that's correct. So we're going to keep moving on. Here we have a red-green. That, of course, means that its dynamics can be quite loud. How loud? This loud which is loud, but I don't need to do special things with it. But green means that the slew is not very extensive. And that will show up on the meters as we do it. C standing for chamber, meaning that it's designed to sound more like an empty room. And this is very tightly locked. Well, it's the slew is. The amplitude, maybe not so much but it's pretty tightly locked to the RMS value coming in. And what we're trying to do is get it so that the peak energy is much less predictable. This is not really succeeding in that, nor is it peaking out at exceptionally loud. Again, if this shape under here goes up to here, that's peaking at uh, minus 6. It's exceptionally hot for the reverb output. It's completely not doing that. 
So I don't think there's anything more to be learned from there. I gotta kinda keep moving because there's a bunch of these to cover. We've only barely cracked the 200 seater. The goal here is to find a whole style sound that just lights up with incredible intense sonority on guitar sounds so that I can make a reverb out of it and put it out and start using it in console X mixes and start doing stuff that sounds like familiar and yet not accessible with modern technology up until now and only acceptable with other technology by kind of accident. Some of the old days stuff, classic old tube consoles and things, got to these points by having sort of built-in qualities in their recording chains that produce the desired results almost by accident. The, the bandwidth, the way it handled certain things, would be shifting, and it would give a very inaccurate result, which people have been quick to harp on, in the days of modern digital and so on, to say, oh, what we do now is so much more accurate, which is correct but unhelpful, because if you're trying to actually produce a sound that generates a huge amount of life and interest in like peak energy or distributed slew energy, and that amounts to a exciting sound experience, and then your accuracy completely fails to do anything like that, then your accuracy is not being helpful. And neither was this example, because this example did not produce anything particularly exciting to, to pay attention to. I'm just looking at it to make sure I'm still kind of dialed in with the ideas I'm working with here. And since I'm not really focusing on, I'm focusing on halls rather than plates and front and so on, Front and back are like the extremes of uh, plate and hall. Uh, and plate and, no, no, yeah, front and back ends up being front, unique, and back are the ex opposite, or the exaggerated versions of plate, chamber, and hall. I had the those ones first and then extended it to front and back and so on. And it's all a matter of interpreting. And look at here, we've got another one that's good and loud. And it's not super quiet on the other side either. We don't really want to see like minus 8.52 on one side and then minus 16 on the other side. All that means is that the sonority of the reverb is strictly out of balance and on one side only. And well, that would end up being distributed into the full reverb because the way these are working, the way this is being designed, it's a five by five householder matrix. And one channel has the householder matrix read across and the other channel has the householder matrix read top to bottom. And it's designed in such a way that if you ran a perfect mono into that, you would get a completely alive stereo picture out of the end result because all of your delay taps would be different. While using the same delay, uh, constants for every single one. You're just encountering them in a different order. And it produces stuff like this. One of the sides is louder than the other in terms of maximum RMS power. So here's another one of our loudies. We like that part. And this one ends up looking not totally optimal, but we're starting to get into the zone, I feel. I see the amplitude of the peaks going up and down and looking like it's kind of tied to the underlying sound, but it may be okay. And again, uh, right is a lot more sonorous than left. It's poking out a lot more. You'll notice that there are bits, there are brief passages of time where the left channel is notably louder than the right, and that's because they're different matrices. They're the same constants, but they're being read in two different directions, and so they end up being different matrices. 
I feel like the amount of closely tracking the the RMS loudness on these peaks means that this is not going to be perfectly optimal, but it ain't bad. And also you'll notice with this Hall style algorithm, as the amplitude cuts from the loudest part, this final like da da da, which it looks like you can literally see that on the RMS, which I'll have to find out whether that's actually sounding good or not. Our sustain does not seem to have weird sputterings and artifacts in this line being drawn. And our zero crossing is not stretching upwards to higher frequencies as that dies out. And that's promising. This is what I want to see, only even more so when the guitar dies away and it's just nothing but reverb dying off into the distance. I want to see it behaving kind of like this. It needs to go da -da -da. and then a little guitar scrapey noise and then it loops. So a little guitar scrapey noise is a low frequency sound. It's a bit of a thump and indeed it is causing thump noise in the reverb impulse. So what we're going to do is mark this as L, mark this as extra loud, because its loudest bits are blazing up real far, although they are only in the right channel. But then if I make it so that the channels feed into each other really hot, that will even itself out very quickly. Sounds like this. So I'm going to label that, but I was hearing act an actual frequency, an actual resonant frequency in there, and that's not desirable. It may show up if I look at the uh, tone sweep. We may just see it show up in the relevant channel, or possibly not, but I mean, in red, as we sweep past that note, it looks like maybe the uh, the loudness just briefly spikes as we hit that note that rings out. We don't want that. We don't want any funny spikes on the top of this. This is a monotone sweep. So in theory, if it was a perfect, perfect reverb, you would have no staticky looking stuff on the top of it at all. It would just be perfectly smooth and go whoop and be gone. No artifacts in the tail either, and we see striking strong artifacts in the tail that are repeating this, this black mark here, and then here, and then here. That looks like a repeating sound. So we're going to mark this as scoring very high on loudness, but it's not actually going to be our desirable one. We're just going to mark it in case we ever need to return to that and check out anything about it. More information is always good. Hey, Lorenzo. This turns out to be Science Day. It was going to be Programming Day, but it turned out to be Science Day. I'm getting to the point of wanting to make another cup of coffee and, and race through all of this stuff. I uh, don't believe so, no. No, nope, don't have that. This is well balanced, but not especially loud. It's a chamber style. Well balanced means we don't have any noise hopping up. Super. One of the things about this is that if we have a reverb which really fails to be loud in this sense, what's going to happen is this all ends up sitting in a very quiet space. Like it ends up being a very light shade of gray and never really moving much beyond this point because the reverb is not sustaining or enveloping in such a way that it's adding much extra loudness. 
So it's pretty well behaved, but this is not what I'm looking for for the guitar hall. I do like, however, the fact that it dies away. Uh, I don't like the fact that this is locking into very recognizable notes with some of the sustain. The zero crossing does not depart from like one frequency. So this is like a harmonic of the guitar just honks out and takes over everything else. It should be able to make a, a blurry shape like this rather than just the narrowly defined little honk this line, this line. This should be a sound where in that final bit, on the the rest, the sustain part, we're gonna hear a note honk out in the mid-range. It should come across even over the, uh, the, the Dell monitor speakers, which are terrible. And we should clearly hear that it kind of goes honk there. So the there's there's a note in there that's unusually sonorous, and that's not something we want. Also, I going to double check because I'm forgetting what I'm doing. And yes, we don't need to label it in any special way. We're going through here, and we're noting everything that needs to be labeled in a special way. We're noting everything where not only does it get loud, but it gets hyper super loud. And we're really looking for one where, and again, not so much. We're looking for one where both channels are resonant. Both channels get super loud. And once we've determined some of those, we can go back and forth and kind of both listen and look at what they're all doing. F stands for front. This is going to be a plate-like behavior. It's well-balanced kind of, but it's not actually going super loud at all. So we're going to kind of skip ahead here. Here's another, it's P, which stands for plate. We can even look at the meter and see that this peaks out over here, but then this is a little volume spike that's showing up in the other channel. This does look like it's being distributed in an interesting way. Let's see how it analyzes. Nothing particularly special about that. It's not doing maximum RMS power of spectacularly loud, but let's see what that looks like on the meter. It's not really happening for long enough to show up very much on the meter. We've got some spikes. This is, however, suggesting that what we do have in this one even if it's not really registering as that special. Also, this is one of those plates where it gets brighter as it goes away. It's really falling into a recognizably bright. The, the sustain feels very not blurry. <coughs> this shape I don't like. This shape means that the decay sounds metallic. It's not carrying any extra energy other than what you, what it started with. There's no fullness to the sustain. In fact, there's no fullness to just about any of this. But the loudness is showing the behavior I'm going to be looking for in future, where we've got bits where the red is very sonorous and bright and where the left is very sonorous and bright. It shouldn't be one, it should be both. And then the rest of it is kind of closely tracking the amplitude. So this is not going to be very good as far as spatiality is concerned. On the bright side, it's not very bright either. So, And it sounds like this. It's a plate style effect. And it does indeed sound like a plate style effect. Let's have a look at this chamber style effect. 
This is a chamber style effect that is loud, but also deep and resonant. That's shown through the section here. Let's see just how loud it goes. It looks fairly promising. I also prefer it when it produces its loudness at many different places. And this seems to be doing that to some extent anyhow. We're not going to mark it as anything special because it's not gone super loud in any way. But I'm curious as to how that looks. And again, with some of these ones where it's very tightly linked, it's not actually... What I'm looking for, rather than what you see here, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, rather than what we see here, I would like this gray area to be just filled with information, like this outline across the top should be a dark sea of microdynamics bouncing around constantly. That's what I would like the reverb -y space to feel like, rather than a static, sort of unvarying wash of synthetic sound. And that could make the resulting re reverb a uh, an unusual choice, but if I can make it dominate in certain ways, it'll I'll get away with the fact that and yeah, as far as the deepness is concerned, because it registers as able to carry low frequencies, that's shown in some of this. Our initial sounds have energy lower than uh, 200 hertz. This line's 20, this line's 200 hertz, this line's 2K, and this line is 20K. And with a lot of our sound, we're generating lower frequency noise, especially around here, just after it goes quite loud at this low frequency sound. You can identify what the frequency is by looking at this chart. And then the rest of it, it's continuing to do a much more diverse DC offset picture than some of the other ones. Some of the other ones were very much like a dark line that moves around, but this is more of a cloud for DC offset. And what that's going to mean is this is going to be a more continuous wash of sound, but it will have some fullness even over the dull monitor that I'm playing this through. turns out to be true. So yeah, we did not have a high score. If I don't believe we did anyhow. No, we didn't. As far as maximum RMS power, the bulk of this process is going through all of these and looking for the ones where the loudness ended up becoming spectacular. This is, a, I can already tell this is not going to be one of those ones. Sure enough. Uh, no such thing. That or most recent one. Like right now, probably it's going to be discontinuity just because that's central to so many ones that I'm working on at the moment. Like discontinuity code is finding its way into the new reverbs. It's found its way into console X and I'm really excited for finally getting some of this work done and being able to actually fool with mixing some of this stuff through console X which I must do before turning it loose on the world because I got to find out whether this actually works. Oh, also I got asked, is it DC offset that little peak? You probably mean this one. Yes. The sound leading into this is just a spike that is then faded out to silence. And so entering into the guitar section is a noise that feeds the reverb with a big triangle. Just spike up to high voltage, and then gradually descends back down to zero. It's a, a big triangle of DC offset, basically, so that I can see what it does to the reverb. And in fact, if I meter that, I can literally show you what it did on the DC uh, zero crossing meter.
whenever it's doing the DC offset and slamming up to this high level, we have a black line well below the uh, 20 hertz because this black line represents zero. DC offset is present here. And then it scooches up and becomes reverb tail hovering around a little over 200 hertz. No, actually, no, the, this is the beginning of the guitar sound. But yeah, that is a DC off that thump being put through the reverb. And there's a certain amount of dry left on it, which is why a uh, it's still showing. You wouldn't necessarily see that on a full wet reverb output, but you're seeing it on this. And again, I checked this and found that it's nothing exceptional for maximum RMS power, so we're skipping it over. We're skipping over as many of these things as we can, because I would like to get to the end of this by the end of today. It's I'm going to be getting another cup of coffee real soon, and I should I would like to do some coding, but I also wanted to do this. I haven't done my measurement yet, but. Uh, this is probably going to translate into something that I'm not going to want. It's C, meaning chamber. That's a very even bed of reverb smoothing out what the C, if what, it, what would end up happening. And mind you, this has gone good and loud. This is perhaps promising as far as a chamber style sound is concerned. It's not a hall style sound, but it's like an empty room style sound. And what we see here is very promising. Look at this. We've got a bunch of very intense loudness, and it is stereo. It's not just mono. So I like the looks of this a lot. It's a fairly, this might end up going into one of the um, Bracosti styles, just because it's a good starting place to work from. And the bulk of the sound, if this was a perfectly even gray expanse, it would mean that I put my guitar in there, which is a distorted guitar, but it is not always playing at full crank. There are gaps in the beginning. The junk to junk to junk, junk should be pulsatings in the RMS level. If this is completely featureless, it's not. If it's featureless, the reverb is filling in the space around it so effectively that it's like there's no dynamics. And we've got a pretty decent cloud going on here, and then it goes very, very loud for some of the chord changes and things, the sliding up the neck with the guitar strings and stuff, it continues to be fairly dark throughout. We don't have a comparable splatter of high frequency information in the slew. And remember how I said I wanted it to be very evenly distributed rather than just a line? This is much more like just a line, but the decay off of this RMS meter, that's super even. We have like no little dynamic spikes in the decay tail at all. That's promising. If anything was producing a real gap in there, it would show up and it's not, it's not. So I have a pretty good feeling about this even before I have measured it. And this is gonna measure as very high Let's see what our chamber is doing on the analysis. Sure enough, minus 8.33 and minus 8.87. This is a super high scoring one. This is exceptional in its way. Oh, you wanted to hear it, did you? It's producing a space around the guitar sounds, and then you can see where it's gonna get really loud. And it's in the sustain part. That is pleasing. We're gonna call that double L because it needs a special marking for how cool it is. The fact that it's in both channels rather than just one. Only thing about it is 
that's the chamber sound. I was looking for a hall sound. We're going to look for a hall sound that stands up to that, but for now, this gets some exceptional treatment as a special chamber sound. This particular chamber sound is very good at making a little chamber noise. This is probably not that unlike what people are looking for in things like the sunset chamber. I may very well be able to turn this particular one into like the Bracosti imitation sunset chamber because some of its behavior is that good and could be enough to run with on the back of that. Now, like I said, that's the chamber. I'm looking for a hall. Chamber has very evenly distributed energy and it tends to sound like an empty room. I would like something to sound like a big old hall, which is much larger than the 200 seater. And that means that the echo density has to increase as it goes, which should help with the, the blooming and blossoming sonority. We had a very good ride with this one as far as blooming and blossoming and sonority. Also, sounds okay on drums too. And again, we are hearing over a uh, Dell monitor's internal speakers. This is the this is like sub cell phone. And yet there is an enveloping space. And that's because of what it's doing with peak energy and what it's doing with the intensity of the sound being generated. Here's our guitar. So yeah, here we have a high scorer. The funny thing is the only thing this scores well on is, um, and I say well on, I mean, the only thing it scores on is loudness. It is the ultimate reverb loudness and density. It's also not scoring as unusually bright. And then a little Alien Kittens. It's also not scoring as exceptionally uh, full on this. It's just the whole thing is a little echoey chamber. And that's why it is uh, C on the end, is it's a chamber style design. Let's, let's tell you what, I'm going to bounce over to this just so that I can put something on, presumably out of uh, sounds and scamper off and make myself another cup of coffee before it's too late in the day because I'm spending my entire day doing this. And it didn't really bargain on that, but it is what it is. I feel like this analysis stuff needs doing. So I'm going to throw on a weird thing. This says the plunge side B, again, assuming I can find appropriate things in here, this is a cassette tape of the first multi-trackings that I did in a multi-track um, Fostex or Tascam uh, cassette four-track, which I took apart and rebuilt, mind you, um, in college. This is like before I got clean, and it shows, believe me. But we'll make some noises. And this is the band that I played in. And it's me playing drums. Actually, you know what? I'll put this on a loop. 
this is not my song, but I'm playing drums on this, and it seems to groove along nicely enough. This is also an example of tape cassette audio. Once I get back, I'll tell you a little story about this band, which is uh, maybe a bit of a cautionary tale. It's not an entirely happy story, but it's a thing.
party and back up. So that was my college band. That's me playing drums. We were we were the band um, more than anybody else in the already very hippie stoner college I went to. More than any of the other bands, we were the band that could and would not play without getting incredibly stoned. That's just how that was, and you can maybe hear some of that, but you can also hear some of the ambition, in particular some of the the songwriting there. It's not my song. That is either Ben's or Pete's song. Um, it's a Victoria's Secret. I remember some of the words. I'm not going to sing them for you, though. And, um, you know, the the drums I was using is the first drum set that I ever had. It, is a, uh, it was a Ludwig kit where I stripped out the... Um, I want to call them binding. The inner reinforcement rings on the inside of the shell right at the edges of the shell, where there's like a little extra part that uh, re I stripped those out. And then I cut all of the tom-toms in half so that I could have four of them instead of two. So they're concert toms, but they're also really weird and shallow. I don't remember all the other, I've done crazy things with that drum kit back in the day. And I'm playing with uh, Hickory 2B sticks and beating the hell out of everything. And with a aggression which is not um, accompanied by a sense of time. And and yeah, that was that was us doing our thing. And the um, I told you that there was sort of a, a lesson in it in a sense. And that would be the, the guitar player is Pete Mladenail. He also called himself Peter Frook, and we called the band Frook Indemnity. Kind of like indemnity, but in memnity. Just because getting really stoned and deciding things like that is kind of what one does in college. And um, I did a later album with Pete years later. The, the band had broken up because we weren't able to succeed very well. I think all of us, well, I don't know if all of us dropped out of college. I know that I did. I don't know whether Ben did. I don't know whether Pete did. Ben can't have completely dropped out of college. He ended up being a college teacher. But um, Pete um, continued to be into drugs in the way that I was, but I had to quit, and he did not. And got into harder drugs and wrote songs indeed about them. He wrote a song called New, New Summer Queen, which is amazing. And a lot of the stuff in the album that we did together, because he came out to Vermont when I had moved there and got clean. He came out to Vermont and, um, and we put together an album, which I've got. And then some, he became a journalist and then at some point, uh, he overdosed and he died, and Pete is dead. He's the guitar player you hear here. Ben was the bass player, I was playing the drums. And that's my college band, man. The college band was led and very much dominated by Pete, who is not with us. He's a casualty of um, being the kind of drug druggie with the sorts of imagination that you've got here, but also that drive. To, we were the band that had to get high to play. And it was real challenging. It's one of the things where I am happy I don't have to live that way anymore. That's me playing guitar. I told you. That's what we were kind of up to. There's a little more of the band. The party is over.
that that was Pete's vocals, I think. I think there's some Ben vocal in there. He continued to be a musician. I'm just not working with him anymore. And then we just sort of got a bunch of weird stuff because this was my college tape. This is all the music I was able to do over about the year or so that I was there. A lot of it's very freaky. Very freaky. And I've continued to enjoy the style of music that's just very freaky. Another thing to note about this is it is very much uh, band playing live in a room music. This is a Pete song called Pleasure Sponge. My drums are mixed very loud in this one. have a sort of meltdown section where I completely lose track of what I'm playing. And we try to burst into a uh, rocky section after this. Don't really succeed though. Pete's thing with this band was he wanted us to be able to groove as tightly as Easy Top, which is not really how that ended up happening. And again, this is, I described the instrumentation and stuff. The guitars at this time were trainer amps. Trainer is an interesting sort of halfway between Fender and Marshall style. And uh, let's see. And of course, this is off of a tape cassette, and it was recorded on a four track tape cassette. Decelerando. My biggest influence was essentially my progressive rock stuff in Bill Bruford. So I was really desperate to do Bruford-like things, which I wasn't good enough to do, but I was definitely about to try. In particular, you can hear on some of it that I'm attempting and this is a Finnish instrument that I got from my grandmother and don't still have called a cantala, which is like a harp-like thing. It's a harp-like thing where rather than having a bridge to it, the ends of the box serve as the bridge. So it has a very sustaining quality to it. We'll crank it right up. I didn't always have it tuned very well. And yeah, there is also backwards cantala as well because the cassette tape you can flip it over and then continue playing with it a little burst of drums in there for no reason but for a moment there it sounded quite sweet And then we have some kind of very loud noise about to happen, so I'm going to turn it down a bit. Yep, we're going into a different noise. What's there? <laughs> Just a thump, that's all. 
and then some acoustic guitar playing that isn't exceptional and goes on for Flip and Never. And this is me playing electric guitars back in the day in very much King Crimson inspired way. But it's not a King Crimson song, it's just some weird stuff that I made up. This is inspired by like lark songs where it's supposed to be very quiet and then very loud. It would have been better with like drums and actual musical ability, but but yeah, this was this was me in college. We'll get back to my reverb making momentarily. We're just having a slight uh, detour off of this. The brightness of that guitar is definitely a thing. I believe that is the white guitar body that I still have and the neck that I have that's currently on my Telecaster, but the pickup is a fairly low impedance bar pole piece pickup jammed right up against the bridge, kind of where a rolling guitar pickup would go. Because that is the sound that I wanted at the time. Go figure. And we have a bunch of very goofy noises. Yeah, no, Frick was quite a band. It would never, it could never survive because uh, we got we got taken out by drugs just as much as some of the '60s and '70s bands did, but without ever having actually gained popularity. But we were very interested in. Uh, creativity. For instance, this is early sampling. This is one of those Casio sampler keyboards that are just tiny. And this is back in like the mid 80s. There barely was any sampling at the time. So this is on my little music uh, cassette as well. This isn't the band. Most of the cassette is just me. But it does have some band stuff in there from time to time, including the bit that I played when I went off to get coffee. More of that little sampler keyboard. Some of this is just to make stone people laugh. The idea is you'd I've hung with people who made music to this effect even more recently. The idea is you make music that you show to people after you've gotten them really stoned and see how hard you can make them laugh with the music. And then over to something slightly more normal. And then some kind of I'm not even sure what's making these noises other than I think it's backwards. Bowed cantala, maybe? And that's it. Goes back over to the beginning again. More weirdness. More bandy stuff. And this is the bit that I showed you initially. And there you have it. So yeah. We do our things and you know there's a time and a place for everything. I'm glad I survived that time. 
a lot of the other members of the band came to kind of a sticky end. And it's a three-person band, so that's a scary statement. Um, I think I ended up okay. Both of the other guys were also going through college, having a fine time in various ways. The the bass player would say, yep, so um, you're the one that's going to become a millionaire because you're unlucky in love and can't get laid or date or anything like that, and you're freaking out over that and then getting really stoned all the time, but you're the kind of person that's going to become a millionaire. And, well, I totally did not, but I became Chris Mermidos, so go figure. And then, yeah, and we lost Pete. Pete died. Pete overdosed. It's not just he died at rock drop down or something. Like he, The interest in drugs continued and never left him. Same as it never left me, but I got into recovery. I got into like not doing drugs as a whole thing for me. Whereas uh, Pete did not take to that angle, and so he ended up ODing and dying. Anyways, we've been fussing with this, and we're going to continue fussing with this, I tell you what, because I want to get to the end of these. Maybe even begin work on one of the uh, the reverb plugins, although I am toying with the idea of firing up my wood stove a little bit more. I feel just a little bit chilly in here. Not very, but this is going to be one of the days that's actually quite cold. So when the, the fire is visibly not burning, it might be a good idea for me to throw some more wood in there and get it going. Let's do that. see why it died off. I did not have the damper engaged. That's in burning itself out. some of the Peter Brook stuff, the album that we did. Maybe someday I will. Don't feel like it's today is the day, but someday I will. I'll play the album we did. For now, I will tell you, we did an album together, and it was cool. And uh, interestingly, the, those guys always wanted me to play guitar, although you couldn't really tell from listening to that jam that I had. But they had this impression that I had something special going on guitar playing-wise. Who's to say where it didn't end up being true? At the time, I would not say that was true. Pete was a way better guitar player than me, and in every reasonable sense. But then when we got together and I made the al album with Pete, with all of his own songs, and I was at that time playing an electronic drum kit that I also made myself. And I also overdubbed a lead guitar for him because he wanted me to. And we had that going on. And someday I will play it. Hey, Jonathan. Someday I will play you some of that stuff. For now, we're going to jump back into this line of work because I want to check some of these things out. See what, if anything, I found that one uh, chamber sound that's really quite exceptional. This one, not so much. And we were also constantly looking at how they showed up on the meter. Because this new meter, which eventually will come out once I deal with some of this build stuff. This meter shows us lots of things about how these sounds work. And one of the things that this one is showing is that we have a very even... Uh, I'm doing stuff that will lead to me being able to start working with console X. For instance, this is for the purpose of finding the 
um, five by five householder matrix I can make into a guitar oriented hall reverb, which I can then start mixing stuff into. I'm keeping an eye on my wood stove. I've only just thrown some logs in it and started it going. So I want to make sure everything's good there. So the most recent thing I've done with console X is I went through and made the channel sub out and bus controls all have the same uh, set of controls. The ones that I'm using with this little dingus here, where there will be a kind of like high, medium and low, except for the Kalman version of those things. So I need to come up with new words for it. And it'll have a uh, sweepable mid boost, which can also be a mid replacement for when you suck the mids entirely out. There'll be a, a sweepable bandpass that pokes through if you've done that. And then there is the crossover for the Kelman filter. And then there is this black thing, which is the discontinuity, but it's a distributed form of discontinuity. So you need to have it set on channel and sub and the master bus in order to finally construct your mix. Meaning that any individual application of it is going to be not quite as effective as running it all by itself. And then lastly, there's the pan and the gain control. And I've been working on doing a better pan. I was, before the end of Tuesday stream, I was looking into how pan law worked and finding out whether I could calibrate it in such a way that, uh, here, let's see. I should be able to show this. I think this is still on here. Uh, fire that up. If I'm not mistaken, I can just randomly load this up on something. And it should show me something that's way too loud. I need to turn that right down. <laughs> I had turned up to very, very loud indeed. Didn't really plan that. Here's the pan that's going to go into uh, console X. It's designed around a sine calculation, meaning that at exactly equal, we have unity gain. But then if I go to the side, it's actually going to be boosting by about 3 dB or so, but it's not a linear calculation. Instead, the amplitude of each of the channels is going from like 0 to 1, but with a sine calculation. So everything kind of near to left is going to have left at full crank and then it starts bringing in the other side. And this is going to replace the one that's been in uh, previous ones from console zero. And it is also smooth. You can hear that because you're not hearing any crackly noise on the sign base that I've got here. Meaning that it would be possible to automate it or do whatever. And if you wanted to do 1960s, like, hey, this is what we do with the pan pot, we... It will do that pretty effectively. Which is not to say that you want to, but that is how far console access got so far is I've got that installed on all of the console X plugins that have the controls and they're all designed to work with the little control surface or any other control surface with eight controls on it and I mean if you had one with more than eight controls on it you could in theory do something like go channels or submixes do the sliders and you click on what channel you work with whereas the master section uses the knobs I'm thinking of the Korg for instance master section could use the knobs and remain always engaged 
so you'd always be able to fiddle with slight details on the mix at the master section, no matter what you were working on. You could kind of include that. And it depends upon whether people would even want to. But uh, if you have a control surface like the Nano Control that has 16 parameters rather than only t only eight, that becomes possible. And that's why we're doing this. Because when I start doing stuff like remixing the tracks I did last year, and I, I have done a couple of goes at that, I did a remix with Console MC, and then I did a remix with Console MD, and then I went back to Console MC again, and then I did a remix with Console LA. And that's kind of how I'm trying these things out. I'm happy enough with that, but I want to do this Console X so that I can do something that's actually original rather than let me re replicate the magic of the 1970s. Like, that's cool and all, but I want to do something for the future. So where are we at? We're having a look at how this measures out. And in fact, I have to click on that. And there we are. So this one, I think we looked at the measurement without actually having measured it. And this is looking OK. We can see that the sustain into silence on this uh, plate reverb style thing is incorporating low frequency information in a useful way. It's not just a strict little line. Instead, it's got a bit of a wash to it. This is not too sharp of a line. It's a little sharp over here, though. And we do have some loudness, and it is, in fact, stereo. It's not just only in one channel. It's showing up at this moment rather than later, and that's interesting. Everything's going to have its own stuff to reinforce or not. Also, I like the way it's getting distributed a little bit more. So this looks cool and all, but let's see how it measures when we just do analyze. And it's nothing exceptional. So we get to close this immediately, but as you can see, this has uh, red, yellow, and blue. Blue signifies depth and bass content, which corresponds to what I saw in the uh, zero cross meter. And yellow means that it's bright. And I think that also corresponds to some extent with what I saw. Over to this uh, chamber style. We're going to start really rushing through these, I feel. I really want to get to some of the larger ones. Ooh, hello. And this one goes to 8.87. That's good and loud. So we're going to be labeling this as L, but not LL. LL means both of the channels get good and loud. And what it looks like is this. Uh, could be. I'm not sure that this one is necessarily going to be that exceptional. That said, I think it's better than anything I've previously done, like every trim. Some Those are very much not really, I don't think they're designed to be very special. I like the balance this has. This has intense bursts of loudness. The cloud quality is very effective. And again, this is one of our L, meaning that it becomes very loud. But all I like very much the fact that this burst into loudness is right-centric, and this is left-centric. That suggests that we get the ability to have energy on both sides rather than it being out of balance. I like that a lot. So this is a chamber style sound. And it might actually end up being pretty good. All in all, yeah. Our sustaining area is going to be very metallic-y sounding and kind of resonant because these lines here show that there's not a lot of extra air around it. It's just kind of sending a laser beam right through you. And then the tail of it is not as clean as it could be. 
the tail of it has these little lines in here where those lines are because something is not consistent in the reverb tail, meaning that it's going to be an artifact and that's not necessarily going to sound good. But some of this has promise. So let's hear it. That's a very bright room. That is a very bright room indeed. Yeah, there's nothing so wrong with that. Might not be my first choice though. We will keep an eye on it in future reference. For instance, if I'm trying to do specifically a Bracasti style that has that kind of like, for instance, scoring stage is very bright. And this one is definitely got a lot of airy brightness going on in it. Let me see if I can show you scoring stage. It'll be a lot quieter, but here we go. So scoring stage off of the Bracasti sounds like this. So yeah, not a million miles away. It's quieter. So that's the Bracosti take on scoring stage. Whereas what we've just done, I think is 220. Yeah, I clicked away. Did I lose what I was up to? No, it's up here. This one was my scoring stage. And it's not a billion miles away. And here we have another hall. Let's see what this does for us. It's an H. That means Hall algorithm. It's all the same algorithm, but it's what you do with it. This does not count as being exceptional in this way, but once we get into the Hall, we're probably going to get into a zone where the distribution of this energy is a little different. And we can kind of see that, that it's a little smoother whereas uh, some of the other ones will have more dynamic spikes in there. This is, this is a little smoother, although it has nothing really else going for it. And it's producing the kind of effect I'm looking to see. Also, nice reverb tail without too many artifacts. Ideally, this area right here, I'm making the, the pointer get big so that I can see it more accurately. This bit right here, I'd like the smoothest possible line in this little area. The more little vertical jots you have in here, the less happy I'll be with it. I don't know that the streaming is showing it very well. But this is a hall style sound, and that's helping make a uniform cloud of peak energy. In fact, some of these peak energies, they look like they're doubling up. They're hitting in different places. And there's just a lot going on up here. It's not peaking out at maximum possible loudness, but the distribution here is good. And once I sort out which ones are um, as loud as I want them and have other qualities that I want, I'll be referring to this and making notes on which ones have better space up here because I'm interested in the distribution of the peak energy that, again, is supposedly inaudible. This means everything to what my project is going forward. It's going to mean everything to the console X stuff because that's all part of being able to mas massage things into an area where you're showing 
this kind of stuff and you have a mix that's sitting at about the right level like this is about the right level for a full band mix it's just a solo uh, peaking up appropriately with percussion and dynamics and then the entire top area is filled with peak energy and slew energy and again because it's a reverb it's filling in this a little bit lower once you start including drums and cymbals and things, you start really going right up to the top edge of the peak energy. And you don't necessarily want to go beyond that. And you start expanding down with kick drums and bass drums and things. So the low area gets filled in as well. And you want that to be constantly active. And that is deeply dependent upon how loud your peaks are relative to your lows. So you don't get to just do a, a bright, tizzy, modern mix and have this work properly. And our the sound of our thing, which is not going to be specially labeled, but is a hall style sound with peak energy that's about where it should be, sounds kind of like this. I'm looking for something kind of like that as far as the sonority and space around the guitars. It needs to have the resonance of a big hall. So we're going to go for larger um, examples than this. This did not end up being exceptional. Although 224B, same number of seats in the hall, this one actually has a, a lower rate on the uh, sign sweep. So we should see whether it has a higher measurement on the RMS, and it does not. But the, what happens when you have the lower rate on the sine sweep means that individual sounds aren't resonating as hard as the full body of the sound. And so I'm curious as to whether that's going to translate to something in the metering. And it might be translating to a smoother distribution of peak energy, but it's not covering as wide of a range as it could. Also, this is not a especially bright. I might be game for a brighter reverb in this context, simply because it might fill up some of these areas more effectively. I'm really stepping beyond the can I make it sound like a Bracosti to can I make it serve my purposes. Again, this is a hall sound and the zero cross, this is blurring out quite nicely, this one. It should be carrying the weight and sonority of a big amp, even though it's not one. And part of that is using the reverb to fill in those frequencies, even if they're not initially there. So the sound should combine to produce lower frequencies, even here, lower than 200 hertz, or here, significantly lower than 200 hertz. And then as you hit the final chords and it sustains, this is the da-da-da, and then muted. And this is only the reverb tail. You can see that there are some artifacts in there. That's not great. But you can also see that rather than constricting and becoming just a single note that goes up higher in pitch, up to around 2K, this is continuing to have low frequencies in the reverb tail even after the sound has ceased to happen. And that is very much what I'm looking to see happen with some of these. So I'm pretty sure this ended up not, yeah, it can't possibly have registered as one that I need to mark as loud, but this sounds like this. And that reverb tail. The weight sustains a little tiny bit. A bit of a rumble. So yeah, while this doesn't get special markings, this does constitute a fairly good example of a big loud hall style thing. 
we can actually bounce back over and to show you an example of a hall that did not end up being loud. I don't even need to run uh, analyze on that. I just need to run the uh, visualization. This is one where the only thing that ended up getting highlighted was green. Green means the high frequency information coming off of this reverb was unusually quiet compared to other reverbs. And the lack of uh, loudness cues means that um, this particular reverb does not have the sonority. And you see that here. It's making its little cloud there, but nothing is really poking up. And it's following very closely to the sound of the amp. And even with their final burst, it's a lot quieter than some of the other stuff. It does not resonate. It does not have the sonority of some of the other reverbs. And so the whole thing ends up being kind of quiet relative to some of this other stuff. But it's doing a good cloud effect there. And one side effect is that ends up making it smoother. And then the fact that it's registering as green, that means none of the slew is too hot. And so all of this ends up being kind of restricted. It doesn't really go up very far. And a side effect of that is that it's pretty much welded to the dynamics of the guitar. You can kind of see the shapes underneath echoed in the peaks and the slews. And it's also the zero crossings tell me that it's not really producing a lot of extra stuff beyond what the raw guitar sound is doing. If you don't have any reverb, this is basically a, a line. It doesn't really have much going on as far as producing variation here, and variation in here sounds better. So the raw uh, amp sound is going to sound kind of plain and dead all by itself without reverb in it. And this thing, which is not an especially sonorous reverb by comparison to the other one, sounds like this. So what you get there is the basic sounds presented pretty accurately with a reverb that sits back and doesn't really call much attention to itself, but it also doesn't have like fire and energy to it. And that's what you get with a whole style reverb that is just this. We've also got ones where we've got clean and also bassy, so just for shucks and giggles. I'll run that one. And the one which is that but bassy and lacking in unpleasant sonority is this. It's even more so. Even more, nothing much is happening beyond the uh, sound itself. It's the reverb that really gets out of the way and it's not doing anything unusual. It's reinforcing the sound, but it's not really doing or adding anything else. This picture is very similar to what the raw guitar amp sound is like. And the sound. Is very similar to what the raw amp sound is like. We're looking for more drama than that. We're looking, for instance, here is a plate style one where the energy is higher but not especially so. So with their plate style one, where the energy is higher, it's departing somewhat from the picture of just what the guitar itself would be doing. It's not locked to what the original guitar necessarily was. For instance, all this stuff that's on one side and not the other is purely reverb and none of the raw guitar because the raw guitar is in mono and doesn't have any of these departures from mono. All the departures are purely reverb energy. And as you can see, it's a slightly cloudier effect and it's pushing a lot hotter than just the initial stuff. The added darkness, the added increase in RMS level 
is all sustaining uh, reverb sonority and additional energy, which sounds like this. And I want to make the sound of the reverb, like rattling and echoing away in there, like what I remember when I went to a Night Ranger concert as a kid. As I went to a Night Ranger concert in a hockey arena as a kid, and it was a formative experience. I didn't want to get too close to the stage, but I heard the entire arena crackle. And it was pretty cool. It was a wild experience, all told. So this looks very promising. It is a, uh, it's coded as U, meaning unique, meaning it is an empty room style sound, but it's an empty room style sound where the maximum RMS power on both sides is exceptionally high. It's probably going to be making uh, sounds that are distinct from each other, like it won't be exactly the same at any second. There will be some moments that are much louder on one side and some moments that are much louder on the other. And literally, so this is going to be another LL. This is going to be another, this counts as exceptional on both channels. And I can't wait to see what it looks like on the meter. One of the things it immediately looks like is a dense cloud of peak energy all over the place, and that's as designed. It's supposed to be doing that. And we're clearly shooting off uh, peak fireworks left and right. A lot of it is uh, right, but as you can see, it also goes left sometimes too. We've got a fairly decent uh, reverb tail, although it's not perfect. With the amount of sonority we're getting out of these, we're probably never going to get a perfect re reverb tail and this amount of sonority and resonance at the same time. It's going to be one or the other. But yeah, what we're looking for, and it's not peeking out too hot, really. We're looking for this cloudiness all over the place. Like, as we sustain, when it goes to the super loud sections here that are shown in a darker shade, that's when it starts locking on a single note and you hear the entire venue just sort of roar at that note. Ideally, that would still be a cloud, but I understand if it can't be. Like over here, it mostly seems to be boxy above 200 hertz frequencies causing it. Ideally, you would also have high frequencies maybe as high as here playing a role, but this might be more a, a low frequency. It, it's like a room mode. It's like the unique algorithm generates rooms with room modes in them, and so we have a honk, but it's not just in one side. It's in both sides, and that will help. And we do have some nice variations in the microdynamics here. That's important and interesting. And I'm just loving the way that in this area, even before it locks into a really resonant sound, our peaks are a cloud and they are just maxing out here. They're going as loud as they possibly can. And they're just crackling. So having ascertained that we're going to call this 230LLU, let's hear this magical thing. Sounds like an empty room. This one could possibly find a place in a thing like, for instance, if I was to try to do one that was a really big room, but like a, you know, Abbey Road Studio A or something, where if you take specific sounds, like for instance, 
the sound of the beginning of uh, Pink Floyd's Shine On You Crazy Diamond. The famous guitar, like there was dong, 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 dong. That is a guitar through a big old amp in the middle of Studio A, mic'd at a distance. That's how they did that sound. There's some effects in there as well. But the size, scale, and scope of it is all about having a big clean amp in a big empty reverberant room. And all the space that you hear there is in part distance, like I, I do with discontinuity, but also a room with the right resonant qualities. And it is my hope that a room like this could be made into a useful artificial reverb that can give that effect. Because I'm looking for that both channels intense mid-range sonority. The mid-range needs to really be able to honk in order to convey that kind of impression. Again, I often do your sort of anti-soothe kind of thing. The, the, the point is not to make all the frequencies balance out and be equal. The point is to have When the guitar hits the sustaining chord, the air needs to crackle. It needs to have a sonority like, you know, there is a trombone section uh, 20 feet away from you and they're making your teeth rattle. It needs to be that kind of sound. And you can't get that with your modern techniques and the way people are doing it. But there's no special reason you couldn't do it if you went about it the right way. And that's that's the purpose of this process. So what we're going to do is go in and update this the way I said I was going to with having. And I love the fact that this also has the purple flag, meaning that it is not unusually sonorous on any given honk of a frequency. So here's another LL. I can kind of see how far they stuck out to. We've got a 216, which is a chamber. I don't know if we have any smaller ones. No, it looks like not. So we can kind of see how far the names stick out. And we've got a chamber that has intense sonority in both channels. And we have a unique, which is similar to a chamber, which also has intense sonority in both channels. And I would say we're doing pretty good. Now we have a uh, front, meaning it's a, a plate style effect. And let's see whether this has the sonority. Nope, not in either channel. This does not get a special label. We're going to just skip over this. We've seen these before. How about this hall? I want to get on towards actually coding something today, so we're going to see how we can get past doing that. This is just an important part of the process. We'll hang in there and get through all of this stuff. Here. We're going to skip over this one as well. Let's skip over everything. Now that we've unearthed a couple of these, I'm going to race through everything else. And only if I see other stuff that needs to have this extra information be put in, like I need to write L on it and have it be red and also orange. Only then are we going to skip ahead. So here's a F. F for front also counts as a plate-like sound. Not exceptional in any way. I'm looking for minus 9 or minus 8 or minus 7, etc. And ideally in both channels. Very rarely does that happen, but we've seen it happen twice now. And they're all going to at least be red. The question is, are they beyond red in volume? And again, nope. But there have been examples. Maybe there's only going to be the two. That'll simplify things quite a bit. I'll just copy them directly over into my uh, SD card and kind of run with it. Also, nope. It may just be that we're getting into a zone where 
the halls are large enough that not enough energy can build up in them and that maybe there are only going to be two examples in everything I've done so far, which is not to say that I couldn't do more in future because we're generating these more or less. It's just computer time. It's just running my my processor. It's it's running this literal program into the matrix and setting it to like call and going search, please. And it grinds its way through. I run it like overnight and eventually it finds stuff that it puts in here. And it gives me about 20 to 40 opportunities or examples. And then I go through those and I start ruling them out based on whether the the um, encoding into FLAC requires a lot of information or very little. And if the encoding into FLAC requires very little, that implies it's going to be metallic sounding. So yeah, if we if we generate it, we produce something like this. And it says plainly on it, like this is the dispersal of where the echoes would go. These are the constants. And this is what each of the delays would have to be. And if the file size, once I make it into a flag, is uh, not larger than 23 uh, meg megabytes, then I don't keep it. And that's how we got here. And here we have 246F. And even if I remember to do this again, I'll do it again. And this is also not exceptional. So we're going to keep skipping through as quickly as possible to see whether we can get to much larger reverbs that still have intense loudness and sonority to them, which is basically, oh, boom, got one. This is not a double L, double L but it's a single L because only one channel is going very, very loud, but this is going very, very loud. As such, I'm going to see what it looks like on the meter. And then we'll hear it. I'm kind of liking the fact that this one is coming across as very quiet until it goes loud. Like we've got a real spike in volume here and there, but most of it is not just full of lots of energy. This bit up in the beginning here is sitting around 6, 12, 18 dB down, which is probably about right. The idea is to have the, the cloud of peak information be a pretty uniform cloud that occupies as much space as possible. I'm going to say that that translates to a interesting and exciting noise coming out. And then also, if possible, the same thing should be true for SLU. And the same thing should be true for the density of this, which is this one fails on this count. Because especially as it starts getting resonant here, we're starting to get only one frequency coming out rather than a scattering of frequencies, implying that we're filling up space with the reverb and there's more to it than just the sound of a honking note coming across. So yeah, this ended up counting as loud, but not uh, loud on both channels. You can see that the left channel is lacking here. It's not actually able to be as sonorous as the right channel. This showing up here is sonority. It's th the way that the reverb can fill up a bunch of space. And the sound of it is like this. So what I want, oh, also the uh, tail. That tail is not especially good. This is the one where 
the uh, other color coding is purple, meaning that this noise does not register as a very high volume in RMS. It's not supposed to have a particularly loud RMS because it is a sweeping sign implying that if anything shows up especially loud that way, it honks. It is a, a specific resonant frequency and you don't want anything really specific in your room reverberation honking away. It's like it's like having a resonating thing and it's just no matter what you play into it, it's the same honk and you just don't want that part. So this worked out well. This not especially, but it does at least get ranked as one of the ones that registers loud. And we're going to do that right now. By throwing on our single L. And again, it's a front, which is a plate style thing. And so I don't actually want that. Here we have one that's already labeled with red and orange. Interesting. It's another front though. So let's see, this clearly made an impression if it's that damn loud. Let's see if it's that loud in both channels. It super is. Look, that's the reason I did that when I hadn't even started this process yet. This one goes all the way up to minus 6 dB. And the other channel goes all the way up to minus 7 dB. This is an insanely loud and resonant plate style sound. I may I may be using it in one of the uh, the plates I'm working on on the other laptop there. Let's see how this looks on our meter because this is an exceptionally intense example of this type of sound. It should mean that the cloud of density there is extremely widely distributed because there's a lot of energy available. And yeah, we're just peeking out like crazy there. It's leaning a little bit towards the left, but on the whole, it's pretty much just peeking out like crazy. We have a reasonably acceptable brightness. And as predicted, when we have it going very resonant, it just locks into such a tight resonance here that we don't see any dispersion. That might be okay. I note that the sustain is nicely free of extra artifacts, but that it, and it's not locking into a single line, but at the same time, it's ramping upwards a little. It's going a little towards the bright in its, its final sustain and decay. So this is going to count as an LL for loud on both channels. And let's hear what this craziness did. Is it's also a plate style. Yeah, distortion. So that's what I would call a very live sound. The highs are just splattering everywhere. And yet the mid-range sonority is extremely intense. So yeah, we got another LL. The uh, color coding is already set to represent that. So we're just going to add it to the file name. And I'm fairly sure that that actually is represented in what I'm doing. Tell you what, let's bounce over to here. Let's see. We'll put sounds away. And let's have a look at some of my plates. In particular, maybe it's plate 140 that I'm using, because I would have been trying to start doing this. What have we got? 254F, yep, that's going to be this one. So this I'm already trying to use this for something. And we'll call it LLF. 
And yeah, I have begun using this for what's going to be K-Plate 140, the big steel version. And that's why. I've already begun to try to do things with reverbs, including this. In fact, I may even have an example. That is because I would have tried this and heard what it sounded like if the, the build folder is there. Is there a version of it? There is. And uh, there already was a existing version, so let's see. Where is, okay, a different guitar sound. So here's Rise Dirt Guitar. It's going to be a little too hot, but that's fine. And let's go and find, it won't be in VSTs because I won't have made that yet. Let's see if this runs, because this may not run, but we'll find out. Yeah, so this is over the big speakers. I think this has my dis, uh, discontinuity in there. And one thing it definitely has, this damping includes the, a variation on short bus that cuts out low frequencies more. So that is not dialed in yet. That is set up in such a way that it's possible for making it just gratuitously bright and abrasive. None of this is dialed in yet, but what we've got is this. And that is completely undamped. And as we move the damper in closer and closer, I haven't adjusted the, the slope on this at all. You start getting a brighter and brighter effect. And also a really obvious distortion that I'll need to work on. But this is using the same thing we just looked at on the main computer. But as we lower damping, it cuts right out. Let's have that repeat. So with no damping, sustains a lot. But then as we put in lots of damping, the lows die away faster than the highs, and we can also exaggerate it so that there's almost no decay at all. And then that's a heavily, heavily damped plate style sound. We have a pre-delay. which may or may not be working. Oh, I didn't even have any wetness. And yeah, the idea is to dial that in to where it's working sufficiently well. I can probably use Bricosti as a good reference point for what people normally accept as a good sounding plate, which is not to say that I'll be making it sound or work the same, 
but what I'd be doing is trying to find any areas that I'm so wildly off that it'll be objectionable and dial them in. But this is literally using this example here. And we've got it already built into, I don't know what the other one is. I wonder whether I can identify. Actually, I don't need to worry about that. I can just look it up, check this out. So let's see which other one we've used. I'm looking to make a 240 plate. I also think for this one, I would have identified and chosen something that was not as intense because the 240 plate, see, we've got 176 F. 240 plate would be the gold foil plate. Gold foil plate is supposed to have richness and warmth, but be very much not as good as the big, the big brother. What did we have in here? Cause I bet it's going to be listed 176 F. So this one, used this example, which did not take any special qualities to it, but it had something going on. And one of those things, let's see now. So the idea was the 240 plate was I was using this example. And what we're trying to do here is do the gold, gold foil sound, which is a particular kind of bloom and intensity, but one that does not include the high frequency life and energy of the full on steel plate. But it's supposed to be pretty well behaved in some other ways. And just in general, to the extent that it is a lesser plate, it should still have the ability to do like mid range bloom. It's just not going to be able to do high frequency bloom and sparkle. And I think that's represented fairly well here. It seems to be on the whole, fairly well balanced. It seems to be doing a pretty decent sort of peak cloud. And we've got it defined in here. It does not end up with being rated as extra loud in any way, but this one's not meant to be. And uh, our zero cross seems to be basically good on the whole. And as we bounce back over to, whoop, actually that was in fact coding stream. I think I was not actually showing. I'm sorry, let's do that again. So this is what I was telling you about. That um, the cloud here seems to be basically good. The zero cross energy does seem to cover a range like the distribution even with some of the resonant parts, it seems to cover a range of information that's going to help with uh, the blossom and bloom of it all. But the high frequencies really don't ever stretch out beyond, and that's consistent with the gold foil. The gold foil reverb is known to be not as good as the steel reverb, which is much larger. This is the miniaturized version. It can still be good, but it's going to have very different qualities and often used for different purposes. You might have that sound in like some 1990s type stuff, places where they were still using that kind of thing, but it's smaller studios that didn't have room for a full 140 giant plate reverb. And this will be, this will show up in various places. And maybe one of those places can be literally on the dev laptop because I can open up, if I can find it, yep, there it is again. I can open up the same uh, guitar thingy and instead of playing the 140 as I just did, we're going to go in search of the uh, 240. Because I bet you anything, when I was doing this, let's find it. 
I made an example. Seems to play. Good. Seems to be very hot, too, but that's fine. So this is supposed to be the gold foil. It has not been equalized or shaped yet. And as a result, the undamped section is supposed to be sort of darker and plummier than the, the steel one. And indeed, it doesn't have quite as much sparkle and liveliness to it. And again, as we begin bringing in damping, this is using that variation on short bus, where if we bring the damper closer, we're forcing low frequencies to go up into the highs, and that's going to change the sound. To the point where it can be really suppressed. Raw. So that would be the most damped possible uh, gold foil plate. I don't know whether my pre-delay is doing anything, but that's for another day. And as you move the damper out, you start getting more fullness rather than just highs. And as you go into it too loudly, we can distort it quite easily. And that's probably because I have a discontinuity in there. I bet I included it in there. You can find out. Don't have to just guess. Let's go and have a look. Oh, we're not actually using the pre-delay for anything. Fair enough. That's why I didn't hear anything happen. And then there's our householder reverb and this either, it, maybe this is the, uh, let's see what we've got in here. That would be our pitch drift, so this is not actually going to count for including. What I'm looking to do is put discontinuity into this slot rather than have the pitch drift. Maybe there might be something controlling the pitch drift, but I don't remember what it would be. We're not using some of these things. We've got uh, SB scale, that's the short bus, that's the thing that's cutting off the lows, and so that is on channel two. The idea was to, to tune this in to where the regeneration combined with the short bus effect produces the desired effect over the full range of uh, damper position. And it's to, the closer you get to the damping plate, the more it cuts out lows, but leaves some of the highs giving a little space around things, and that's what I want to bring in. I want to be able to emphasize that so that rather than just selecting, you know, K plate A or K plate D versus K plate B or C, you can actually modulate the behavior by positioning the damping plate. And I do not know if I have uh, anything else going on at this. So this is waiting on me for doing more, and that's fine. Back to the other grind. Might be getting around time for more in the way of logs of firewood in the fire and 
the final coffee I can get away with today. We're not quite to the point of getting ready to defrost off for my uh, tacos today. But I am happy to return to my usual workflow where I'm cranking away with this stuff and um, getting ready to have my usual evening. And so I, I have autism. I'm a creature of habit. I run better when things operate predictably. So people coming in, rapping on my door and sweeping my chimney, while it is good in its own right, it throws me off. So let's see, where were we at? We were just looking at this one that goes into 140. That's the one that goes into 140. So I have found both of the impulses, or they're not impulses, they're algorithms. If they were impulses, they wouldn't be so interactive. Uh, delay constants maybe is what I should say. I found both of the delay constants that went into what we're doing here. And one of them registered at something that we are flagging. I don't think it was 230 either. Nope. Here's the one that registered as I need, no, this said, come to, hang on, hang on, hang on. F, F is for front. These are the ones that I generated for uh, plate style things, this is where I got the 140 plate reverb off of, is this. This is the raw sound that I ended up using for the 140, but I'm looking for guitar plate. Because this, suitably controlled, and like if I, if I damp the sustain on the lows and stuff, this can be used for both close up and distant things. I won't sim I won't have to just only use this for deep reverb. It could be multi-purpose because uh, 140 is in fact multi-purpose. Like you'd be able to run vocals through it and then use the damper to suppress the sustain of the vocals so that they sat in an appropriate spot. I'm also feeling that I want to adjust the way that my in my dry wet for the reverbs works. And that's because while I like bringing it up to full wet by virtue of bringing it up first to both the raw signal and the reverb output at full crank and then attenuating it until it is only reverb signal at full wet. I'm not happy with what I have to do in order to get blends using that technique. I feel like the way it's working, I have my raw signal up to 0 0.5, but then when I bring in reverb, the reverb ends up being so quiet and I'm also a little concerned about overloading the reverb. If we got to run, if, if this becomes part of the console X system where you're monitoring through the reverb, using it mostly as dry, and then just bleeding in a little of the verb and calling that the submix rather than using auxes and sending them to a submix bus. And I'm committed to doing that. I think that it will be better. At that point, I have to be more cautious about running full submix levels, which could be up to over zero. I'm more concerned about running that into the input of the reverb because at that point, it won't actually be attenuating going into the reverb. So if I've got non-linearities non inside the actual reverb, they will distort like crazy even if I have the output of it turned right down. And I think I was hearing some of that with the K-plate 140 and 240 that are only beginning to be done. I think I was hearing that. I think when I was running the guitar in there, um, I had to pad it enormously, but you, the way that I'm describing it, you wouldn't really be able to do that. Or maybe you could, but... Uh, it's somewhat 
more uncomfortable. So I'm thinking about having the, the, the dry wet going to having both of them full on. Like if the dry signal is part of that blend, I'll throw another power function on there. Here, let me, I'm talking, but I could show you. Let's fire up the 140. And then we'll get back to some of this other stuff. We're going to spend the whole day derping around with this kind of thing, I'll tell you. So here's what we've got. We've got wet is param 5 times 2. Dry is 2 minus wet. And then they're clamped. So they go to full crank. But what I'm going to need to add would be like this. If it's larger than 1, then it equals 1, always. But we add an additional statement saying that if wet is not larger than 1, that means we're in that beginning part. And so we're going to add a taper to the control. And the control will get this taper so that if we're not using full wet, then what's going to happen is the input, then th we're not going to be setting the knob to like 0.1 or 0 0.003 or whatever to get small amounts of reverb. You'll be able to move it farther over into the path of, of the control without losing adjustability because in use, the K plugins have been causing me that problem that if I was going to try to mix all the way through them, I'd have to just barely crack them open. And again, I can demonstrate that with one of the existing ones. All I got to do is fire up the same guitar, which is a pretty good representative representative of we would send this into a bus. And then if I wanted to balance it with, say, K Cathedral 2, I would have to, let's see, where did it? K element OP. There we go. Hopefully it'll run. We'll see. Let's play it and see if it crashes or not. It's just crash sometimes. See, if I want it to be not overwhelmingly reverby, we're at like 0 0.07. There's not a lot of motion. It should be like over here to get this loud. And if it is, Now that's very loud reverb. So we want the range of this control to sit around here to get to settings that are currently sitting like there. And I'm willing to do that only on stuff going forward because I had not designed K Cathedral 2 when I started doing console X. But I do need to construct these to where they pass through the um, dry-wet control and use the dry control for what it is. That will need to happen. That said, I'm happy that that worked without crashing. Good for it. So we're going to do a couple of quick little changes in here because we can. Knowing that it does this, I can set that up. And now if the wet control is under 50%, I could technically also do that to the dry control, but I'm not sure it would be advantageous. All that would do is make the dry drop out much quicker the closer we got to full crank, and that's not really very useful, so we're not going to bother with that part. But we're going to do this, and I'll tell you what more. We can build it just in case. And then we're also going to do it with the K plate 240. And we're also going to do it with um, whatever we come up with as far as this guitar one is. Here's our 240. And it's going to have a lot of the same stuff. And we're going to place the same criterion. 
If it's larger than 1, then it equals 1 else, we're going to scale it. It's multiplied by itself. Therefore, if it's a small amount, it gets made an even smaller amount. And that causes our logarithmic kind of curve to the thing. So we'd be able to turn it farther. And we'll have a little more control over how that goes. And that's a good start to get more into this. We'll probably end up putting out Kplate 240 first, just because that gives me more time to fuss with 140 and get it as good as I can. And then all of this needs to move up because we're going to have a plate. I mean, not a plate, a hall. There will be a hall sitting down here that is also designed to operate in this way. And that'll probably work for, like, that'll take care of a lot of my needs. I do have the K-Cathedral, too. And I can still use that, even if I haven't done that tweak with the levels yet. But honestly, for a lot of the stuff that I might want to do, having, you know, a really good plate or two, which is more likely to be useful for close-up sounds that still have a spatiality around them, and then also having a, a deep plate if I want, which is the 140, that can serve both purposes, and then also a guitar hall like I've been talking about, and then also K Cathedral 2, which will work for a really deep space within the limitations of what it is. I'm trying to improve on each one of these as I go. And tell you what, the fire has died down again, and it is 1240, so this is like getting to be the end of my ability to make more cups of coffee today without doing myself an injury. Maybe not an injury, but uh, I am not meant to do some of those things. Let's just play this. The album none of you ever saw, although it exists in CD form out there, kind of. It was burned on CD-ROMs and sold at furry conventions, believe it or not. Go figure. I will start doing my things.
that'll do for that, I guess. Oh, Got to close it just a moment. I took almost all of the uh, 10 minutes that this indicates. There it goes. And that's because I was using the facilities and I also saw fit to put away my coffee stuff until next week. The espresso stuff at least. Because we are not guzzling even more coffee today. We're just going to have this final wonderful cup of espresso and finish up this work. That said, it's going pretty well. We have already discovered that we've got stuff like uh, 254LLF here. And we're using that for um, the 140 plate. Being that it is LLF, F means front. Front is similar to plate in that it is a intense distribution of echo returns early on rather than later on. And the software that I came up with, such as this, is able to distinguish between those things and emphasize stuff that is early on versus later on. And what we're looking for is not necessarily back, but we're looking for hall weightings of the echo returns, where the weightings are going to be more later. I don't know if we've even generated a lot of... of I guess we can listen to them and find out what they're like. We haven't done much in the way of uh, the distribution is all the way to the back, just trying very hard to only have the latest echoes possible. Again, these all these all vary. We've also got C and U. C means chamber, U means unique. Both of those tend to produce sounds that are more like big empty rooms. Here's one, 282U. Also, as they get to be larger numbers, we start to get larger, more monumental sounding spaces. For instance, this one is apparently large sounding. Which it pretty much is. And we're going to see whether this has any exceptional qualities. As the delay times start getting longer, we stop seeing as much in the way of really loud responses. This one goes all the way to minus 9, so it does count as an L, but it's not in both channels, it's only in one channel. And the metering for that, which is going to tell me volumes, one hopes, looks kind of like this. The longer the delay time, the more it turns into a sort of uniform wash. But we don't want it to be too uniform. And we want a lot of choppy interest going on. And we want a real cloud of um, sounds poking around. And we want the decay time to not go brighter as the decay uh, drops off to silence, and we want a very even decay here without these artifacts. So this is not a good sign. There's a bunch of looking like evenly spaced stuff in here. If I am not mistaken, that will probably correlate to it not sounding especially smooth. It'll sound a little bit more fake and metallic and stuff. And, you know, some of those things we might be able to live with, but honestly, this doesn't look as if it's going to be exceptional. And indeed, I don't think it is. It is like a big empty room, yes, but not a great big empty room. So we're going to update it as needed. But only to an extent. So here we have another one. Let's see how this one shapes up. Because again, the thing I'm checking on, I want to see whether I can find the ones where both of the channels, not just one, 
are peaking out at very high intensity. This is extremely even, but it is not peaking out at very high intensity. And I'm looking to make a live room sound. I'm looking to make a guitar hall where you start putting guitars in there, mix them in just very quietly, and it's like the air is just crackling with energy. This has some good things about it, but it is not really qualifying as exceptional. I'm going to double check because I think I've already forgotten uh, whether it rated as extra good or not. And again, we've got some artifacts in this delay tail. It shouldn't be throwing variations as intense as that. Some of them don't. Some of them have a nice smooth decay tail, but this has some disruptions in it. That said, I like this uh, distribution of energy up here. It does sound like a large empty room. U and C do seem to end up, yep, nothing special here. We can just skip right over this. U and C tend to come off like big empty rooms. Here's an H. How are we doing with this? Nothing exceptional as far as maximum power. It's not going to count as loud. It's not going to count as double loud. But I'm curious as to how it shows up, seeing as I'm looking for halls. What kind of things can I expect charting out how a hall behaves? And one of the things I'm seeing immediately is that the startup is leading to low frequency energy here. It's distributed the energy very, very widely on the zero cross meter. Also, that's a lovely smooth decay tail. We don't have any huge disruptions there. And it's a lovely smooth zero cross meter on the decay tail as well, because that is not going brighter. And it's enabling low frequencies, even as low as this little point here, in the middle of the decay tail where the actual frequencies are up here. So this implies that we have a bunch of energy hovering here, and we've also got little bursts of resonance outside the usual, they're not in the usual places either. And the peak energy looks basically good. So although I don't think this ended up rating as a exceptionally high I'm going to have to just always do this afterwards because I never remember. This doesn't rate as L or LL, but it sounds OK. So normally I would expect it to bloom a little bit more on the sustained chords. And maybe that's something I should look for. For now, we'll skip over that one. Here we have another hall. This is a 300 seater. And we're going to keep going until we run out of stuff, which will probably, I thought I said I wasn't going to do that. Okay, so this does not count as anything special, but let's have a look at this as well, seeing as that's what we've been doing all day, so we're going to keep doing it. I may end up with time enough to set up the initial try at this uh, giant hall idea. I'm liking this cloud of uh, peak energy. This seems good. This doesn't count as special. but it's in the ballpark. This is where I'm looking to go. I would like to have this end up so that I have a hall uh, reverb. I feed this guitar into it, and I get just a cloud of peaks 
from the iron bar up here to down around here, filling up the entire space. Same with the slew, even if that means it'll count as bright. And same with this. And this is actually looking quite good. This is looking like there's low frequency energy continually coming through. It's filling it really widely over here. Cool, cool. This would be interesting if this ended up being, but these are all, this is a U, this is a unique. So this is going to be more like an empty room, but it'll be nice to see if it ends up being really good. Also, I seem to have lost chat. What's gone on with that? In just a moment, I will go and check. Okay, so this very much did not end up being loud. I don't even know why it registered there. It's because it was 11.01, .01, so I decided it could count as 10.99. Just about. That's kind of cheating, though. And there is chat. I'm sorry, I put the chat out of sight so I couldn't see it. Let me let me fix that. Uh, yep, I made the into the matrix for myself, so it's not something you can get. The music that was playing during the break is not available to listen to on a website as such. And all of this stuff is just things that I need to, you know, in my copious free time, get together and make happen. I've been doing this stuff for some time. Earlier on, you guys heard a cassette tape off of what I made for music when I was in college and getting stoned all the time. So it wasn't as good. I have gotten better at this kind of thing. So if I remember correctly, this was one that did not actually register as high power. I kind of cheated even get it to be in the red. But what it looks like in metering is also nothing too exceptional. Hmm. But this is a perhaps typical picture of what a, a big guitar hall might sound like. And it does have a nice decay tail. The decay tail doesn't seem to be too disrupted. Fine, fine. Here is 306B. B is back. That's an exaggerated version of Hall, and it is bright and it is loud. Let's see how much it is of each of these things. Nine and eleven. Okay, that counts as one L, not two. Sometimes when doing this stuff, what I do is I say, you know, red, yellow, and green to remind myself how I'm going to be marking them. So this is going to be 1L, not 2. And I'll say it out loud so I can remember what I'm doing. I'm liking the fact that these big peaks are not necessarily just a giant pile of red or green. It almost looks as if it balances fairly well. So it's not unthinkable. See, this is red, but this is a big peak and it's green. It's not unthinkable that this will end up being good. And our, our triple energy, that's our peak. We shall see. We shall see Netrunner channel. I mean, you can also search my regular channel for a bunch of... I have all these... Uh, those were a thing that I called daily music. That's the name of the CD that at one point it was. And the purpose of that one, for as long as I could do it, I took on too much and I had to stop. But the purpose of that one, back in the day, I had a bunch of stuff together like, you know, guitar DIs and bass DIs. I had an angle 530, which I was running into direct recordings. I had MIDI keyboard set up so that I could 
play in and I had a electronic drum kit and also a acoustic drum kit at the same time. And because I wanted to do this kind of stuff throughout days and frequently do it, I wasn't willing to do acoustic drums all the time. So what I was doing was making sample kits, a lot of which were downloadable and may still be on the Air Windows website. And what you're hearing is the electronic kit triggering Air Windows drum samples. So none of those drums are actually real. And one of the things that I did for some of the metalier things is I was here, let's see now. I was doing something kind of like this. So imagine this is the electronic drum pad. And I had a kick drum to set. So I'd be doing stuff and there could be a pad that would be the snare. But then I'd also have maybe like a floor tom pad. And I'd be able to do double kick sounding stuff, not with a double kick, because I never had double kick hooked up to an electronic kit pedal. But I'd be able to construct fake double kick stuff by using drumsticks to do some of the kick drum. And if you do that in two different you do that on a separate pad and then you have a fake double kick going on because my feet have never been good enough to do double kick for reels although i do have the kick drum pedals to do it but i've never been good enough to actually do that for reels so let's see where were we at Um, Jonathan, I don't know. That remains. Um, I don't think I ever actually did a track using the swappable Mega Dark Hat. Well spotted. That is something that I made a video about once. Um, I don't think I ever used that in anything or even sampled it. It was just one of those things that I tried to do. I still have that hat. It is not within the range of impos impossibility that that could show up somehow. Because that is, I still own that um, Wuhan, the, the swappable mega dark hat, I believe, is a regular hat on top of a Wuhan um, China. And so you set the China up, sort of upside down and put a hat on top of it. And that's how I did that. I think so, anyhow. If I'm not mistaken, that's what that was. Oh, we can't do that because we still have this showing up. So let's see. So this ended up being basically okay. I don't remember it being exceptional. And here we have this. And that says that we get to put one L on this, but not two. Okay. Good enough. Let's skip ahead to the next bit. And it also means we get to make it be orange red rather than just red. There is not going to be a daily music CD on my website. It doesn't exist anywhere. It was a, uh, uh, you know, I still have a CDR burner, like a multi-bin CDR burner. There was a time when I was trying to go quite serious with that stuff, and it never amounted to anything because don't get into the record business as a label. But I wanted to make that work. And... Oh, no, I, I'm sorry to hear about this, the kidney stone focus, photos. Let's keep this moving. Yeah, that was what I called daily music, and it was not a live streamed thing. But the challenge of it was to go and literally track entire pieces of song. And that's why you heard it change so many times, is I would only do about two or three minutes of any given thing. Part of the idea might have been, in a sense, to bounce around among different things, but all it ended up being was little snippets. It's not dissimilar to what Boards of Canada has always done. 
Sports of Canada always tends to make just little snippets of stuff. This does not get a special marking. And when we look at what it looks like, which we're not going to look at all of them, as we start getting longer and longer uh, decays on these, we're going to see less and less of the loud outputs. It produces loud outputs more easily when you have smaller rooms. Yeah, I hope you feel better for us. So here's another uh, beyond hall kind of thing. B means back, means beyond hall. It's emphasizing the late echo so hard that it's not paying attention to anything else. Probably why we've got this little artifact in here is it's just only worried about stretching it. Hmm. Yeah, there. I have every ability to do, like, let me show you something. I always go on about in my copious free time, but I got to show you this thing. I literally got a cassette machine. It's actually a little bit fancy. It has a bias control, which is not common for those. And I think that's a speed, no, it's a bias adjust. And it does Dolby and all kinds of stuff like that. I literally have a tape machine. So studying the tapes, that's not unthinkable. It's always a question. Always a question of when I can do that thing. Because today is not make recordings using the cassette deck. I mean, I've got a small stack of vinyl records that I've pur purchased fairly recently for the purpose of studying them, including in some cases stuff that's really important to my project, such as a new copy of Rolling Stone Sticky Fingers that hopefully is cleaner than mine. I need to study these things so that I can master getting my guitars, etc., to develop that degree of vibe. And I have not copied those records to my computer yet either. But today, not even so much about that. We're going to continue to study this. So let's immediately go here. And we see that this example Seems basically okay. It's a uh, B for back. And do we need to label it in a special way? No, not at all. So we skip right over that. Let's skip right over everything possible until we get to stuff that actually registers as special. Because I have a rough idea of what this stuff does now. Like, for instance, this one, I ain't going to bother even looking at it unless it registers a special. It does not, so we're going to skip right over. We're looking for those ones where they just come off as exceptionally loud. And it's probably going to be under the H category for hall. Probably not going to get B category for back, although we'll see. Oh, I stand corrected. Look at that. So this one goes to a maximum RMS power of minus 8.83. That is enough to count as market as special. And since I'm doing that, I'm also going to have a look at what it looks like on the meter. And this meter is also going to come out as well, but there is just as much for me to deal with in getting this to work. And I'm pretty happy with how that's shaping up. I like the width of the peak energy up there. And it's not very, but it could be worse as far as the decay tail is concerned. And I like the, see, even in the tail end of the decay, we have some slight departures from a straight line um, on the zero cross meter, and that's a good sign. 
the zero cross meter seems to be going to pleasing places. It only really locks into a, a restricted area when we have intense resonances here. And the intense resonances here are indeed quite intense. But the overall sort of cloud-like shape and the amount of whether it's favoring left or right seems basically good. Like I'm basically happy with how that's shaping up. We're mostly balanced. We're a little bit loud, but not too overwhelming. We have some substantial peak energy showing up from time to time. Again, decent cloud, decent zero crossing. Sounds like this. Yeah, so maybe not that thrilled with that one. There's a certain kind of honk to it, which I'm not the most thrilled by, but it certainly rates as being listed as one of our single L loud ones. And I'm probably looking for U, such as this one here, or H. I'm not sure if I have any more H. Do I have any? No, I've got some. Got some really big ones. A hall size of 470 or 600 or 700 counts. And these two here look promising, but we're not done there because we're still looking at this over here. Here is a U. Again, U and C translate to sounding kind of like empty rooms to my ear. And that's just my take on it but it seems to me what those are about. This does not register as special, and so I'm not going to worry about it further. We'll leave that alone and skip ahead. Again, not exceptionally loud in its peaks, and so we're going to skip that and keep chugging forwards because we could actually start coding if I get through this bit. I'm going to run out of ones that, oh, haven't run out yet. Look at that. Minus 8.85. That is unusually loud for one of these, especially at this size. B means back, means it's emphasizing the hall-like qualities of it, but are perhaps too much. I'm not sure whether that comes across as sounding better than H for hall. They're slightly different algorithms, although they both reinforce later echoes over earlier. So this is a 1L algorithm. And we're going to see how it shapes up. It's falling into the same basic category. There's enough reverberation in there that it's kind of blurring together. That's not necessarily wrong. That might be about right. We do have a dense burst of energy there. Because in a big hall, if we're mostly listening from the end of a big hall, I want it to be intensely loud sounding, but having it blend is also kind of useful because that's smoothing stuff out in a way that has its own uses. And we have a clean decay tail for a change. That seems nice. We have a clean decay tail. Our zero crossing looks basically OK. All in all, could be doing worse. That definitely look, especially with the intensity of these peaks here, it's like, yeah, that counts as 1L red and orange flagged. We're going to set this aside as a little bit special in its own right. And maybe I'll return to it and decide that I like it better than anything else. We'll see what it sounds like when you have that fullness is this.
See, it's filling in the space around it. So it's enveloping the space and it's not leaving any dynamics in there because it's just the reverb and only the reverb. As such, we label this one, which rated as high in that standard, to LB. And we can return to some of these for looking like things like uh, Abbey Road Studio A or whatever, where we're specifically trying to find a big empty sounding room and then dial it into the eventual purpose. Here is 365U. It's another finding uniques. And it's another 1L, but it's very off balance, this one. That's not necessarily bad, but it's a concern. When it's really off balance, the output it produces looks like this. So what I'm curious is, what's it going to look like when it throws that dynamic spike? It looks like it's off balance on the right. And you can kind of see that showing up. The rest of it is pretty evenly blended. And the peak energy, not that impressive. This distribution makes it look like it just sort of honks mostly. And uh, the zero cross will tell us that as well, like the extent to which it's only one horizontal line rather than a blur like here is the extent to which it's going to come off just kind of like unpleasant mid-range honking. So we get to call this a 1L um, unusually loud one, but I'm guessing... Not an exceptional tone. Yeah, there's a sort of high note in there. It was kind of hovering up in there. So we'll quickly pass by this guy after updating it appropriately. We're going to get fewer and fewer of these as we go on using larger and larger rooms, and so we got to label the ones that deserve labeling. Here's a 407. It's also B for back of hall. Never ever available? I will try. I'm doing my best. Often when I'm making those, it kind of feels like I'm explaining and showing how to use them anyhow, but I'm sure I can do better, and I'll I'll give it a shot. I'll see whether I can do better with that. Yes. Because that is, all, especially with console X, that's going to be a big deal because they have specific purposes around console X that are really going to be a departure from how we normally go about this. This does not get an extra registry. We'll skip right over that guy. That might register. Nope. They start getting larger and larger, and they stop. Reg Here's one with the hall, um, and they start register. They stop registering as unusually loud because they're too big to fill with sound. And when they're too big to fill with sound, what we end up seeing. is a plot kind of like this. We have an even was wash of audio, but the overall RMS volume is not going much beyond 18 dB down. It's just blurring this out a lot more. We're doing a lot more everywhere else. But we're not peaking out at exceptionally hot. And the sound of not being exceptionally hot is like this.
That's 451H, a hall that would fit 450 people. We're already starting to get large enough that, well, we got, let's wait and see. We've got a couple of these here. It's start, the halls are starting to get large enough that I'm passing the zone I'm looking for because I'm looking for a particular hall quality. That one doesn't have it. B for back of hall. And these I generated all in order to try to find these loud guitar halls that are able to do this thing. For instance, 9.85, 10.84. This is loud enough to count as an L. And when we have a look at it, we might just see something useful. It's possible that this ends up being the one that I use for Guitar Hall, because I'm looking for something that will work for specifically a Guitar Hall plugin that I can bring into a console X mix, have guitars and drums and things, and have them really register as, oh my god, that live performance must have been amazing. I'm liking the way that this is drifting back and forth between left and right. Look at this here. This is extreme emphasis on right, followed by an extreme emphasis on left. They're occupying about the same amount of space. So that seems nice. Yeah, hall, hall versus hall, yeah, yeah. And it's got a nice decay tail as well. That's not too full of nonsense. This could be a desirable one. I'll be wanting to refer this against some of the other possibilities. But let's, we're going to call it a single L. And it sounds like this. I do hear a sustaining note in there that doesn't really belong. It's a correct note, but it doesn't really belong. It's a little too much. It's like having an organ pipe re resonating in the background. So let's see, single L for that? Yes. Again, uh, 464B. B for beyond hall or back. Um, I feel like that's not the best algorithm. I feel like we can do better. 791. Okay, we're starting to get to where this is not going to be useful anymore. But let's try them anyway. We've only got this many left, and there is a few... We've got some extremely giant, like 1677B, 1839B. That's like stadium sized. We're going to see what that's like eventually. But we're at 791, which is already kind of huge. And that is U for unique, meaning it's going to come off like an empty room, but a giant sized empty room. And we do actually get to add L to it because one of its channels ended up peeking out good and loud, even at the size it is. What that looks like on the metering looks a little bit like this. See, this is the kind of thing where I might be able to make your Shine On You Crazy Diamond guitar tone out of a reverb element like this. If it's lively enough, has enough air and space, in its peaks, like over here, clean enough reverb tail and so on, and enough energy in the, the, the peak energy there, and smooth enough in the uh, zero crossing area, this could end up working as a Abbey Road Studio A, or I guess it would be Studio B, Studio A is even larger, um, plug-in. And then you'd put in like a guitar sound or whatever and be able to put that kind of scope and scale in there by setting it up 
and gain staging it using discontinuity to make the guitar and also the reverb around it sound as if it is very loud. It's almost worth not including discontinuity in the actual reverb, but discontinuity plays a role in the sustain of a reverb, so honestly I think I'm probably just going to. Anywho, where did we get with this? I'm going to have to go back and check the first bit again, but this looks nice in its own right. Yep. So 79U, 791U. Not exceptional in any other way, but it, that does still count as kind of bright because these are starting to get into everything is showing up as green. And green means the slew is not especially high, it's darker. So ones that don't have green in this area means that they are on the brighter side. Seventy nine one LU. Very good. Onwards. Here's an eight thirty six, which is unusually dark but also has elements of being very loud. How does that work? Not loud enough to register, but I'm curious what it looks like anyway. Again, as these spaces get larger and larger, the dynamic variations of the reverb field start evening out. They're going to kind of go away to where it's just a featureless blend, which is not always what you want, because it might be too much reverb for a driving guitar-oriented thing. All of this is heading into the space of like deep space exploration rather than this is a rock concert feel. I think we're already too large for this is a rock concert feel. Nothing wrong with exploring, though. So this did not count as special. And here's an 860. That does. That might end up being quite good, actually. See, the, the minus 9 means I can make it be special, I can make it be L. 10, 17, it's very close to LL, in fact. Let's see wh how that shakes out on the old meter. If it does anything really spectacular here, I might call it LL just to keep it on my uh, radar. That said, I don't think that's happening. I do like how it's being able to throw energy both on left and on right, although it's predominantly right. And I'm loving this DK tail. That looks clean as anything. And our, that's all high frequencies there. It's not going brighter as it goes, but that's all high frequencies there. Count says at least one. Let's hear what it sounds like. That seems good. There's <coughs> 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 something stuck in my throat.
I'm liking the way that works so much that I am going to give it a double L just on the basis of liking its overall performance. It also has a bunch of other sig signifiers like blue and purple, and those are also very strong. So let's go in and deck this out in full regalia. It has almost everything going for it. Only thing it's missing is green, and it can't have green and yellow at the same time. So there we go. We have got a giant room. Now we start looking at a couple of these and see whether those do anything similarly. That was a very high scoring one. That's a very spectacular one. And this is not, but it's nicely balanced. By contrast, if we look at this, it looks like this. You must excuse my coughing. I've got something sort of stuck in my throat. What's really happening with that is that when it is winter and it is very cold and I'm like making a fire all the time, the air gets incredibly dry. And there's another nice decay tail. Look at that. That's a nice smooth decay tail, that is. And uh, I start getting a post-nasal drip, and it goes into my lungs, and then I have to cough up bits. So that kind of rots, but we shall see. Anyways, this one's not as loud and sonorous. It is a fairly similar effect, though. Let's see whether this, which is also marked at about the same, how that one shapes up. That one that I had before then was really the most spectacular, though. OK, not unusual enough in any way. Yeah, this guy, 860LLU, that, that one was impressive. Although, oddly, it is not showing as a particularly... Oh, no, wait, maybe it is. It's not as incompressible as some of the others. But it was more compressible than anything I've seen yet, except for this one. Let's see now. So I just checked this. No real point in checking this. I could, K plate B. Let's let's go and we're not reusing the K plate B impulse for anything, but let's see how it shows up. Yeah, okay, that counts, it seems okay. And if we look at the effect, see K plate B is one of the ones that people really enjoyed the sound of when I set it up. And that is not to say that it's um, ideal for what it is. It's The room size is kind of too large for a plate, and that was the only way that I could get this sustained properly. And it's kind of throwing some artifacts. It's got that favoring of the right channel in this area. But on the whole, it ended up able to produce a nice reverb feel for a lot peop for a lot of people and that seems that seems good so we don't need to do anything further with it cuz it's already you already have that but we're just playing with it here's a wide area of stuff none of which was able to become very loud at all with one exception this 113f those are some massive peaks here. Let's see how this works. 1113, I should say. And we've got a minus 8 on a 1,000-seat hall. That's pretty impressive. So if we have a look at what that looks like, 
we might find a surprise and then we shall hear it. Most of it looks to be balanced. I don't see a wild variation in balance here. And the cloud appears to be a nice diffuse cloud. We just have this massive peak on the left channel. We've got more or less okay zero crossing distribution, especially in the sustain part where it's throwing some low frequency stuff in here. Mm. Mm. So this one's fault is it's one-sided. It's throwing a lot of left energy and I don't know what frequency it's doing that, but as soon as I listen to it, it will show me. Overall, it's a nice even field and we've very much lost all of the features of the guitar at this point. At this stage, we're not even really getting any information from the raw guitar track anymore. It's just filling up a space and the space is reverberating away. So we're trying to see how that acts and what it does. And it does seem to throw peaks when the guitar is playing stuff stridently. And we do seem to have, in the zero cross meter, it's mostly emphasizing the mid-range frequencies the guitar lives at, but it's throwing a few lower frequency things in here occasionally. So yeah, this is going to count as a single L, I think, if I remember correctly. Did I in fact, I think I checked and found out that it was in fact, yes, a single L. And this one's slightly off balance, and what this one sounds like is this. It's going to be an even larger sounding hall. Ah, except for I said hall, but this is 1113 F. This is a plate design. This has the reverb density up front rather than back. Yeah. Yeah, that's a plate-like behavior, that is. You have the sound, and then it's dying away very, very evenly. And very consistently. On drums, it sounds like this. So this would be me experimenting with stuff that acted like giant plate reverbs, 10 times the size they should be. Also, we have a unusually incompressible one here. So what we're going to do is take away this red and then have it be red orange and then put the L on there because we're flagging this as something of interest. It's not going to be, this is about the last red we've got. We're almost done. So this counts as a unusually effective giant plate, basically. And we've made a bunch of experiments in the giant plate realm, honestly, but this is one of them. And then we have very few, we've got two more that counted as loud. One of them is a hall style. Both of them are hall styles. So. We're going to check out 1677B and 1839B, and then we're going to be done with this part of the operation. And we'll pick out a guitar hall, and then we're going to try to code something like that, or at least begin to code something like that, starting from a previous example that's functional, and then we'll adapt it. So let's see.
Here's the first of two. And let's see how loud this is in analysis. This does not get any extra attention. It doesn't get to be labeled as L for extra, extra loud. But when we look at something this big and sustained in the meter, we're starting to see just featureless wash at this point. And I'll show you what it sounds like too. I don't expect that the other one is going to be any different. We're starting to look at um, like space ambient style reverbs, where it's just going to make a, a giant homogeneous space. And that might require different choices. Like if, if I'm going for a space ambient, I might very well start going through them and checking out what is more smooth here, like least changes, smoothest line on the end of this with no little artifacts or details. I could go through and scout for that. I can check it based on what has more um, incompressibility, what is producing a larger file size when uh, FLAC is applied to it. But for now, what we've got is a ginormous hall style effect on that same guitar that we've been hearing the entire time, and it sounds like this. Tail is a little bit artifacty, but here's your tail. All in all, I don't think we need to highlight anything about this. It's it is too large to work for my guitar hall. This is like a stadium. And then we have an even larger stadium. And maybe I'll, I'll poke around a little bit and see whether I've got any examples of what would be unusually smooth. Because when I did these, I did not have the metering. So every little thing that I have gets applied to every other little thing that I have, and that's how this goes. And hey, look at that. This one actually gets to count as L. Its maximum power is minus 9. That's above the highest previous rating that I had. So it gets to be orange and yellow. I mean, <gasps> orange and red. And I get to tack L on it. And that could have its own useful qualities. And we're going to see what it looks like. And then we'll see what it sounds like. Again, at a size like this, this is producing such a featureless wash of reverb that it's almost like there's no guitar in there at all. It's just a giant wash. And that can have uses in things like space ambient and whatever. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily suitable for what I'm doing here. In particular, I'll notice that this decay here has some irregularities in it, and I'll be looking for stuff that does not. I'm curious as to whether I can find anything that does not. If I can identify parts of, like if I can start looking through stuff where it has, say, blue and purple, meaning it has fullness and it has um, the ability to do the tone sweep without um, throwing any noise out too loud, I can look through those or maybe ones that are those things and green and look for what has unusually smooth decay tails and flag those, because we're kind of in looking at pictures mode today, which I'm comfortable with, by the way. I haven't been asked to do anything else. So yeah, this is, this is one of our louder ones. I don't see giant irregularities in the left-right balance. I only see that it is peeking out quite loudly here. So this counts as 1L, 
and the color coding is red and orange because it goes unusually loud. This cloud is probably about as good as we're going to get because it really won't depart much from that as it gets larger and larger. Same with this. This is probably about as good as we're going to get. For instance, as we go into this area, long sustain and then da 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 and then silence, the decay is going to be full of this chord. The longer the decay, the more the decay is going to be full of the chord that was played here. And so that's shown here. It becomes a line just because we have left nothing in the decay tail except for that one chord, which is sustaining and sustaining. And so it converges into a line that way. We do have a couple of little artifacts here, but they're not that regularly, they're kind of regularly spaced, but I'll be looking for even smoother than that later. So yeah, this one rates and let's hear what it sounds like. Cool, cool. Stuff like that, I can go in later and filter it if it's too abrasive, as long as it's doing the right other things I want it to do. And again, we're listening to all of this over a uh, Dell monitor's internal speakers because I've not got the mains working with this at the moment. They're, they're set up on the little bitty laptop. They're set up on this laptop. And this is part of my point about working with peak energy. When we're working with peak energy like this, and again, I will quickly draw you a picture. When we're working with peak energy like this in mid-rangey sounds, the pro what you end up producing, if you're able to optimize what this stuff is about, what you're producing will translate to small speakers buried in a monitor. It'll translate to a cell phone. It'll translate to all of those things because it's, it's completely dependent upon getting really exceptional peak energy happening and having it do what it's supposed to do. This is probably not optimal. I can probably do better than this, but it's good enough to mark as part of the stuff I'm keeping track of. Maybe we'll count back down from the largest numbers to search some of these other things. Because I will note that I've got a couple of things to keep an eye out for right away. So loud and back of hall. B means a hall only more so and it's focusing on later echoes rather than earlier. It's the opposite of a plate sound. So if I was to go through and look for all of the examples that I've got that are green, blue, purple, and grade them by how smooth that decay tail is, how free the decay tail is of artifacts, that could be interesting because these are not going to be loud. They're not going to have the sonority, but I may be able to come up with something where I can identify the ones that are unusually smooth for like sort of space ambient explorations and stuff. And as the halls get smaller and smaller, we'll see fewer and fewer of these You'll notice that all of these giant ones have purple as one of the colors, for the most part, occasionally not. And that's because the reverb is so large that it's hard for any frequency in the tone sweep to stand out. If the frequency in the tone sweep stands out, for instance, on this one, 945U, which 
is free of excessive slew and brightness, but does have a frequency standing out. That means that during the sweep, something stuck out more than it should. But almost all of these have that purple flag. As you start getting way earlier, we start never being able to get that purple flag because the room is so small that everything is constantly standing out. It's very difficult to get to a point in these very small rooms where the tone sweep is not making something honk. It is the case, for instance, in this one, K Chamber AR, which is really quite poor because it's early and I had not learned most of these things. But you have a sort of mini tiny reverb that barely shows up at all. And it doesn't really have much in the way of sonority. But if you check out the tone sweep, by contrast, the tone sweep goes louder than it should. And there's a sound that honks. Maybe even a couple of them. We'll see it a couple of times over. And this is supposed to be a completely even thing, but you'll notice on the end there's a lower mid-range frequency that jumps up in level. You see the dark band there. And that's not supposed to be happening. We can even find where it is. It's about 200 hertz, so that's the worst possible thing. Yeah, it's, it's one of those experimental plugins for special sound design cases, but it, this is early days as far as me experimenting with this stuff. And if they're able to play that tone sweep without honking, they get the purple. And if they are able to have um, fullness on the section where Alien Kittens is playing, maybe that's worth a check as well. Like here's a hall sound. And if I was to, rather than monitoring the guitar section, if I was to monitor this section and then also go to the display. No longer even checking with Analyze anymore. We're only looking with the meter. Oh, except for the very end of the guitar contains the decay that I'm going to want to include. So I'll need to include some of that to see what that decay does. But there's the tone sweeps decay. We can, we can check that out for how smooth that is. And then there's Alien Kittens and what it does. And we see that that is producing a fairly even effect. That said, the thing I was talking about is checking out this part here. We could maybe do this for each of these. If I do this, then we are seeing the result of the end of the guitar bit. We're no longer concerned as to whether it can become loud. Only thing we care about is having filled its buffers with the sustaining noise. Does this decay time, is it free, both of these things, are they free of artifacts? Artifacts being defined as, you know, point it to it, if I can move the one. Today, I was unable to shake the mouse in order to make the pointer become big, like this. That bit there, these lines in the decay as it becomes quieter, if I can avoid that in either of these things, I think that would indicate something useful. Because I did not have this metering back when I did this, the color coding and stuff. And I believe that will coincide with the uh, color coding of purple implying no big volume spikes from this sweep. And probably also, it'll be nice if that also counts as registering with the color blue, meaning that if you played Alien Kittens, it would fill the reverb up with bass rather than not being able to fill the reverb up with bass. And that's what the blue label is for. It means that you filled the reverb up with bass and the overall 
uh, LUFS was louder than a certain amount on specifically alien kittens. So if I identify each of those things, we have three colors to look for. They're not always going to show up. It's going to be green, blue, purple. And up here, you're barely ever going to see it at all. I shouldn't rule out other things, but here's an example. This is green, blue, purple. And if I'm correct, I can take like half of that and some of this and study what these refurb tails look like and whether they're perfectly even or not. And we'll throw, I don't know, S or something on there if we're able to get a lovely little decay time that doesn't have any funny artifacts in it. That's close to good, but it's not perfect. Because what I'm really kind of wondering is whether I can get ones with a serious lack of artifactage. And I don't know yet whether that's going to be the case. I, I see that this first one that I looked at also, interestingly, notice what it's doing with the reverb tail from each of these things. We did a reverb tail of the guitars, and it produced a, a decay, which seems pretty clean, although I'd like to find even cleaner. I have no real reference for whether I'm ever going to find one that is magically free of any artifacts. But that reverb tail is up here in the zero cross meter. With the tone sweep, it's a whole other story. You do the tone sweep. It's got some artifacts, but not all that many. Maybe what I should be looking for is whether the artifacts are less than half the amplitude or less than a third of the amplitude. Because that this one fails to do that. But this one kind of succeeds, kind of. And then after you do the tone sweep, our reverb field is just filled with low frequency zero cross data. This is a lovely low frequency cloud for a nice full sound in the post sweep. And that is something that sounds kind of like this. So maybe not all that spectacular, but we'll be seeing that again. And then scan through, looking for more of the same. Here's one at 267. I'm going to go bottom up for the real comparison, but I'm just glancing at some of these to get a sense of how smooth can I even expect. I don't think I'm ever going to get one that is like perfectly smooth and free of artifact but I'm really interested in how close it can come. Because we're just sort of topping this off by trying to find special details. See, see, we've got a couple of, this is equal to or greater than uh, the full height of it. The entire thing cuts out at a certain point. So that's, that's a uh, dynamic line that is covering half of the remaining range. This is sort of logarithmic, this. So uh, that I would count as non-smooth. And non-smooth sounds like this. It's not bad. It's not that bad. I just don't know if it's great. I'm not sure whether we have great on the menu. Let's scoot all the way over here. We're going to start seeing other ones. And let's investigate this again. And let's start working up from the bottom. We were not seeing anything that close to a perfect behavior. Nor am I sure that testing, looking at these particular ones, will give me that. But at least we can try. We should also figure out what to label it as if it turns out we do find one that's perfect. S for smooth, perhaps. And again, that's looking good. The way that that is decaying away, every single bit of that is greater than, you know, it's not taking up as much space as half the space. 
And the vertical swoop, again, it's not taking up as much as half this. It's not even taking up as much as a third of the space. Let's, let's cut it off at half the space so that if any of these things in the reverb tail winds up with a dynamic glitch, and it glitches out so hard that there is a black line going from this decay tail right down to the bottom or close enough that it's more than half the space remaining, we're going to count that as too much dynamic variation in the reverb tail, too much of a departure, and then that's going to count as not qualifying for the special, we'll call it S for smooth and S for special. And there will not be a uh, color associated with it unless maybe, I wonder how this rates as far as reverb and compressibility. We can use gray. That could be a thing. And we can check the one, well, I'm not sure if it's worth checking the ones that don't also have blue. Let's assume that we want to have base fullness in this. And we will add gray. And this will be S for smooth. Let's do a quick check of one without the reverb tail just to see what it's looking like. I don't think I'm going to count these. There's too many of them. But We'll see what it looks like on the meter. Also, I'm probably due for throwing another log on the fire. And it's not performing exceptionally. There's an artifact. It's close to half. That one is more artifact free, but it looks kind of crunchy. I'm looking for a decay tail that looks like a really smooth line like a really smooth line. If you were to, I wonder whether I've got this. Hang on. Plunk this down here. Brocasti trimmed. Let's get one of our really big churches. One of these was the bit that I used. I just don't have it. Could it be that? It's going into very low frequencies too. See, I don't have exactly the same comparison that I have for the other stuff, but I do have some stuff. Let's say this is one, and it's going down to a subsonic frequency. Let's see what that looks like and whether this is really, really free of artifact on our measurement. Well, volume wise, I got nothing. Slew wise, I got mostly nothing. Okay, that's not actually going to be as useful as I'd hoped. Although I do have, I have guitar, and that guitar includes the same section. Let's check this out. It's not going to be the same levels, but I want to see how smooth that is dynamically compared to my stuff. Da -da 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 and not absolutely perfect. It's in line with some of the stuff I'm trying to do, but some of those little spots in there, I'm basically trying to find out whether the Bricosti is able to do this absolutely perfectly, and I'm kind of barking up a tree with trying to make it better. But no, that's not that different from what I was doing. 
Let's have a look at Mechanics Hall. And you know what? I'm not going to save this, but let's make it louder. Not that much louder, but just that much louder. Just so that I can see it a little easier. It's about the level. And then when that one, it's, it's playing away, that's what the Bricosti looks like doing its deep reverb thing on my same guitar sample. And then when it cuts off, which is gonna happen in a moment, we'll see how smooth that decay tail is and, oh hey, guess what? This is not as dynamically smooth as I'm actually looking for with mine. Interesting. And if you listen to it, it sounds like a Bricosti. It sounds fine. Like, you're not going to say, oh, that doesn't sound good. I found a flaw. But all the same, these are not outperforming what I have here. So I'm game to continue looking for stuff that's exceptional. Such as seeing whether something like this has a decay tail of smoothness that is very much lacking in any little dynamic artifacts here. It should fade away with ultimate perfect smoothness. And I'm not getting that ultimate perfect smoothness, but neither is Bricosti under the same measurements. Bricosti is showing up with slight dynamic irregularities too. So we are on with further experimentation. And let's see, this is a, oh no, here, 1303. I suppose I can have a look at 1333 because this is one of our, there's a gray on there. Might as well have a look and see whether it's doing anything useful, but if it, if it isn't, then we'll skip over it. Lacking, um, it was lacking something. I forget exactly what. Um, K plate, the, each of the K plates is different but I'm glad that you feel that they have great tails. That's okay, but I wouldn't call it exceptional. That's basically on the acceptable line. Oh, cool. I'll show you. Let's, let's have a look and see how well that compares to what we're doing now. Because these things count as pretty good but I'm looking for a perfectly smooth line here, and I'm not necessarily going to get one. But we've got K plate C right up here. So let's see how good that is compared to what we're looking at. It may very well be unusually uh, Good example. We'll see. Yeah. Especially as it starts to get quiet, that is looking... We have a couple of little exceptions, but see where it is loud here and then falls away to quite a lot quieter? The thickness of this line is almost perfect. I'm looking for something that acts like this, but without the additional block in here. The rest of these are scrubby, but this would indeed be what I would call an excellent tail, just up to this point, and then it kind of stops. Or at least varies. It throws a variation in there. Let me throw another log in my fire. I am, of course, still very interested in all of that. Because we're having a bit of a cold snap here in Vermont. It's nothing too exceptional. It's not really full winter but it's enough of a cold snap that I'm going to keep the, the firewood going. Also, I need to keep an eye out for what time it is so that I can get my tacos ready. I don't think it's quite that time yet, but we're going to get there. Some 
quite interested in coming up with an excellent uh, space ambient with ultimately smooth tails. And I'm starting to get the tools I will need to actually do that through using this meter appropriately. In particular, I'm quite pleased, uh, Blue Baggins, that you showed up and said, oh yeah, C gives good tails. And I went and I looked it up on the meter and you're right. You're right. This is, this point to this point, this is a unusually, especially good reverb tail. From, from loud to really a bunch of dB down, this is a very, very smooth decay. And uh, that pleases me, makes me happy. Now I'm looking for something that acts like that over a much larger reverb space. And I'll be looking at whatever I need to in order to find what's causing it. Although I'll notice that's not, it doesn't have any of the colors I'm looking for at the moment. I'm looking at all the ones that are like green, blue, purple. Yeah, well that would be a very interesting observation. See, if I'm able to identify stuff that works that well with the tails, and I might go through and check all of the L's as well and see if any of them perform well that way. If I'm able to identify that, seeing as you're all like, oh yeah, best tails ever, and I've just identified something on the metering that kind of loudly says, why yes, that is the best tail ever. If I can identify stuff in some of these other ones and highlight it, for instance, I have not looked at LB here. Let's do a quick little look at that and see what that has to say for us. How's this tail shape up with some of the other ones? Not nearly as well. You can see these little vertical lines. Those are like little spikes. This is a bumpy tail. It's got lumps in it. What I'm going to be looking for is stuff that performs as well as K plate C, specifically about the tails in these particular locations. If I can find that, see, see how bumpy this is? Whereas K plate C, over the same range, smooth as butter, silky smooth little line. This one, kind of trying to be, but then there's these spikes. We're going to try to ignore, or we're going to try to not have those spikes, and we will do whatever we must in order to get there. So that kind of counted as good. Um, I guess I can peek at some of these other ones. For instance, here's one that is loud but doesn't have any other qualities going on. And we can do a quick peek at that. I can already tell that's not all that smooth, although it's kind of smooth. But remember how K plate C did this stage of the decay without any features at all. It was just completely smooth as butter, and this is not. This has a bunch of spikes and a bunch of artifacts. What I'm looking for is a decay that is as smooth as this attack, which is the, the slew as it begins to drop. This curve going up is what I'm going to want to see going down, and I do not have that here or on the guitar. So... Uh, 16, I had no reason to expect that was going to be special, but this one does not count as uh, exceptional. Let's keep looking at um, these. Because the characteristics I want to go along with that are not bright. That ain't bad. That is absolutely not bad. 
In particular, the end of the tail in both places has no little bar sticking out into it, so this is definitely not bad. It could be smoother. K plate C is smoother, but I'll tell you also something else is the longer it's stretched out, the more opportunity it has for weird little departures. And they're kind of restricted. They're not too overwhelming. I think this does count as smooth. We're going to count this as smooth. Sounds like this. That's smooth. And then here's a swoop. Beautiful. Yep, this is a plate style. And uh, looks beautiful to me. This gets extra bonus points as being unusually smooth. We've also got one just under it, which does not have richness, but has a gray mark. And that, I believe... Well, no, that can't count as... I'm thinking in terms of what counts as being unusually incompressible, but this really doesn't. I don't know why that gray is there. We can have a look at it, I suppose. However, I'm going to try to go the other direction. At 2.31 in the afternoon. Oh, hello. That looks nice. Remember what the, the K plate C looked like? In this one, the fall off after that guitar, going from here pretty much on down, this area where it is the most loudest is also the smoothest. There's an artifact here. But uh, honestly, I feel as if this could qualify for another highly rated one. And it sounds like this. Yeah, that too. This one too. This counts as real smooth too. It's a little less bassy. But on the whole, looking good. Let's just scooch my chat up to where I can see it more easily. Okay, onwards and upwards. We're going in this direction. Don't have as many of the enormously titanic ones, but I'm liking this day of analysis. We've got a bunch of green-purple. Let's have a peek at this, although we're looking for blue in there. I want it to have base fullness as well as smoothness. This one will not have base fullness as well as smoothness, but I want to check it out. Yeah, it's fine, but I see that little artifact there. This should be able to take the guitar, although it's doing much better on the side sweep. Showing a little spikiness, but it's doing a very good job of not creating a... Although, there's that little sweep there, and that is crossing more than half of the remaining space between that and silence. I'm going to count that as an artifact. It's like a little dropout. Want to avoid that stuff. So... I just randomly auditioned that one, but I'm not going to deal with it. We've got a bunch of ones that count as semi-loud. I wonder how that's going to register. Let's see how smoothly this one decays. Really? 
reasonably, but I'm not going to call that exceptional. Like K plate C did not have like a little spike in here. And this is even worse. Like we're just going to throw this out because see the, the dynamic spikes in here. What I'm shooting for is something where the tail of this does not vary in gain at all. It does not, especially up here where it's loudest. It needs to fall off real smoothly and then not have any giant, like this, this vertical line is being drawn because in that instant, the dynamic level dropped down to here and then right back up again. And that's like a dropout. That's like a sputtering. So yeah, this one, no bueno, not, not using it. Let's move upwards until we're starting to get the ones that are actually the colors I want. For instance, 813 and 812 and 793 are all uh, big room sounds. They have blue, so they have base weight. We know that we can count on that. And let's see how smoothly they decay. Ooh, hello. That's pretty. That's less pretty, but that's pretty. Weirdly, it's shaping up slightly differently as I cycle it. It's not always being drawn the same, even though it is literally the same audio, because it's being drawn in a different part of the screen. So it's probably worth me playing it through multiple times. Just kind of averaging it out. See this last one? That's what I'm talking about. The way that it starts up here and then fades off and it looks like it's a single line. It's a little bit scratchy. I would like even less scratchy than that. But on the whole, for the most part, this is a very good roll off. There's very little in the in the way of weird artifacts popping up all over the place. And in particular, the fade down to here, that's nice and smooth. It's getting smoother as it goes. We got tiny little artifacts popping up now and then, and that's just different. It's like feeding through the buffers differently or something. Yeah. My back is tensing up a bit, but I'm focusing very hard. So it stands to reason that I'm physically uh, getting a slightly challenged. This we like. I like that. We're going to count that as special. I'm not sure how many of these other ones are also going to count as special, but that's going to count as special or smooth. And we'll just see as we go how many of these register in that way. Oh, I should just crop it in a little bit closer is what I should do. Then I'll see more of them on the screen. Uh, no, I have not. I have not. Assuming that is a question of, have you read up on that? No, I have not. That's looking even prettier from the first uh, glimpse of it. Mind you, I don't know if it's going to be the same each time. What I'm looking for is spaces in the decay. And honestly, that sign sweep is about the worst possible case for it. But I'm looking for this little fall away to reveal giant changes in dynamics as it decays. And this is another example of it's not really doing that, is it? We have very little alteration. And it seems to be happening in about the same places each time, which may or may not be a good sign. Got two little marks there. And then up here, more or less the same deal. 
And up there, we've got uh, two little marks, and it's being replaced with maybe not even as much of one. Uh, this is also going to count as a smooth decay tail. Sounds like this. I approve. That's going to work. Oh, by the way, on drums, this kind of sound. Maybe some of my uh, final testing of it or listening to it will be actually on drums. It's a kind of glimpse into what it's actually doing. But this sucker also gets to count as unusually smooth, SU. And we've got another one at 793. I wonder how many of these are going to register this way. We'll find out. I'll get through them, then I'll stand up and stretch or something so that I can feel a little better. It looks good, too. This looks good, too. And then we can start actually coding some of these things. I like the decay of that. This is looking even better. Remember how K-plate C had a lovely smooth line from there to there? This is a lovely smooth line from here to here. That's gorgeous. It's not always exactly the same, but it has the capacity when measured right to be this gorgeous. So that's this is also going to count as exceptional. Unless we have a big departure. No, again, pretty gorgeous. Lovely smooth line from there to there. Sounds like this. And the sweep sounds like this. I'm liking how these things work, even on terrible, terrible speakers, because these are terrible, terrible speakers. And we have another acceptable option. And we're going to mark it as that. And then we'll choose among them in some other way. Pretty much all we're doing is finding out that a bunch of these actually are awesome and we like them. And they are all U, which was generated. There's a particular quality that the U ones were generated by. They were trying very hard to not have any unusual reinforcements of sound. And so that probably corresponds to what this is about may end up meaning that the ones with the the U algorithm just perform better this way. That said, that looks like this one is not performing as well as the others. That, on the other hand, is fairly smooth. Let's see how it looks as it goes. No. Bunch of big shifts here. bunch of big dynamic shifts here. You can see white in between these as it sort of ducks in and then pops back up again. Not a good sign. There's also a big jump there. It's just not the smooth curve I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, from the peak downwards, this is just not performing to the level of the others. Let's let it do one more. Oh boy. Yeah, see that? That means there was a sudden cut between line horizontal lines from here to here and back again. And that is not an acceptable volume dropout in the reverb tail. That said, the Bricosti was doing that as well, but I want better. So we're going to 
uh, discard this one. It's going to count as not good enough, and we're going to keep going. See whether any of these smaller ones, the smaller reverbs, can also do the same thing. Because as much fun as it is to have giant, giant, enormous ultra reverbs, it would be nice to have an ultra smooth, uh, smaller style for that K plate uh, C vibe or better. We'll see whether we can beat K plate C in reverb tail smoothness and what we must do to do that. This has a little gap leading up to it, but then that fall off looks good. It looks pretty good with the sweep too. Still looking pretty good. None of those vertical lines are really taking it over in either of the examples. We always seem to have that one dropout. It's okay. And how are we doing? It's still about the same. Yeah. Most of the time, that is close to as smooth as K plate C, but it's over a larger range. It's got a little flickery thing going on, but it's dropping down to below the level of silence with very little uh, fuss. And it's a nice smooth curve. There's the occasional little bump, like there's a little bump there that doesn't need to be there. All right, so what's the difference between mono bass on stereo effects and the side pass plugin? Mm. Not much. They might be implemented a little differently. If it's really important to check, I can go and look it up for you. For now, we're going to rate this as another unusually smooth. We're going to add that. And we're going to add this and move on to try to find others. I don't think this is going to be one of them. Yeah, it sounds to me as if that's basically the same thing. Oh, well, we can, we can investigate this in honor of the stoned music making that I was doing in college. We're going to do 420 and we're going to see whether it's any good. Maybe it's not. The getting stoned in college ended up not being good, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. It was a time for things like that, I suppose. And I'm going to say that's not exceptionally smooth. Yeah. Yeah, this is not good enough to count as anything that special. Onwards. Looking for that uh, green, blue, purple combination or varieties thereof. I think there are other ones like that. I just don't remember exactly what. Here is 325F. This is a plate style. This doesn't have the fullness, but it might have smoothness, so we're going to find out. Kind of does. Or not. See, those are artifacts I don't want there. So we'll skip right over this one. The guitars have a pretty smooth fallback, though. But the sweep, pretty much nope. Nope, that looks messy. I would like it to be a smooth little curve without these vertical lines in here. But we're getting the vertical lines in there. So... Never mind you. Our, we do have a good collection of giant ones. Oh, here's another. 
314U has all the colors we're looking for. Let's see whether it's special as far as smoothness is concerned. I also don't remember if I've been checking the unusually loud ones for special smoothness or not. I can go back afterwards and sort of double check them. That's okay, but I see a little line that's in the way. And I see a big departure from linearity there. Yeah, yeah, that's too much. See where we've got this line curving down, but then we have this little vertical spike, which is a dynamic fluctuation that's dropping it to like half of what it previously was and then back again over a time period this wide which is the width of this single line. That is already uh, too much for this measurement. Yeah, and I don't think I've been checking with the loud ones, but I will go back once I've finished with this part. Here's a 292. Yeah, I'm going to intentionally skip the loud ones and just go from there. See whether we've got anything that just stacks up as performing super well in every way that I can think of to check it. That's not going to be one. See the uh, the vertical line? We can roll this one right out. It's going to be a sputtery reverb tail. See? So we got these little spikes in here. That's what I'm going to be trying to avoid. So let's charge ahead, shall we? And again, that is not one where it had a purple color added to it. So maybe that's a good point. We'll only check the ones where it did what we wanted. And we're not going to check some of the ones that are not green, blue, purple. Purple is probably the color that's helping us get smoother reverb tails. Uh, it looks somewhat problematic, but we'll see how well it shapes. If it's able to produce any that are really beautiful and without any of those little artifacts, then maybe I'll let it... No. No. It is constantly throwing in dropouts just by virtue of how the algorithm works. When it's doing stuff like this, I know I don't want it for this particular measurement. That's fine. I'm satisfied. We're going through and checking all of these ones. And just looking for what is this combination. Green, blue, purple. In hopes they will produce smoothness, warmth, fullness, all of these things as a silky smooth buttery reverb that could be used for space ambient or who knows what. And it does not look like that's going to be one of the ones, but we'll find out. That may, if it doesn't throw any more surprises, I might mark that one as acceptable simply because it's got very small departures and the overall curve looks smooth. Looks like on the macro level, it's a smoother curve. Weirdly, bits elsewhere in the screen are animating. I'm not sure what that's about. Yeah, none of these departures are reaching up to halfway. And the shape of this curve looks smooth. And the sign sweep is consistently also not providing anything too aggressive there. The shape of this curve looks smooth enough that I'm willing to count this among the ones that are smooth. Sounds like this. Well, 
We'll count that as one of them. I think that's fair to count as one of them. A smooth hall, a smooth metal hall. Yeah, we will see. I mean, I think I may have generated a AUV3 plugin, but I don't really have any way of knowing whether that's true. Uh, we shall see. Let me keep scampering through this stuff while I'm at it. I know I'm looking for this one combination of, uh, see here we have a 192B, and that's also green, blue, purple. So we can check and see if it is special in that way. Hello. Look at that. Holy crud. Is it going to do this? No, it doesn't really going to do the same thing with the sign sweep, but that's incredible on the guitar. Can it do it? No, it can't do it consistently, can it? Oh my. All right, what am I going to do about this? This is 192B. It's a sort of deep field reverb. And sometimes it is producing a fall off, especially on the guitar of like magical smoothness, but then there's there can also be weird departures from that. Maybe I'm going to need to just listen to it and see what that sounds like, because look at this. Look at how smooth that fall off is. And yet sometimes we have these weird disruptions, these weird departures. Here's more guitars. And yeah, see, it, it can go perfectly smoothly, and then it can also go and throw in complete dropouts, where it just disappears completely. What am I going to do with this? Look, we did the thing again, where that is as smooth as K plate C. It's like a, a line, an anti-aliased line. There's no distinction between that at all. Do we consider that its ability to draw this line almost all of the time this cleanly and perfectly counts as um, got accounted as special, got accounted as exceptionally smooth? Or do we consider its abilities to do weird departures here and there as a account against it? See, it'll either go perfectly, perfectly smooth, or it'll throw in these weird little dropouts. But outside the dropouts, it's still got that lovely line. And then in the sign sweep, it's it's looking a little weird sometimes. But this is what it's doing with our loud guitar high frequency stuff. In a situation where it is very, it's it's got a darkness to it. It's one of those ones that is rated as green. What it's doing with the um, zero cross is also rather interesting because the zero cross is drawing a thick line here. It's drawing a line where rather than having the output of that guitar chord being a intensely resonant noise, it's like this blurry thick line that is not really favoring anything. It's going a little bit brighter, but not much. If it was a single tone, it would be a, a, a horizontal line on the zero cross meter. There's no other way it could go. So this is this is wild. I feel like the shape of this curve is enough to count this as one of my exceptional performance. Heck with this, let's listen to the sucker. That's pretty airy. That's a pretty good little space around things, isn't it?
I'm not sure it's perfect, but it ain't bad. What's it going to do on these little guitar notes? Hmm. There's a drum hit. Let's quickly normalize this so we hear it loud. You know what, I think this, we can count this as special. Let's undo all of the stuff so that it's back to normal. And who knows, it might find a use. We'll get to call this special in its way. We might not have that many of these, so this does count as extra smooth. I'm not sure how many more of these we're even going to encounter. I don't see a lot. We're going to go through and check all the ones that were rated as a special loud. But I'm not sure we're going to see any more of the green, blue, purple. That might have been the only one. And as such, good for it, I guess. See, there it is. 192 special back of hall kind of sound. So what else have we got up here? Nothing much. None of this is actually going to register as acceptable. These are all too small. We're, we're getting right down to the zone where they are too small to perform in this way. So let's start spot checking some of these other ones. Like here's one where it's loud but also dark. And if we check this, it may or may not produce weird artifacts. No, those are artifacts. The fall off is reasonably smooth, yes, but those are artifacts. It's a kind of a bumpy decay. We got little specks in here, which I don't want to be there. So we can check ones that have purple to them. Have not gone through and checked the uh, loudness ones yet, but I'm going to. How about bright and full and purple? How about this? What's this have to offer in terms of reverb tail smoothness? I'm not going to say that's exceptional. That doesn't look terrible right away. That's less than exceptional. Again, looking at these decay curves, I'm looking at a very, very, very smooth fall off, especially where it is loudest. Kind of like Cape Plate C, where it was able to execute a very smooth fall off for most of the bulk of it. Like it would need to look like this, but smoother. And I don't see this doing it. In particular, something like this looks just choppy. I do not want choppy. And there, see those black marks count as choppy to my ear. So we're going to skip this one because this is clearly not smooth enough. We're going to check the loudness once later. So here's a red, blue, purple. I'm assuming purple is going to help with the smoothness, but that's not necessarily true. So the nice thing about this is this legitimately is showing me whether the decay tail is falling off smoothly because this is a volume meter. So RMS level, if the RMS level fluctuates wildly, it's going to sound like the volume is sputtering. And here we have an interesting example right here. That is about as smooth as K-plate C. That is an artifact. 
how often are we going to hit stuff like this where it seems to drop out completely? Does it matter if it's throwing a artifact covering the entire range? What happens if we do this? It has the capacity of falling off literally with no artifact and looking as if I drew that in a drawing program. Is it better if it is perfectly smooth except for occasionally it throws a dropout that goes from the curve right down to silence and then back again? Because what's over here is exceptional. Let's listen to it. And what do the drums sound like? Guitars again. We're getting to such small spaces that I'm not sure how much it matters. Like it kind of matters. I feel like this could be a thing where the smallness of the space contributes to how much getting the smooth decay matters. The really big ones I feel matter a lot more. I don't know if I can count this as clean enough to use it. <coughs> it's also on the bright side, and that probably contributes to the concern. Let's see what else we've got in here. Where do we see our last purple? On this one, which is LH, meaning this is one of our ones where it is unusually loud. Let's now start going from the opposite direction and see whether the ones that we've already rated as loud can also be rated as smooth. Once we've done that, I promise I'll start coding something. That's not shabby. It's not great, but I don't think it's bad. In particular, the loudness parts of it. We do appear to have a good fall off. with some exceptions. Those are exceptions. But this is this volume range is where Cape Plate C was performing well. We seem to consistently be hitting a thing here where this part of the fall off seems basically good and then this part falls apart. Similarly with this, I like the shape of this line but it's a little sketchy, it's a little scribbly. That said, as a rule, it's not producing a dropout that is past halfway, except for the ones that go all the way to the, eh. And see, look at that, that is a lovely smooth line. It's a little bit sketchy, but it's more or less a lovely smooth line. Oh, this is difficult. See, something like this, that fall off looks really good. But it's still throwing in some departures from it. But then this is, what did it sound like, though?
Mm. I'm not sure this gets to count as that great. We've got another one right next to it. Let's see how this one goes. Maybe we need to hold these to a higher standard because if they start getting all of the good qualities at once, that just becomes unreasonable. Again, that's looking pretty good so far. That, not so much. And there we're starting to see uh, definite dropouts. And I don't like the smoothness of that line. That goes from quite loud to quite quiet and then bumps up a little bit. No, this does not get extra credit for that. It's already got credit for being loud and sonorous. It doesn't need all the credit in the world. Here's another. 159. Oh, here's one where it went super loud at that point. Let's see what this does. We are viewing this in so many different angles and so many different perspectives, and it'll be very interesting to see what all that produces high. Look at you. Can it persist? Look at how smooth that is. It's even drawing the stereo with perfect smoothness. That's crazy. That's, that's not smooth, though. Oh, but hello again. This is looking like our guitar riff is consistently having a decay of magical smoothness. That's kind of extraordinary. Look, I mean, it has not failed once. Every single time we hit this bit, and it falls off with our loud guitar noise. The loud guitar noise dies away without the hint of an artifact. Okay, now this, this does definitely count. This gets all of the cred. And that magical smoothness sounds like this. Falls away real cleanly. Here is a snare drum on the same thing. Cool beans. This qualifies as both good things. That's amazing. That is quite pleasing. I don't even know what I'm using it for yet, but boy, I'm going to be using it for something. Smooth and loud and a hall effect. That's going to be a really good room for something. We're, we're totally using that. Here's another loud. Let's see how this one performs. That's cool. Who knew we'd be able to compare these in so many different ways and learn useful things from them? OK, this one doesn't behave quite as well as the previous one, does it? Let's see how it acts as we continue to watch it, because that's a dropout. And these are irregularities that weren't present in the previous one. Here's the same dropout in pretty much the same places. This is a very sketchy line here. Same dropout, same irregularities. Yeah. I mean, it's nice enough, but this is not as good as the previous one. We'll skip right over that. It's already got part of its good credit, so we don't need to give it all of the credit. Here's another allowed. Yeah, the trick here is that I'm trying to find algorithms that do all these things naturally. This might not count as one. Let's see how it performs going forward. Our guitar 
is fairly okay as far as smoothness is concerned. It's not perfect, but then the tone sweep has some really weird artifacts in there to the point where I might consider that a disqualification. Like the tone sweep is always throwing weird volume jumps in. The guitar is pretty good. The tone sweep is pretty rough. The guitar is pretty consistently not giving a problem, but the tone sweep always, always, always is. Lots of problems. I guess it's time to hear what those things sound like in actual practice. So tone sweep and guitar, first the guitar. Tone sweep. Yeah, there's too much fluctuation going on in here. Like this guitar, I hear something in the tail. Cool and all. Cool and all, but I'm not sure if we're going with it. So we're going through all the loud performers. This is a plate. Let's see if we have any unusually smooth plates that also have a, a lot of sonority. It's when they do really well, it, it's obvious. That's doing really well with one obvious dropout. The line as it decays is really good except for that one point. And the tone sweep is not shabby compared to the last one at least. Oh, that tone sweep, that's more shabby. I'm not nearly as happy with that one. And although the initial part of the decay on the guitar seems good, I don't know if I can rate that as being ultra smooth, not compared to some of the others. See, we keep getting these little dropouts and things. The fact that it can do the initial part of the decay well is a point in its credit, but some of them are magically good at doing everything. Everything. And these, this one always has that dropout in here. This part looks great. The overall curve looks like a good curve rather than some weird monstrosity, but it keeps throwing those artifacts in there. So we're going to skip on this one, and it sounded like this. I guess you could say that's okay, but it's nothing that spectacular. Here's another one to compare. See, now that's more what I'm talking about. Look at that. Looks like you could have made it in a uh, uh, art program. Go put a gradient here and draw a curve here with Bezier curves. And that's looking a lot more like what I'm wishing to see. Of course, our decay times are getting longer and that's helping. But yeah, see, this is made a win. This is a exponential looking curve. It looks like the right kind of decay. And on the whole, we have a marvelously smooth, there are little bitty fluctuations, but they are tiny. And on the whole, our decay right down to the smallest amounts, even the smallest amounts aren't complete in total dropouts. So this does count. And this sounds like this. Decay fades off pretty nicely, and our tone sweep the 
the low frequency part. Whoops. That's what I call a pretty good, smooth decay time on a tone sweep. I mean, that's like a kick drum right there. Okay, we got another. I'm not sure if we're using this yet or what's going on with it, but this absolutely qualifies as another sort of double winner. SLH. Fair enough. We're going to keep scanning through these. Oh, and we're starting to get to our double L's, meaning the ones that were loud in both channels at once. Let's see if any of these have smoothness to them. It's pretty much OK if they don't, but uh, I'm happy to discover. It's fun to find out. Beautiful. Look at that. Look at that. Some of this is all falling into place. Some of these things just perform better than the others. Let's see if it has weird dropouts. Any other? No. For heaven's sake, look at that. Even the tone sweep is a pretty good exponential curve. And the guitar is stubbornly refusing to throw any artifacts at all. Beautiful. This, this is nice. Look at that. So yeah, our double volume L at the 216 space chamber. This is a really good chamber. This is a beautiful decay curve. It's very natural. It's very believable. There's no artifacts in the guitar section at all. Sounds like this. And then the tone sweep. So that is a sort of natural acoustic quality to my ear. And then our guitar section. And lastly, a drum. would say that's behaving quite well. So we got another, I got a triple winner here. This is quite spectacular, although funnily enough, it is not registering as anything else other than it's the super loudest one and it also has the smoothest decay. Amazing. SLLC, we got a killer chamber. That's going to be a killer chamber. Here's another chamber. Let's see if this is also killer. Hey, Focomas. This is proving to be a good day as far as researchers are concerned, I'll tell you. Finding newer and newer ways to explore all of these and figure out what works. See, this is not as cool of a chamber as the previous one. Look at what that did. It's got a good fall away, but we've got a sort of spiky effect going on. And we've got dropouts, multiple dropouts. Now, this is not going to necessarily make it objectionable, as in it's not necessarily going to sound terrible just because of that. But here's our loudest sound, and then we have these funny dropouts in here. So the reverb tail is not going to be as smooth and pure as it could otherwise be. Weirdly, in this one, the tone sweep is performing better than the guitar. 
Hey, you're quite welcome for AD clip. Tone sleep is kind of behaving better than the guitar is. So what happens with the guitar tail is we have the loudest burst and then it instantly ducks for a second and comes back at slightly louder than the perfect fall off from here. And then we've got some little irregularities and little dropouts later in the tail. And what that sounds like, since we're not going to count this one as special, is this. It's like a little irregularity. I mean, this is not, it's not bad. It's not as smooth as it could be. Let's look for more L's. There's there's multiple L's too. There's like uh, the double L here at 230. I believe we're already using this for 140, uh, plate 140. We shall investigate. We'll see whether it's special in every way at once or whether it's just special in certain ways. I'm going to say special in certain ways. I already see irregularities to that reverb tail. The overall shape of it is okay, but it's got some dropouts. We don't get to count this as special in every way at once. It may very well end up being fine. It might just be fine, but this would be like our loudness room rather than our buttery smooth reverb tail room. The shapes of the falloffs look good, but the small irregularities in them stop it from being perfect in the like artificial reverb magic. I wonder if I have galactic in this reference zone. We'll skip over that. So it was 230. Do I have Galactic in here somewhere? It would be way over here, I think. I think, or would it? Do I even have Galactic as a reference? I don't think I do. This is all about, this is all about five by fives. Galactic is a four by four. So let's see, here's where we left off. Looking for more L. L meaning the ones that came off is really loud. Here's one. There's another LL too, so we can check that. Ideally, checking this in these various different ways and finding ones that just perform in every imaginable way. Well, I don't know. Seems not impossible, it just depends. I'm not sure if I'm up for having 5x5s be galactic. Galactic seems like it's a 4x4 reverb matrix thing. This is kind of okay, but on the sign sweep, it's doing a really striking burst of left energy, and then a really striking dip, and then a burst of right energy. It's doing this crazy stereo thing. And while the decay of the um, the guitar is not super unreasonable, that's also not as smooth as it could be. So this one really blows it on the tone sweep. And the guitar is not exceptionally good. Like you can see the frizz on that. It looks like somebody drew it with a rough pencil. It's, it's simply not a smooth line. And so this one that did not make it sounds like this. And then the tone, the tone sweep would be jumping from side to side more than it should. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the bottom of the meter display is zero crossing, so it's 
you would expect that. Here, let's look at it. I'll, I'll talk about that as we test it. So you've not seen a zero cross meter before, but I have written one. The zero cross meter represents as um, this line here is 20 hertz. This is 200 hertz. This is 2K. This is 20K. And when we draw that, and that's a pretty good uh, decay tail for I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm not sure what the rest of it's going to do. I would say the rest of it means that the tone sweep is causing issues, but the overall swing of it seems good. Guitar fall off continues to look pretty good. Slight, slight weirdness. Tone sweep definitely weird. But when I say that the bottom is zero crossings, what I mean is that it's counting how often the waveform is crossing zero, which if you have low frequency energy, it will be crossing zero. And so when it's a high frequency thing, like a guitar fading away, it's actually going a little bit brighter and it's a nice cloud of closely associated high frequency sounds. Whereas the tone sweep swoops down into lows and then your um, zero crossings are all hanging out being variations of between 200 and uh, 20 hertz. This is all deep low frequency rumblings off of the tone sweep. Uh, we are going to try to create a reverb without resonant tones to the best of our ability. That's kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm going to call this smooth. The guitars are falling off in a suitable exponential looking curve, and they are free enough of repeating exceptional cutoffs that I'm going to count that, and then the tone sweep just has an artifact in it, and you got to live with it. But this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to arrive at something that is working, and if that didn't seem plausible, that fall off is what we consider smooth. And the tone sweep will be considered weird. It almost feels like there's a flutter in there, which might be expected to be there, like not necessarily a bad thing. And here's our snare drum. I'm willing to call that smooth. It feels like a very featureless reverb tail. So that makes another triple winner. It's a LL. Hang on. Let's do this up properly. SLLF. I believe this was the one that made it into 254. Wait, 140. Come on, you. Come on, mouse. Behave. Very good. Let's pull you over to where I can put you on this wrist rest. So is this the one we're using? It is. Alrighty. 254 SLLF. This one uh, does very well for itself. This particular thing is going to get used in the uh, the plate reverb. I did not realize that it was as good as this when I picked it, but it is standing up pretty well to my selection. Every single bit of it seems to be performing. So there we are. So let's find some more loudness. Like here's one. L-U. 
U standing for unique, and it's one of my algorithms for generating these things. Let's see how this performs, and whether it is able to do wonderful smooth looking reverb tails. Kinda. The fall off looks good, but then we've got some artifacts densely stuck in there. Oh, I didn't see all those messages. Oh well. In this one, I am liking the way that the end of the guitar falling off and the tone sleep falling off look the same. I am almost to the point of going, that's good enough for me, we're going to call it smooth. Like, look at how no matter what sound you put into it, you've got a decay tail that looks like a de de decay tail is supposed to be. They've all got some little artifacts, but it's a very consistent look and behavior. It's not acting different each time. It's acting like it's basically the same thing each time, which is what it should be doing, even though it's a fake computer synthesis. It should be able to act like it's doing this with both kinds of sounds, whether it be the guitar sound, or the tone sweep sound, or the drum sound, the, the snare drum sound. And this is one of the uh, small rooms. Yeah, see, it's really resisting having large departures from what it's supposed to be doing. I'm going to count this as one of the smoother ones. It just feels like the similarity between those two different kinds of sound is good enough for me. And it sounds like this. That was a funny sort of artifact, but... The sustain on that sounds weird. There's a sort of resonant noise in there somewhere. Yeah, like a kind of honk. That's weird. Other sound it sounds nice on the snare though. That feels almost like there's stages of like whoosh 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 whoosh. Okay, let's have a look at this. We've got another, we haven't even checked this one yet, but here is the end of Alien Kittens as a decay tail. Again, we've got some little funkiness, but it doesn't seem to be in the same place twice. And it's always restricted to an area like this is the same decay tail, but every time you look at it, it's different. It's not the smoothest looking thing. It's not a perfectly smooth line, but it's really kind of averaging out to the same basic thing. Like, look at that. Every time we look at it, it's the artifacts are in a different place. And if we were to listen to it, I'm going to call this smooth. I'm going to call this smooth. 
It seems to act the same way on every different kind of sound. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to... This. This seems to act the same way on every different kind of sound. I'm sorry, I forgot to switch the, the things over. It's getting to be a long day. We're closing in on 4 o'clock, which is time for me to start getting my food defrosting for dinner. And I'll try to keep up. In any case, this is what I wasn't actually showing you, but what I was trying to analyze. We're trying to decide whether this particular sound counts as a smooth decay tail. And honestly, looking at that, that looks pretty smooth. And that's always a challenge, but that's acting pretty good too. We got little sort of lines popping up everywhere, but they're not necessarily in the same place each time. And see, this is the same as this. It's just a little scrambled. So yeah, we're going to call that smooth. It's a it's an algorithm, so it's completely artificial. There's no actual air there. There's nothing that's producing the smooth effect other than math. It's just a matter of finding which math is producing the most smooth fall off over all the frequencies we're looking at. And that's doing a pretty good job. So we are going to count this one as well as a smoother option. And we're just going to go on from there and keep checking stuff out. We were checking all the loudness ones to see whether anything performed super well, and we're going to see what this one does. Oh, hi. That looks really pretty. We do seem to have a tiny artifact in the very end of the tail. And the tone sweep doesn't look as smooth as all that, but that guitar tail looks really good. Look, I mean, they're going to get better as the decay times go longer, unless there's a reason for them not to. I think it's easier for it to do it if the decay time goes longer. We've got little artifacts occasionally in that tail, but this is the area where K plate C performed its best. And if this kind of fall off is both a tightly writ line and also is forming a really good curve, that's going to read as realistic. And I think we're I think that's something we get to have. The fall off of that guitar as it's playing doing its loudest and then dropping away, that's a very, very smooth behavior. So this one, this one wins very high points. Very pleased with how this is going. And this guy sounds like this. Kind of, there's a high frequency thing in there that I'm not entirely fond of. It just makes it more live, I guess. It does seem to fall away convincingly. We are very airy and bright. I'm liking the way that the synthesizer falls off this one. have another double winner. That counts as smooth as far as I'm concerned. I think that's going well, although it doesn't have many other high points, but I don't think it needs to. It's just fine the way it is. SLB. More loudness ones. Here's one. 
here is 326 another big old uh hall how's this going again i should be more and more strict with these as they go And I feel like maybe that was going to qualify as a place where I should be strict. I'm not sure this is going to measure up to the other ones. I see a bunch of little artifact lines popping up everywhere. And this is, doesn't even look like a curve. I think we have another sputtery decay one. Bits of it look smooth, but bits of it do not. And I'm not entirely happy with the shape of that curve. It should be looking more exponential than it is. It looks like a straight line, and then there's a knee in it, and then it goes. And we always get some of those dropouts. So this one's not going to qualify, if and it sounds like this. Yeah, I hear a fluttering. There's a fluttering in there somewhere. Okay, so they can't all be zingers. Let's see, here's another. Here's another that is also bright. And is also a hall style sound. I am pleased that some of them are not working out because it makes the ones that do work out all the better. That one's looking pretty good apart from maybe some artifacts. And that one's looking even better when I look at the tone sweep behavior. The tone sweep behavior is looking damn good. Again, if I can get these and what it's decaying like on a loud guitar tone, looks like about the same behavior as I'm getting off of the tone sweep. That gives me a good feeling about it, and I think I can go with that. So I think this is actually going to count as a uh, unusually smooth decay. We can look at these, and they look like the same kind of sound. Wildly different sounds, widely different tone properties. One of them is all mids, the other one is all the frequencies. It's literally a tone sweep from supersonic down to nothing. And yet they look like they live in the same world. That's good enough for me. And this one sounds like this. Nice sort of fade off. That sounds like air. synths. Snare drum. Yep. Happy with it. Happy with it. 347LB gets to be 347SLB. And it has many things going for it. It has all of the options except for green. This is a very high scoring one. It's even doing pretty well on the incompressibility standard. So yeah, another very highly scoring sound. This should find you somewhere. I'll be able to do something with it. Here's 365 LU. U means uh, unique, so it's another algorithm being used to calculate it, and it makes it sound kind of like a large empty room. Let's see how smooth the large empty room decays at. In 10 minutes or so, I'm going to go and start getting dinner ready. Uh, I'm speculating on throwing more wood on the fire. Huh. Okay, so I see some irregularities there, but the overall curve looks basically good. I'm not sure if I'm down with these irregularities being where they are. 365. I think they are inevitably going to start to converge a little bit. But we've got that major dropout halfway. And the curve 
doesn't look as smooth as I would like it to be. It looks like there's a bump on it, sort of in the middle, that's consistently there, slightly on the right channel. And there's always this slight bump here. And then there's a dropout immediately after that. And then there are a couple of dropouts right before the bump in the right channel. Like if it looked like this throughout, that would be cool. But that's still kind of convex rather than concave. It sure is. So we're not going to add a special cue to this and this one. Sounds like that. It was not bad. It was not great. Here's another one. It's even larger. It is LB. B meaning back of the hall, so it's a big hall type sound. L meaning it was loud, so we have sonority. And it is learning new things about how to evaluate Reverb Stay. We have discovered that my choice for the upcoming 140 reverb, the plate reverb, actually seems to be really good in a bunch of fronts. And I'm pleased about that. I picked it by ear. So we're just kind of underscoring that in various ways of looking at it, it just really performs. So we're going through a bunch of other stuff to see whether we can find other things that seem to perform really, really well. And the way we're doing that is looking at these decay tails and seeing which ones, since these are not natural in any sense, they are completely generated, which ones look like they have the correct exponential fall off and freedom of artifacts in any way. Artifacts are defined as these little vertical lines that appear in the way of the decay tail. This and the, these are guitars and these are tone sweeps, so they're very different styles of sound. And the guitars seem to throw in an occasional dropout and there's a slight irregularity in here. It's pretty good. In particular, I like the smoothness of the curve. It doesn't look like it's made up of multiple curves. It looks like it is a single swoop. Like you could take a round thing and place it against that and it would line up with the edge perfectly. That part seems good. But we do always have this little dropout in here. And we've also got the same little irregularity in here. It's not taking up a lot of space, though. That said, the tone sweep, I am approving of how the tone sweep is also looking like it's taking a curve. I'm going to say this one actually counts as good. It's got that one little artifact in the tail. But that's the only artifact in the tail. The other artifacts are very small, and the artifacts in the tone sweep are consistently very small as well. And it gives the sense of a swoop. It gives the sense of a curve. So we're going to call this actually good. And it sounds like this. I hear a sort of rippling, and I did hear that cut out. And then since and a snare.
that's actually pretty smooth. Good enough. Good enough. It's not super exceptional, but it's good enough to count as one of the smoother of the decays, because some of the decays get really weird. As much as that is not all that smooth, some of them get even weirder. I'm not sure what I would jump to to illustrate that, but and see, here's another one of our smooth decays. And let's keep having a look around. Here's another loud. Let's check and see whether that one also counts as smooth. Because, yeah, variations in the decay time will produce that effect. In theory, it's possible to use this algorithm and test it enough to make it literally throw a slapback echo on or mimic the decay of a uh, spring reverb with its sort of fluttering oscillation in volume. Speaking of fluttering oscillation in volume, this one looks a little fluttery, but they are lining up to fairly similar shapes. And they're doing a pretty good job at falling. Well, I think the longer these get, the more it's going to have an easy time doing that, though. Like the longer decay time we've got, the more it's going to start behaving like an exponential curve. That's what it's supposed to do. But all the same, oh, and I do believe I see some distinct irregularities there, like loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud again. That's fluttery. And there's flutters in here as well. This little dropout followed by this little burst. I don't think this one counts as being as smooth as the others. It sounds like this. Oh yeah, I hear details in that. Yeah, we're not going to use this one. One does not manage to be as smooth as, for instance, here's one that I said was smoother just next to it. And if we compare that guy, we see that it's this gradual curve going in this direction. and that the tone sweep seems to be doing about the same thing. And the departures are not very striking. They're not very big departures. And that one sounds like this. That's one of the lesser loud but very smooth ones. Let's see what else we've got. Do we have any more louds? Yes, we do. Look at that. 860 LLU, both of these uh, channels go quite loud. Let's see how smooth they are. It's one of my high scorers, this one. Oh, hi there. It's leaning on the right channel a little bit, but that's nice. Tone sweep, somewhat less nice. Okay, so I'm liking the fact, I see banding. The gray scale is showing also, the smoothness of the gray scale is telling a story as far as how featureless that reverb tail is gonna sound. 
and I see some banding in it, but I also see that there's nothing really striking about it until that one spot where it cuts off the tail with a slight dropout. And then sometimes it's not. Sometimes that's very smooth and fades away to nothing quite nicely. This might count as one of the smooth ones. And see, I believe that was actually a tone sweep. And this is the guitar. It should fall off good and smoothly. It's pretty much doing it. Yeah, that's doing a very good job of the rest of the decay tail being good and smooth. One thing I'm noticing is the loudest bit of that transitions fairly quickly to dropping back and then coming into the... So there is a visible band here separating the loudness of the regular amount from the decay tail. It's like we're placing the sound in there and then the decay tail happens afterwards. So that's interesting. And that could well count as smooth. Let's hear what it sounds like. That sounds like the same sound again. Just continuing on. Sweet. That feels good. That sounds like a big acoustic space that's been excited by something. And the smoothness of that decay is very good. Synth. drum. That's very smooth. I think we're onto something here. And a thump. That's a subsonic thump that is nothing but a, a giant triangle wave. It seems to die off nice and quietly. I mean, that's just a Dirac pulse, that is. Yeah, that's purely a Dirac pulse with a bunch of low frequency behind it. And the space around it sounds basically real. So I'm feeling pretty good about this one. Cool. That counts. We're going to call that smooth. That's another high scorer. It is also another one with many things going for it. Some of these, you'll notice it's got red, orange, yellow, blue, purple, and gray. This scores extremely high in just about every imaginable calculation. Very cool. And let's see, a bunch of these aren't being used as anything, but we do have a couple more louds. And then I'm going to go and start defrosting my dinner and throw another log on the fire. Just because it's been cold and it's going to be colder. Here we go. 11.13. 
we have an immediate dropout right at the beginning. So I don't know whether maybe this one's not going to qualify as super smooth. I see departures from smoothness. I see an immediate dropout both times and a hiccup in the middle of it. Yeah, for this amount of decay, I don't think it should be doing that, especially not on a mid-range frequency. So I think we're going to call this one cool and all, but uh, it's not going to count as smooth because there are too many departures from a perfect behavior. And some of them are very striking, like this one right at the beginning, that's very striking. Also, if you look at the tone sweep one, the amount of microdynamics in that reverb tail is huge, huge. It's just scampering up and down like mad the entire time, which is all fine and good, but I don't think it counts as smooth. So yeah, this one, this one doesn't qualify as that. And if we listen to it, it sounds like this. It's a very long delay. I mean, it sounds kind of smooth to the ear, but... Snare. I think that's just the length of the delay, uh, the length of the decay, tricking me into thinking it's actually smooth. Whereas this one, which is slightly longer than that, is apparently what counts as actually smooth. And I can believe that. That's properly smooth. The other one was not. At these very, very large reverb sizes, it fools you out a little bit. And lastly, we have one final one here. And then the very longest one counts as one of the smooth ones. Or I think it does, anyhow. So let's do that, and then I'm going to scamper about doing some of the things I have to do and I'll be back and probably play with more of this honestly okay so those are departures from smoothness that it's all very well that it can stretch out very long it's all very well that the tone sweep seems to have more regularity but I have a side-to-side -side shifting here, and I've got a couple of little dropouts that aren't supposed to be there, and they're consistently there. I think this is not going to count. Yep, those dropouts are consistently there. That means this algorithm, and I can even see, if you look at this closely, it looks like we have a straight line from here to here, then a straight line from here to here, and then a straight line from here to here. That's not how that's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a gradual swoop. Kind of like this is looking more like the gradual swoop. The guitar, absolutely not. The guitar is acting like it's connected line segments of volume. Like you drew that in in automation and then used straight lines to connect them together. And that's not how this is supposed to be. So this does not count, but it sounds like this if you did count it.
It's a very big space to be sure. And then, snare. So it can still sound cool, but it doesn't count as truly smooth. This apparently does, so let's double check it. After going through all the other ones, let's see whether this is really as great as I thought. Boop. Yeah. Yeah, I'm willing to admit that that is pretty smooth. There is a little disruption here, but the rest of it looks very linear, including the tone sweep. So yeah, we've got a couple of exceptions, but those could be the guitarist playing chords, which is causing the loudness burst. And then the rest of the fall off is very smooth indeed compared to the, the range it's got to cover. I see little bitty spikes, but they're not very big. This would be a smooth fall off. It even sounds like reverb. It even sounds like that guitar sound is diminishing into the distance. This could be a galactic or that kind of thing. Let me go first with my uh, fireplace. No more coffee, but I'm going to make a pit stop.
already. We have the world's slowest clock ticking away here. Talk. It's the clock of doom. And I've got 45 minutes until I can go and make myself some dinner. I am ravenous. Been really pushing it today. And the weirdest thing, it hasn't been any actual coding, but this is all worthwhile stuff. In fact, I can probably produce a separate subfolder with all of these things that I've arrived at, and that'll be a worthwhile thing. So let's do that then. I'll switch over to here. Stop that. This is our Super Ultra Mondo Giant. And we're going to make a little subfolder. And also note that uh, we've got other things here, such as... It's apparently Abbey Road Studio B. So that's what Studio B is supposed to sound like. We've got uh, Abbey Road's Chamber. So kind of a mid-rangey thing going on in that. We've got stuff like uh, Sound City. An abandoned uh, back of Sound City. So that's all about finding sounds that resemble real-world things, but with, yeah, the Beato, the Beato clap, exactly. But part of what we're doing here is like trying to reinvent mixing in the age of the DAW to maybe invent new sounds that haven't actually been done. So we're going to start by taking dash verbs here. And I should have been creating a folder, did I? Yes, I did. We're going to drag the folder over here to where we can see it. And let's see now. I don't entirely remember why I called them dash verbs, but I, being as big of a Rainbow Dash fan as I am, Clearly, that's what we're going to keep. I don't know what I meant originally by it, but we're going to run with it. And we're going to pick out every single thing that says either S or L and drop it in this folder and not that one. So we're going to start with, uh, let's see now. Here's one. L or LL means ultra loud. S means extra smooth. So all of these things count as something special in some way or other. Then we'll be able to go around, look at the other letters like F or whatever, and that determines the uh, coloration of it, the sort of behavior of it, and this is a sub-collection of excellent sounding algorithms. Because these are not impulses, these are algorithms generated by a five by five householder matrix. They are all a little bit different. And all at different sizes. Here's one of the greats. SLLC, that's very impressive. So they're all a little bit different. And uh, some of them are better than others. And they can all be sculpted into sound experiences akin to what we know of from listening to music and liking it. I should be able to do stuff like listen to, say, uh, Shine On You Crazy Diamond and the guitar there and go, how do I construct a guitar room where you could have a guitar that's just DI? 
running into like, I don't know, the lamp or something, and then throw the right kind of reverb and the right kind of discontinuity onto it and have like the vibe and space out of it. That's the goal. So I'm kind of closing the laptop a little bit because I'm not going to code a whole new thing in half an hour. But yeah, 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 that's exactly what I'm talking about. We should be able to do that. I see no reason why it can't be possible to do that. We can do that in the box. It's possible and it's going to happen. And it's done through picking out all of these ones that ended up performing super well in one way or another. Like if you were here for today's stream, you saw me do it. it was going through and finding out the stuff that came across as a uh, particularly loud in a sonority way. And then also the reverb tails that were particularly smooth and without weird artifacts, because this is all generated by just bizarre stuff. This is just algorithms generating all of this. And we're going through, there, there are surely things that I've missed. But the idea is I went through all the most likely candidates to get a big old selection of stuff that I thought would end up being cool and could be used for suitable purposes. And from this smaller collection, I can select stuff and run with it. Here's another good candidate. Here's another one that at least is loud, if nothing else. There's one that is smooth, if nothing else. And I'm more or less selecting them based on how well they performed in, in all these different ways. And then we have a giant, a couple of giants, both a smooth and mellow one and a loud one. What's all the seats mean? Oh. This is a calculation that I made to determine how to work out the uh, file size issue, where these all have also had to be larger than a given file size or they're discarded. If they are too small, I don't keep them. And here's my big list. How would you like to have a collection of plugins um, this many options for different reverbs. At this point, I might as well just throw out the other dash verbs, right? So let's just copy this over. I might as well copy it in case I need any of these other ones, but these other ones are all the second best. They're the the failed, failed selections. It's amazing that I got some of these to work as such small seat sizes. But the smallest it got to work at small seat sizes is, in fact, 122. And that's as big as they get. I suppose one thing I could do is I could start going through some of these itty-bitties and seeing what the decay taper looks like. Oh, yeah. No, we're, we're getting more. We're getting more. It's just a question of what and how much and when and so on. Like, are we going to get a mellow, smooth reverb like this? Or technically the same size, but a plate? Or even more of a plate? Or we can start going bigger. And we have a, uh, this might end up being like what turns into Sunset Chamber. But then we're already using this one for a uh, simulated plate reverb. And then we've got these giant ones as well. Like here is a large room. Here is a larger room. The 
rooms just keep getting bigger and bigger. And bigger. And did I mention bigger? This one's a very live room. And bigger. And bigger. That one has a bit of a slapbacky effect to it, it's so big. And then the biggest of all. And you really hear the slapbackiness on that one. And yeah, yeah, time to start making some of these. Time to start making some of these and putting them out. You'll probably see them before Console X comes out. Because I need to be doing Console X working with these as part of the design. Console X must work on multiple submixes, each of which have their own hint of reverb and each of which have their own um, settings for... In fact, wouldn't that be a wouldn't that be a trip if we could adjust the? You know how I have discontinuity now, and we're including discontinuity into console X as part of the thing on the channel or the submix or whatever, and we can assign a parameter to different things. So what if we were to assign? the parameter for the submix, which is the little black slider here, to console channel, or console submix it would be actually, to console submix the uh, discontinuity setting, which is reads in dB, and simultaneously the discontinuity setting on the reverb of that submix I don't know why it couldn't work. I suppose that's something that I can check out just by firing up Reaper. So maybe we'll let's do that in the last half hour after I fuss with a little bit more of this because we're going to close this for the moment. We're going to update this and then we're going to cut down this to just the ones that I have. That should be fairly straightforward. It's just uh, time consuming. Moderately time consuming. I only have this many to do. So. Let's get busy. And I'm very tempted to, to trawl through some of these and figure out can I identify in the, let's maybe do that before even getting into this. It could involve me dragging more of these over. So maybe we're not quite ready to depart from my dash verbs folder. We'll drag it over to here. Grab chat, hi chat. And we're shuffling things around like mad, but that's fine. Pretty respectable audience for the rest of the day. I think it's a time of day thing, honestly. I think that's how that works out. Here's the folders of which we are interested. I want to go through here and figure out whether I can assign all of these ones with seat sizes smaller than 100, which of them count as being better for smoothness of reverb tail? Let's see whether we can determine that. Let's use the same concept of distortion and tone sweep and check that stuff out, see what we get. Okay, so that was smooth, but that's not an especially exponential looking thing. It's
It's looking like we have a pretty damn fast fall off, but that's to be expected. I wonder if I can get a better read on this snare. Because again, like this looks smooth, but I, I see a shape of drop off here that doesn't look like the same curve. What do we got if we do this? Can we do the whole thing on just the snare hit? That's a noise effect. Well, it looks a little bit crunchy. It's a little small. It's a little hard to see. How does that compare with the other tiny ones? Like if I was to, for instance, look at this one, which counts as a couple of different things, and then I looked at the... So I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out how I can observe this. Huh. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I can observe that and I don't see any weird artifacts on it. It looks like a smooth shape. It's maybe not perfectly smooth, but it's not bad. Maybe that's going to be the secret is I just have to look at the snare and see if it's drawing a nice little a curve without weird artifacts or spikes in there. And if there are weird artifacts, like there's one, there's another. If it starts throwing weird artifacts, that's a bad sign. If it refuses ever to throw any weird artifacts, that might be a good sign. Let's see, because this is so small that you can barely even tell from observing it. Also, the snare will give me a quicker result. Yeah, and I see a couple of artifacts there, not all that much. And then there's the tone sweep, and the tone sweep has an enormous spike here, so that's interesting. I don't know if we want to use one where there's a giant volume spike somewhere in the tone sweep. Is that usual or is that unusual? I feel like that's maybe bad. Just have a tone sweep and it's supposed to be a even drop off and instead there's this giant RMS spike. Let's see whether everything else has that. I'll just start with auditioning the tone sweeps and see where that gets me. If we have a tone sweep that doesn't act crazy, we can jump over to the uh, snare and see what that one does. Oh. I wonder whether maybe we're just going to be seeing that with these tiny rooms. The swoop is a swoop. You whoop. And then it kind of hits the, the low frequencies and that's when it freaks out. Interesting. So if I was to audition the snare instead of the tone sweep, I'm going to bounce around and check out what some of the tone sweeps do. That's the snare. I see artifacts in that wave. That's not a smooth fall off. Maybe it's the snare that I need to look at and I not be too worried about the tone sweep. Because the snare is high frequency sounds and that's going to register on these tiny, tiny room sounds. That's almost the appropriate kind of thing for the tiny, tiny room sounds. So if I can get one where it's drawn very evenly on the snare, that might be as good as I can expect and all that I can hope for. So let's see. Let's just start grinding through these as fast as possible. That looks decidedly unsmooth. wonder if I can close the plugin with it. Yeah, it looks like I can. So how about we jump way ahead and see whether one of these much larger ones 
looks anything like smooth or whether they're all going to be weird. What am I dealing with regarding these very small rooms? How, what can I expect out of how smooth they can be? Because I'd like to add some of these to the select, but I don't know how reasonable that is. We've got an OK curve on these. I mean, to be perfect, they should have no disparities or weird artifacts at all. It kind of looks like it's a curve that's falling away correctly. But we do have a lot of microdynamic slop going on. And I don't know how much is too much to expect as far as trying to make it clean. Sounds like this. I feel like that doesn't feel smooth. So let's jump right to the smallest one that's not over a hundred. We got some stuff poking out in this. It's never the same twice, but I think I can expect that. So how am I to interpret this? This is a fine way to spend the last 20 minutes of my stream, by the way. But I don't know if it's going to get me anywhere. Also, I feel like maybe I can throw another log on. So let me just do that. It's going to be cold tonight, so I'm going to want to attend to that by keeping the home fires burning. Tell you what, let's just be real picky. Are there any, any of these that are super clean? And by that I mean literally none of these are being drawn with an absence of weird garbage. And they're all five by five householder matrices. Like for instance, this one over here is a little bit cleanish. Almost everything has just big lines and, and track drawn all over it. So we're going to count those as unacceptable. Let's just start counting down and see how far it gets. We're going to assume that if it's possible for any of these to draw cleanly, we'll run with those. That already doesn't count because I see big drops in here, big gaps. So let's burn through these as fast as possible without even selecting among them to see whether anything counts as a really, really smooth tail. For instance, this is looking better than most so far. I don't see big slices through any of these, just, just a little bit on the very tail. Since the edge here looks a little crude and sloppy, but we've got some where it doesn't even look as if there's any slices through it, and then other ones there's some, but it's not extreme, I'm going to call this, see? They need to look like this one over here, where it's a big dark line, yeah, but it's sort of a coarse line that's filling up the entire area rather than being all jaggy and irregular. And I don't see any vertical slices through this segment in here. So we're going to call this one our first acceptable one. And go from there. And so that also means 
this goes immediately over into this category and we go on. Come on guys, let's see what you got. Okay, that looks like a big slice. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So this one is not going to work because we have bunches of big dynamic slices cutting out entirely and it's bisecting the uh, rendering here. We just have too many dropouts. Close the whole thing and continue to move. I should be able to go through all of these by the end of the day. And that'll be cool. And then I'll have a collection of itty bitty tiny tiny reverbs that might actually be worth something. The whole secret is to be able to invalidate as many of them as possible. And these are also these are also checked for whether they uh, are incompressible. So they do have some things going for them, but again, this is failing, so nope. And we're just going to grind through all of this until we get to some kind of result. I got one. If I get one out of this process, I'm going to count that as a win. That looks a little rough. That looks very rough. I see two vertical lines there. I see a sort of chop. Bajni Cardinal. This is a big black area here. This is just not clean enough to count. We're going to get rid of this one as well. And we're sort of counting down. The farther I go, the more surprised I will be if any of these work. That said, surprises are awesome when they are good surprises, giving me cool sounding tiny rooms. That would be delightful if I got any of these to be great. So, and this is not going to be it because these are completely covered with random crud. And random crud sounds like this. So we go on. 56 seat room. We're pushing down the final stretch. Okay, that's medium terrible. So many of these are going to be terrible. They might be 5x5 five five householder matrices, but they're simply too small. They are simply too small. The hope is that I could get some of these to act like, say, a better version of the Abbey Road chamber. I'd love to have a proper chamber sound, like a tiny chamber sound. I'm not necessarily going to get them here, though because any of those dropouts are also going to count as cancellation and weird tonal artifacts and stuff. This is going to be another loser. That one's no good. And we will see whether the loudness output of them has anything to do with it. And then once I'm done, I'm going to be all ready to have my tacos in victorious triumph, having outlined a whole bunch of... Nope, this is a complete loss. Not you. Having come up with a fantastic way of diving into the reverbs once more. And that'll be very cool, although that's going to be either next week or the week after, because it's possible that I'll simply take next week in, like, Minecraft or something. Got to keep things flowing evenly. Okay, that's full of a bunch of dropouts as a rule. Pretty much all of these are going to be garbage. I'm just trying to find the occasional one that's as least garbage as possible. This has some good features to it, but it's simply not enough. I don't think any of these are actually going to be. But the reason I'm doing this is just in case one of them is like, bing, it's perfect. You didn't know that until you looked at it in the meter. This is very much not going to be that one. So goodbye. 
Like if they all looked like this, that would be relatively okay. But these ones that have just been drawn have major dropouts in them. And that's just my way of interpreting how this works. I will do K chamber AR just for laughs, but I know it's not going to perform very well. It'd be funny if it did, though. And away we go. This is not as bad as some of the others. That said, it doesn't look very good either. Yeah, like if they all looked like this one drawn here or this one drawn here, I could roll with that because it looks like a slightly dirty line with this tiny dropout right at the end. But there's too much of this kind of hash in here. This one's not going to make it. Maybe I'll skip ahead and start doing some of the ones like up to 150. That said, I got to check all these tinies. I got to check all these tiny ones to see if any of them are actually good. Hi, he says knowingly. Look at those two first drawings. That's kind of what I'm talking about there. Yeah, look at that. It's still got some dropouts, yes. But look at the shape of this fall off. Look at the way that occasionally it will draw straight through without a giant mess. Like this one where my cursor is right now is what I wanted it to be. Like, or this one. Or this one, kind of. Okay. We're keeping this, and it sounds like this, which is not going to be very impressive, but... The idea is maybe that can become a chamber. Maybe it will be a better chamber than the original K-Chamber AR. Because if you remember, Abbey Road Chamber had another funny low frequency thing going on in there. So one thing I can do is get as many chambers as I can that are acceptable, and then go in and compare them all with the um, select ones that I've produced and see which select one comes in closest to the reality. That would be how this gets done. So let's see, let's try another one. That last one is better than most. That last one did not suck. This sucks a little tiny more than the other one, but I like the spike shape of it. That looks like a very cleanly drawn spike. It's just got too much garbage in the line. The line is not clean. Yeah, we're going to skip this one. I like the pointiness of it, but the, we're going to skip this one. And it sounds like this. Here's K Chamber AR. I think this would have been picked by listening but it's from a long time ago, so this is a much more primitive version. Huh, okay. So it's kind of crap, but it's not as garbage as it could be. The curve is okay, and there's this one major dropout right in the middle. And it's very crude, but it's kind of the right basic shape. That would be why I chose it. I would have chosen it because it was kind of in the right zone. Okay, onwards. Man, I'm, I'm kind of tensing up. It makes me sad sometimes. I don't have anybody to give me back rubs or to give back rubs to. I had a, a machine back rub thingy I don't know where it is. I've looked for it recently. And I do stretches, and that should help. And I have some uh, uh, tiger balm, so that should help. Just jumping into the tiny reverb generator. I 
wonder if I should be looking at the zero cross meter and scanning it for behavior as well as looking at this because some of these are looking okay. I'm not sure that sounds okay though. Let's go back to K chamber and knowing that it's not exceptional and look at the zero cross meter on it because I haven't been looking at the zero cross meter in any of these. I've been studying everything else. It doesn't look really very different than anything else. I don't think I'm going to see anything there. Let's look at strictly the dynamics going forwards. Skip ahead. Make a little space. That's, I believe, going to be a big fat nope. That's very messy indeed. And let's just charge onwards and see what we can make happen. I wonder if the if this will tell me anything too. This is a much cleaner audio. What's that one say? Not a lot. Not a lot. The RMS is covering everything up a great deal. That's because that's a sort of triangle wave and we're basically looking at the triangle wave part, so that's not helpful. Back to here. Mm. Nah, too messy. Too messy. I mean, technically, it's not impossible that one of them will turn out just magically perfect. I just think it's very unlikely. And the last time I said that, I immediately stumbled across one that was not terrible. So we're going to keep checking them out and seeing if we can find anything that's not terrible. That is just terrible enough that we're going to not keep it. They need to all look like this and this, but they're not. We have these big variations in here. And that's enough to call it terrible. If there's time, I will skip forwards and look at some of the slightly larger ones to see whether I can get a working... Uh, just everything that I've got that is a tiny sized reverb and see whether anything renders clean. I don't believe this is going to qualify. We've got a, a gap in the middle here that looks quite striking. Although I do like the initial impact of that. The loud to quiet section seems to be nice and clean. It's just that we have this artifact in the middle. That sounds like this. It's not too horrendous, but I don't think it's good enough. Yikes, nope, absolutely not. Looks like somebody's scribbling all over it with ballpoint. Nope. Here's one that is getting a lot of things uh, showing up. That's like orange and yellow and blue. And look at that. Hey, remember how I said I wanted some of them to show up cleanly without a lot of scribbling on them? This is kind of what I meant. There's a couple of derps in here, but on the whole, look at these little sections of, of cuteness. That's much cleaner than pretty much any of the others. Sounds like this. Nice. Okay, we're keeping you. 47 you, in fact. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say 47 you? I meant 47 SU for smooth, because compared to all the rest of these, this is an unusually smooth falloff. How about 46? 
That's cool. I didn't expect to run across that one. The, the sizes are getting so small that it's very unlikely to find any of these that actually work. And yet occasionally they do, and this is not going to be one of them because that's a bunch of scribbliness all over it. 46 you. Let's see how many I can do in the last three minutes of stream. Then I get to go and have dinner. I mean, technically, if I really needed to, I would get to go and have dinner by just shutting down and going and having dinner. You know how I roll. I get really gung-ho about some of these things, and then I want to go and complete them. This is not going to count. Look at that. That's messy as hell. I feel like these ones that don't have anything going for them except for, hi, it's bright, are not going to show up well. This is already not showing up well. Yeah, never mind. May or may not have the ability to check some of the larger ones. If I really want to, I will. I, I have dinner getting ready, but there's plenty of time. There's not always plenty of time. I'd like to be able to have dinner in leisure and do my exercises and like watch. I'm currently re-watching re uh, Robot Wars. I downloaded series of it. Let's see what this is. This is a little bit, slightly more. So I'd like to be able to watch that in leisure and not feel rushed or out of time. Uh, could be worse, but I'm not that thrilled. This looks like this looks crunchy. This is not a smooth little line. It looks crunchy. How does it sound? Crunchy. Never mind. Again, we are getting so small here that I'm skeptical of the ability to run across anything that's actually going to work. But stranger things have happened, and that's why I'm going through every single one of these tiny guys that were very difficult to come up with in the first place to see whether I have anything that looks workable. This looks too crunchy to be workable. It's a bunch of fluctuations in here. A number of them are so small that they automatically come out as loud just because there's no room for the sound. It's a snare drum in a closet. That looks messy as anything. Compared to the clean ones that we saw, this is terrible. Sounds like this. And we're going to up, and it is literally five. I want to finish going through these. Let's finish going through these. It's hard to let go of stuff like this once you're in the home stretch, finishing it up, wondering whether you will run across one that's magically good at the last moment. I don't think this is going to be the one, so goodbye. Here's one that qualifies as loud, if nothing else. Let's do a sprint for the final ones. I've done about two-thirds of them by now. This one looks messy, except for this one there, which is cleaner, but that's not good enough. So we're going to go on. We got two of them out of this dredging through the mess. That's pretty good, honestly, getting two of them. Two possible utterly tiny spaces. Also, look at this. That is a very, very tiny room and a very scratchy looking decay, but the onset of the decay, it's very sharply pointed, and I don't want to know I speak too soon. Now it's starting to look like garbage. Never mind. That's why I'm running some of them through multiple times. Looks a little bit like garbage. Looks a lot more like garbage. 
Yeah, I don't think we're keeping this. We're getting to where these are simply too small to work. They start sounding like this. They are a closet. They are a shoebox. That said, you got to check them, see whether maybe one of them gets incredibly lucky. And by that, I mean, I really don't have to check them. I'm choosing to check them. I want to see whether any of these ridiculous little attempts at reverb are giving me anything useful at all. These look like not so much. We're going to count down to 29 from 36 or so. And I don't think any of these are going to work out, but it'll be very interesting if any of them do. We'll have like the magic shoe box. The magic shoe box that actually sounds half good or that you can throw on a snare or who knows what, but I don't think it's happening. I don't think that's going to be the one either. Now we're getting really small, 33. They go way beyond actually sounding like you'd fit 33 people in the room. It's, it stops actually registering the way I designed it. I designed it so that you have a rough seat count. And this no longer qualifies as a seat count. This qualifies as nailing somebody into a box and then making them play drums. Which is, I suppose, something that one could do, but we're not going to do that today. Or if we do, it's not going to sound very good. And sure enough, I don't think that's going to sound very good. Barely have any reverb added to this at this point. Now, if they all looked like this one here, that would be cool, but they don't. Three more. We're doing the one on the top twice, I believe, but that's fine. And maybe I'll run through some of the, yeah, this is too small. If they all looked like that, it would be cool, but they're not going to, are they? And these tiny ones sound like this. Two more. Then maybe I can start looking at some of the uh, intermediate ones. Or not. I could just go and have tacos. That's a possibility. That is something I could do. Yeah, that's going to be garbage. And 29. It's a, a box 4 feet by 4 feet by 6 feet with drums in it. What happens when you do that? Not much. Yeah, that's a hot mess. Sounds like that. So if I was to go the other direction, which ones do we have here that are very close to being too tiny and yet not? Do any of them qualify as a tiny little chamber that's actually good? I don't think that really qualifies. It would need to be a little cleaner. See, that's not clean. Sounds like this. So these are not small enough, but some of them might be. As long as we're charging through these things, let's charge through some of these things and see at what point do we get large enough that it no longer qualifies as what we're trying to make happen. No longer qualifies tiny, tiny chamber. That looks messy. And sounds messy. We've gone through such a large number, there's not that many. That's never going to work. Look at that. We've got dynamic spikes. It needs to be a really well-drawn picture to qualify for this particular calculation. We'll see whether this one does a good job at that. Nope. Big dropout right there. Sounds like this. Let's go to 150 and call it a day. Because we're already starting to sound too big to be a tiny chamber. 
Huh. It's not great, but it could be worse. I don't see any giant spikes going through this. It looks a little bit irregular, but... 131H, eh? See, if they all look like this... Oh, there is a big drop out there, but there's not many of those. And this starts looking cleaner. That looks really clean. I'm trying to get some of these shapes depicted correctly. And let's hear what it sounds like. Let's include it. Let's include it. That's not completely shabby. Also, it's red and purple, so it has some of the uh, desirable qualities going on. It has loudness and sonority, and it has clarity from making ugly behaviors in the uh, tone sweep, which we're not listening to. And we're going to go to 150. Beyond 150, I think we are already too large. I see an artifact. I see another. That's not going to be okay. Goodbye. I want a lovely smooth effect on these tiny, tiny, tiny rooms. Kind of like that, but without the stuff in the tail. But not like that, because that's terrible. Okay, goodbye. And how big are we getting up to anyway? Okay, we've already got some of these smaller ones and we're scaling up to about 150, 170, 190. So let's go to 150. We've got about six more. And then I'm done for the day. Only 10 minutes after I said I was going to. We're sort of double checking every single one to see if they can do this, this. This is what I want to see it do. Is it going to do it consistently? Medium consistently. This is the curve it's supposed to have. This is the freedom from artifacts it's kind of supposed to have. It's not great at it, but it's not too shabby either. And the bulk of the loudness as it fades away is hanging in there fairly well. Cool. This one sounded like this. I'm going to call that relatively acceptable. Oh, and look, this is one of the ones where it has lots of signifiers in here. It's got red, blue, and purple, and now it has gray and is marked as special. And then it'll just take getting it, whipping it into shape to make it actually be good. But it has the potential. Whereas I don't think any of the rest of these will. The ones that are good keep registering high on multiple measurements. Like I did that one before I saw that it had three additional highlights. Oh, see, see the little lines being drawn in there. Those are dropouts. I'm thinking that that's going to say a nope. That does not qualify as being good. Uh, three more to get to 150. And I'm going to hastily say goodbye after that and run off and make tacos. Because I am ravenous. I'm honestly very hungry. It has been a uh, demanding day. Oh, hi. This is not as shabby. Like, if they were all looking like this, it would be great. This one doesn't, but this one in the middle looks beautiful. It gets a little... Oh, no. We're starting to see the... the now I see the violence inherent in the system. If they all look like this, it would be wonderful, and they super don't. They have big holes in them. So, goodbye to you. Here's one that has warmth and body to it. It has bass. It registered high with the alien kitten section, meaning that it's coated blue. And it is generating a bunch of artifacts. 
the curve is okay, but it's messy as anything. Nope, goodbye. Last one. This one's green. Uh, this one's orange and purple, which is a good sign. But what does that mean in practice? It means. I think that might mean that the very last one for the day is a keeper. Look at that. It's drawing a slightly scruffy line rather than a really neat line, but I'm not seeing nearly as much of the weird hash all through it. A little bit, maybe. A little bit. Some of these look lovely and clean. Sounds like this. We'll keep it. Awesome. So that goes from a two label to a three label. It is using a far calculation, it's coded F. And now here is our end result for the day. These are the ones that we can scan through to figure out what actually makes a good reverb whether it be they get bigger and bigger as they go. These are all rather small rooms. And we have a nice little collection of like plates and halls and chambers and things. We're still listening to everything over the uh, Dell monitor speakers. And on we go into the larger and larger rooms. as the rooms expand in size bit by bit. Finishing up in three plate styles and two hall styles. Plate. 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 Hall. Hall. And of course we have smaller halls too. Smaller hall. Even smaller hall. And there you have it. So we have had a Thursday stream, which was composed entirely of derping around with reverbs without any actual coding. But I mean, I can do the coding. I hope that I can optimize the coding so that my reverb, such as K Cathedral and so on, run more efficiently for people because I was having people having issues with the running of them, and sometimes it would crash or act weird, and I have not been able to sort out what was happening with that. I could try simplifying things a little bit and see whether that helps any. But on the whole, I can make these into reverbs. Granted, there's a lot of them. I have 38 options for better choices of reverb, so that could be 38 more reverb plugins if I came up with individual purposes for each of them. And that's not counting all the ones that I could do where I could take them and try to turn them into Bricosti emulations. And that's a whole other interesting thing to do. But for now, I'm going to bid you good night and run off and have some tacos because this has been a pretty good work day, all things considered. A lot of this stuff worked out just fine.
And with that, I'll bid you.